Hello, good morning. May I ask everyone to find a favorite seat for yourself? There are a lot of seats also on the left side from me in the front row as well. Typical Estonians, they always leave the front row empty. Dear speakers, dear moderators um, and panelists, dear guests, welcome to Tallinn. Uh, I think you're all very brave to come here in November, so well done. Uh, my name is Madladim, I'm the head of communications at the Estonian Refugee Council and today making sure to guide you through our conference. And before we start, uh, I would like to give you one more reason why we are all here besides that we invited you and that you actually came. It is thanks to uh, Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Estonian Center for International Development uh, who are supporting this conference. So can you have the applause for them uh, as a thank you. And welcome one more time. Uh, I will give the floor now to the Director of Estonian Refugee Council, Eero Jansson. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, and mostly dear fellow humanitarians. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, and privilege to, to welcome you all in Tallinn on the occasion of this conference on the macro trends in humanitarian assistance. Um, well, I guess Estonia is not the first place which comes to your mind when humanitarian assistance is uh, discussed. It's relatively far from the humanitarian crisis. Uh, well, it's not one of the diplomatic centers of the world. Tallinn is no Geneva or New York or Paris. But today, uh, we are changing that mistake by bringing these high-level uh, discussions on humanitarian, uh, on humanitarian assistance to this little uh, European capital. And while Estonia is not the first place which comes to your mind when we discuss humanitarian assistance, uh, it is certainly no stranger to humanitarian aid. Well, growing up myself uh, in the 90s, uh, in this era of uh, the collapse of Soviet Union and in the turbulent era of nascent capitalism, uh, I have had first-hand experience in receiving what was then labeled as humanitarian assistance, uh, mostly used clothes and uh, candy bags uh, uh, from well-wishers of uh, Western countries, uh, mostly US and Canada and Sweden and so forth. Now these tables have turned, and Estonia has become a, a provider of assistance in, instead of recipient of assistance. And with these experiences of how aid should not be done uh, under our belt, I believe that we are well equipped and well placed uh, to provide needed assistance better, faster, and also more effectively. Um, similarly to the learnings that we have had uh, from the Estonian experience, the humanitarian sector itself as a whole has been on a journey of learning and adapting. 
uh, one would rather provocatively say that uh, the history of humanitarianism has been uh, that of failures. Uh, from Rwanda to Bosnia to Indian Ocean tsunami to Haiti, uh, we have seen failures to respond, failures to coordinate, failures to uh, standardize. But luckily for us, uh, this sector has shown itself to be uh, capable of learning and able to adapt. And as the world around us is changing, then adapt uh, we must, uh, with new wars emerging uh, or re-emerging, uh, with new crises uh, starting without the old ones ending, uh, the number of people who are in need of assistance, as well as those uh, displaced, are ever increasing. Climate change, identity politics are further fueling the conflicts and uh, prolonging uh, displacement. At the same time, though, uh, digitalization, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, cash assistance, localization, these are some of the macro trends in the sector which give us hope, hope that aid can be provided faster and better and, and more effectively. Uh, and these are the very topics that we will be uh, discussing today here in Tallinn. Uh, the day will be kicked off by Juliet Parker, the director of ALNAP, uh, who will provide a high-level uh, overview uh, about the state of human turn sector uh, today. After this, we will enter the exciting world of cash um, to discuss the potential and also the limitations of cash assistance uh, in transforming the way uh, we uh, provide aid and understand humanitarian assistance as an as a activity, so that no more used clothes would be transported from uh, long distances uh, under the label of humanitarian assistance. Uh, after the panel on uh, cash assistance, we move on to explore the importance of data and uh, information in the aid sector and its transformative potential as well as limitation, uh, which lies therein. Uh, the day will be concluded with another uh, oft-heard buzzword uh, in the sector, that of localization. Uh, few seem to understand what it means. Uh, even fewer uh, seem to actually move toward uh, that goal. But today's panel uh, brings together some experts on that to explore uh, the topic through the case study of Ukraine. And at the same time, uh, there are many topics of importance which we will not be discussing today, uh, such as the ever-increasing uh, funding cap, uh, the frequent failure of uh, protection standards uh, foreseen in the international humanitarian law, or the increasing dangers uh, that uh, humanitarians have to face every day in their work. But I do, do hope that you have time and energy over the coffee breaks, which we will have over the course of the day, to also discuss these. So, um, I invite you to use this day to the fullest to discuss, to think, to rethink uh, matters relevant to humanitarian assistance, to make it faster, better, and uh, more effective. So, I thank you, and I hope that you have a thought-provoking day ahead of you. Thanks. Thank you, Ero. Um, one more thing to add uh, what he was just saying about agenda. Uh, there will be also a video at the end of the conference where we will see uh, the beneficiaries we have helped in Chernihiv in Ukraine, where they talk uh, themselves uh, why is this aid so important for them. But next, uh, Marin Ratnik from Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, please, your welcoming words. Thank you, good morning, uh, and thank you for everybody who has contributed to have this kind of event in Tallinn, in Estonia, and I disagree with you, Eero. I think Tallinn can be fully also a heart of a uh, diplomatic world, where I come from, but also I, you have uh, set together with uh, our 
Estonian Center of uh, Development Cooperation, uh, now the milestone that can be also a center of humanitarian uh, debates. So, uh, good morning to everybody, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I have been in my position a bit more than a year now, so I don't qualify as somebody who has a deep knowledge of the topic of humanitarian work. But I have learned many things through this uh, year of mine uh, in this area. This autumn, Estonia actually celebrates 25 years uh, since Estonia has made this change that Eero actually mentioned about, from being a recipient of humanitarian assistance to become a donor. So it's also uh, remarkable that we have this, uh, this event here today in that point. And the first country Estonia ever gave a humanitarian aid was Ukraine, uh, and that was the floods in 1998. So, unfortunately, Ukraine has become also now uh, the, our main top uh, humanitarian uh, recipient of humanitarian as assistance. And I think this is an example of uh, immense uh, needs created but man-made crisis, but also immense national resilience of the Ukrainians. So, I where is our Ukrainian colleague here from the embassy. So I want to underline that, having been now uh, also throughout the war several times myself in Kiev and outside of it, that this resilience is impressive. So, but uh, also we have to learn through that uh, man-made crisis that uh, we have to explore new modes, uh, how to provide us assistance. And also an example, it is the, the, the Ukrainian war, or Russian war against Ukraine, to put it correctly, is an also unprecedented example of solidarity uh, that people have shown towards Ukraine. In this last 25 years, uh, the humanitarian needs have been continued to grow. And the funding to resp uh, respond to these is not uh, keeping up and is not expected to keep up with it. Uh, the humanitarian system is underfunded and overstretched, everybody knows that. Uh, and the main concern, of course, is that Eero said that we won't talk about it, but I mentioned still that anyway, is the respect for international humanitarian law and the fundamental humanitarian principles around the world is patchy the best. Uh, and uh, the civilians being uh, these who suffer the most in every conflict. Uh, and that's not even talking about the impact of climate change that uh, deepens every humanitarian crisis. So uh, we need to face this situation and admit uh, that we need to do things differently. And therefore the topic I think is very timely. Uh, and what I discussed is uh, today here, data database-based uh, and digitalized approaches, aid localization, uh, cash-based assistance, I think they can all be very instrumental and uh, practical when used wisely. So one good example is cash-based assistance, with, which helps the local economy and gives the affected people more dignity. I've seen that the actions of our refugee council in Ukraine itself, and that was a keen interest for everybody. We uh, involved uh, our uh, local partners there to hear how it's going, uh, and it was very impressive to see. Uh, another one is the working together with local actors uh, who can make and can uh, and make the most uh, have the most valuable knowledge about uh, those people really in need, uh, and uh, that can uh, be one of the most effective way to function. They are not new subjects that I underline here, but I uh, hope the same way that I guess you do, that, is not, that we are not using only today, or you are not using only today the buzzwords and that just to talk, but also have a very practical discussions about how to use this uh, new ways uh, to provide humanitarian assistance. It is particularly important for Estonia because Estonians are very pragmatical and want to get things done, but not necessarily always in the way that they have done, been done before. So um, we have been in these 25 years that I mentioned very uh, global and principled humanitarian donor, I would say. Uh, we are strong uh, per capita when we talk about uh, 
our, our pro, uh, part in the humanitarian assistance, but not necessarily the size, uh, of course, and, when you, and the reach. So when, when, we think, when you talk about it. So, um, but for us, therefore, is even more important uh, efficient humanitarian system. And uh, where these values or these contributions that we make uh, add the most value. So we are absolutely happy to contribute in this context uh, to this discussion. Um, as I guess every country, uh, and I'm sure it is so, uh, also Estonian humanitarian aid policy and its implementation are based on the fundamental humanitarian principles and other frameworks of for humanitarian aid, including those of the good humanitarian donorship, which Estonia is co-chairing with UK in the next two years. So coordinating the humanitarian system and the preservation of humanitarian space are among the topics that we hope to focus on these two years. Our humanitarian assistance is provided through multilateral and bilateral challenge. Uh, and since 2002, we work uh, on bilateral uh, way with our strategic partners. So uh, Estonia Refugee Council being one of them, for example. So and I'm therefore particularly happy that uh, this conference brings together uh, our multilateral, bilateral partners and uh, that you have the opportunity to debate new ways to provide humanitarian assistance. So I hope that you have a uh, good talks in Tallinn. As Madla said, brave to be here in November, uh, but even braver to go deep into these topics that you have on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Marine. Juliet Parker uh, is the director of ALNAP, and we are very happy to welcome her first time in Tallinn uh, as our keynote speaker. And uh, Juliet has been working for Action Against Hunger UK before. She has more than 20 years of experience, mainly focusing on meal, and you have been working across the world. But I will let you talk more deep yourself. Great. Oh, I've left the clicker. Sorry, I just realized I left my clicker. Hang on. Totally, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> totally powerless without a clicker. Great, very nice to meet you. I'm Juliet Parker, I'm the director of ALNAP. ALNAP is the learning network for the humanitarian sector. So our job really is to bring together a network of organizations from across the sector to harvest and synthesize and analyze the learning in ways that we can help put it back into the sector for improved humanitarian response for the future. Thank you so much to the Estonian Refugee Council for the invitation to join the conference here today, and to Eero and Marin for opening this event. Sorry, I'm a bit out of breath from having run down the steps. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm very much looking forward to today's interesting discussions. I've been asked to give some opening thoughts on the macro trends currently shaping the humanitarian sector. And in doing so, I'll be referring to the State of the Humanitarian System report. This is ALNAP's flagship report and the only independent longitudinal assessment of performance in the humanitarian system. In September last year, we published the fifth edition of the report covering the years 2018 to 2021 inclusive. Since then, we've discussed findings for a year with over 50 audiences globally, which has been an eye-opening and valuable opportunity and there are some consistent themes from both the research and those discussions that have come up, which I want to reflect on as you take the opportunity to today to exchange on some of the issues that you're grappling with. I'll be discussing with you today how the system is trying to maintain its balance while dealing with a stretch in its remit, a shift in power, a funding ledge, and an increasingly tricky tightrope to walk on principled humanitarian action. So let's start with the remit stretch. 
There are three key features of the landscape for crises and humanitarian action which have come up repeatedly in our discussions across the sector over the past year. We know that the overall demand and price tag for humanitarian aid is rising. Our report tracked that rise, and since our report came out, that trend has only continued upwards, with over $50 billion requested through the UN appeal system alone this year. We know that more and more, the humanitarian caseload is made up of long-running, so-called protracted or perma-crises. These comprised 70% of all humanitarian funding needs in 2021. We also know that as people spend more time in crisis, they increasingly seek support that addresses their longer term aspirations and the root causes of crises, rather than continuing to receive repetitive short term relief. So in short, protracted crises are both driving up the demand on humanitarian resources, while at the same time, these are the crises where the relevance of what humanitarians can offer is being tested and pushed to its limits. A lot of this seems to point to the importance of strengthening links across humanitarian development and peace efforts, the so-called HDP nexus reform areas. But our research found that, despite the nexus now entering its seventh year as a key policy issue in the sector, and despite the huge momentum created by the DAC recommendation on the nexus in 2019, that overall progress on the nexus remains quite patchy. A key, re a key reason for this is that there are still widely varying interpretations of what the nexus actually means and what success looks like. People might complain about the lack of progress we've seen on localization, and we'll get to that in a minute, but at least the localization agenda has set clear targets so we know what it's aiming to achieve. For some, the nexus is about strong coordination, and we saw good indications of this happening at country level, albeit largely driven still by humanitarian actors. If the nexus is about breaking down silos, then there are promising examples here. But overall, funding mechanisms have largely remained siloed. And if you think the nexus should be about addressing root causes and ending the drivers of humanitarian need, potentially the interpretation most aligned with what people affected by crisis say they want, then the evidence is pretty strong that this isn't happening. And this presents a few difficult questions that we heard other donors and agencies grappling with. In particular, reflecting on humanitarian needs, how these are defined and who defines them, whether the caseload needs to be reduced by a refocusing on the most severe and life-saving needs, and what this means for the people trapped in protracted crises where development actors have retreated. We've also heard donors talk about the need to better coordinate to support nexus approaches, both within individual donors, but also across and to include their engagement with multilateral development banks, banks as part of this coordination. And over the course of the past year, as we presented our report, we heard about more small to medium donors joining the growing pool of examples of providing blended financing that can be used for a range of purposes without needing to fit into the classic developmental or humanitarian boxes posing the question of how the wider sector can learn from these experiences and perhaps scale them. We heard similar questions about the system's ability to change when it comes to shifting power to communities through accountability to affected populations, AAP practices, and to local and national actors through localization commitments. There's a number of factors one can look at to assess progress on localization, but the two biggest ones have been funding and decision-making power. If we just take funding, the two most photographed slides for, across our events were probably these two. This one, which depicts the reverse trend in direct funding to local and national actors away from the 25% grand bargain target, with local actors receiving directly 1.2%. And we've updated this slide to reflect this year's GHA numbers, which were not in our report. And then in contrast to this, Nearly half of all humanitarian funding, 47% over 2018 to 2021, went to only three UN agencies. And while localization and accountability to affected populations do have their distinct issues, it is perhaps sobering to note that local NGOs' experiences of the international humanitarian system echo the experiences reported by communities of the humanitarian support they receive. 
feelings of disempowerment and a despondency when it comes to the prospect of having any real say in influencing how decisions are made. While both localization and AAP are now very mature reformer issues, it didn't stop them from feeling like very live, pressing priorities, as organizations are really trying to grapple with the lack of transformative shifts since the World Humanitarian Summit. Some questioned whether transformative change is possible or realistic, while others are doubling down on the big commitments their organizations made several years ago to really unpick the stubborn barriers. A big example of this is the recommitment of several grand bargain signatories just this past March to finding ways to bridge the gap of the 25% direct funding target. For donors in particular, there are questions on how they can work around their inability to fund local and national NGOs directly by incentivizing better partnership models in UN agencies and INGOs, as well as a tricky balance in finding workarounds for due diligence requirements that can create barriers to access for local actors, while at the same time navigating an increasingly critical and politically conservative domestic environment for aid. Now to talk about the funding ledge. The third most photographed slide in our presentations was this one, showing the concentration of humanitarian funding. 57% came from five donors in 2021, and nearly a third from the US alone. In other words, that the humanitarian system was balanced on the budgets of a handful of donors, and that although this concentration was nothing new, it appeared to be particularly precarious, as that year we saw significant aid reductions from a number of major donors. Nearly seven years on from the World Humanitarian Summit calls to di diversify the funding base, the system seemed to be worryingly stuck in this dependency. In the years since we launched the report, some of the fears around declining volumes were assuaged. We saw an uptick in funding from nearly all major donors, but, this appeared to be largely driven by the Ukraine response, and while volumes might have increased, the concentration of donors actually thickened. By 2022, the three largest donors accounted for 64%, and the US alone for 39%. And while the established Western donors may have increased their aid, others provide, proved more volatile. For example, funding from the Saudis nearly halved. As we expected, as we talked to donors and aid agencies around the world about the report findings, most discussions eventually or quickly came back to funding. And three big questions emerged from all the funding discussions. Can the funding base really be diversified? In previous reports, we heard a lot of hopes pinned on emerging donors, innovative finance initiatives, and multilateral development banks. This time, these were a little more muted. In our seminar with the World Bank staff, we heard on the one hand of great potential for supporting crisis prevent prevention, response and recovery, but at the same time, a clear reality check that this should not be seen as a funding source for the core work of the humanitarian system. Which links to the second point, that there is significant funding that flows outside the formal humanitarian system. Direct giving, private funds, development funds, all critical to the response, but which the system still little understands or takes into account. In the State of the Humanitarian System report, we tried to acknowledge and reflect these flows, but struggled to quantify or meaningfully map them. Our working definition of the system is linked to receiving international humanitarian funding, but how do we all rethink our relationship with the ecosystem outside the system? And thirdly, we heard many calls for better donor coordination whether to allow better coverage of forgotten crises, reduce the bureaucratic burdens for grantees, or leverage collective power for system change. But if this is hard enough among a concentrated donor base, what would it mean for a diversified one? Especially in a world where the geopolitical fault lines have become starker than ever before, and pretensions of apolitical aid are laid bare. This brings us to the fourth area of dilemma and debate that has dominated our discussions over the past year. The principles tightrope that humanitarians are walking in a changing geopolitical landscape and in changing contexts of constrained humanitarian space. Our research in the State of the Humanitarian System report revealed many signs of this constrained space. A striking indicator was the rise in attacks on aid workers since the previous edition. 
a rise of over two-thirds in the space of six years. Evidence from Syria to Myanmar and our case studies in Ethiopia and Bangladesh also highlighted the dilemmas and compromises humanitarians were facing as they sought to somehow deliver on their principles of humanity while maintaining a semblance of impartiality, neutrality and independence. As one of our interviewees put it, we're in an absolute crisis of a fight for core norms. In the years since we published the State of the Humanitarian System report, the operating space hasn't got any easier. The numbers of attacks on aid workers has only marginally declined, and the vast majority of victims were local and national staff. For the first time, local and national NGOs were worse affected than INGOs. Linking back to our analysis of localization, it appears that while funding isn't being significantly transferred, risks certainly are. Further analysis by a Norwegian think tank has also shown that in the 15 years since the first edition of the SOS, we have seen and are continuing to see a significant transform, significantly transformed global political order playing out in both the space for domestic civil society resistance and reaction and Western-led humanitarian response. Unlike the heyday of liberal democratization in the 90s, we are now witnessing a democratic decline and erosion of civil society space. So what does this mean for principled humanitarian action? Discussion of our State of the Humanitarian System findings centered on three questions. First, whether the system could still lay claim to its principles, and whether we could do with more honest and open assessment about where, faced with real-world dilemmas, international donors and agencies were making trade-offs between staying to deliver and standing firm on principled red lines. In our review of the evidence, we found a striking lack of evaluations of the processes and outcomes of these decisions. Secondly, how could the humanitarian staff making these daily difficult decisions on the front line of humanitarian response be better enabled to do so with the support of their organizations? The evidence sources we gathered for the State of the Humanitarian System report suggested that in-country staff often lacked the guidance, skills, and senior backing to walk the tightrope and make what are inevitable trade-offs between access and principles. And third, which brings us back to the previous point, given that the humanitarian system relies on local and national staff and organizations to access the places where internationals cannot reach, how can it do so with due attention to ethics and duty of care? As we discussed these four challenges to the humanitarian system, the remit stretch, the power shift, the funding ledge, and the principles tightrope, again and again, we heard a determined call for change at this potential inflection point for the humanitarian system, for a reaffirmation and reframing of what the humanitarian expression of global solidarity with crisis-affected people should look like now. And as it does so, it may be worth summarizing what we heard from others a call for world leaders to be assertive about the imperative to respond to humanitarian suffering, to be ambitious about the support crisis-affected people should expect and expect to shape, and to be humble about the role of international actors to lead and deliver this alongside frontline responders. But before I sign off, a few learning points relating to your topics of discussion today in case of use. I've already talked about localization, but the interesting dis distinction that's gaining strength at the moment is the difference between localization, where the sector is trying to localize itself, as distinct from locally-led action, where the sector steps outside itself to provide direct support to local groups without them having to be part of our system. For example, mutual aid and the survivor and community-led response approaches, thereby sidestepping many of the institutional blockages that are inhibiting the progress of localization. On digitalization, with its significant and exciting potential, learning suggests that humanitarians remain susceptible to being attracted to what is shiny rather than what is needed and that they can tend to take individual organizational approaches in line with our competitive model, rather than investing collectively in ways that may deliver greater outcomes for the sector. And on cash, this has been the great learning example for the humanitarian sector of the last 10 years, successfully growing in volume and as a proportion of humanitarian assistance, whilst almost also demonstrating increasing evidence of positive outcomes across a range of sectors. 
What potential then for cash interventions with their positive lear learning curve to become increasingly instrumental in shifting the dial on the learning sticking points of AAP localization and the nexus where the sector is struggling to make the progress at once? And with that, I wish you the very best for an interesting day of discussions ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. And I know that you're also ready to receive questions, if there happen to be any. You can just raise your hand. Hi, my name is Faisal. <coughs> um, I work uh, alongside some of the organizations here. I think Mondo is definitely in house. Um, uh, I'm, I'm rather new to the to the sphere, and my question is specifically about hidden hidden fees and the difficulty with with uh, not fees uh, funding and with uh, tracking it in in your report. Um, what are these sort of hidden fundings in the context of for for a newbie like me? What 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 does that mean? Maybe we could take the second question as well. Hi, my name is Luisa. Um, I'm an independent. I've uh, been in the humanitarian sector for almost 20 years now. And so my question, having followed the, the ALNAP process in the state of the world's uh, humanitarian system for many years, did you find anything positive out of the last five years? <laughs> Do you have an example where it's, it's working or there's something really kind of encouraging? Um, I think that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay, maybe I can start with the good news question first. Yes, there is a lot of positive indications. The humanitarian system is delivering more aid more successfully to more people across the world than ever before. And what the evidence shows is that the, the humanitarian sector is getting incrementally better at doing what it was set up to do, which is delivering assistance in terms of scale and speed. The challenge and frustration comes from the humanitarian system now wanting to do things that it wasn't upset, uh, set up to do. So it was set up for scale and speed, but now what we want to do is scale and speed and highly customized responses that are tailored to much more contextual preferences. And that's where this tussle comes in, and that's where you see the issues that the sector is getting frustrated with itself about. But um, there is slow incremental improvement in performance. We are de delivering um, on a bigger scale than ever before. What the humanitarian system is really good at is response programming. And also there's really good um, indications of improved outcomes on a whole range of um, technical sectors. Nutrition, health, cash of course, water interventions. Um, are all, there's more evidence of outcomes and better evidence, which all puts us in a better situation to be able to talk about humanitarian performance. In terms of hidden funding, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what forms of hidden funding you're talking about. There's two areas, really. One is our ability to track, understand, and comment on financial flows within our system. So this has challenges, which uh, my colleagues would be delighted to talk at length about, because we face it every three or four years when we produce the report, is how to actually get an accurate pic picture of financial flows. One is that the overall system, the sector's systems are not great, at tracking it. The other is that there isn't total transparency. So if we're talking about you know, issues of passing on of overheads or any of those sorts of things, it's quite difficult to get an accurate picture because the sector is not incentivized to be particularly transparent. But there's also this issue of um, financial flows outside of the system, and this is what I referred to in the presentation. We know that official humanitarian assistance is a tiny proportion of overall humanitarian assistance globally, but it's very difficult to map the system outside the system, or to get an accurate picture of informal financial flows. So there's a whole area that we just don't really know about, and yet one of the obvious shifts that um, the humanitarian sector is moving towards is having to be better at 
coordinating, communicating with, understanding and complementing the system outside the system. And we can only start to do that if we understand who they are, how they work, and, what the, you know, and the financial flows as well as other things. Any more questions? Hello, uh, I'm Mari from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and thank you for a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if you're also researching the new and emerging donors, and what are the trends there? Uh, is there another question as well, maybe? Hi, thanks. I'm uh, Luke from the uh, IFRC. Um, so, Julia, a, um, a question about um, networks and how you analyze networks. Um, so, what do you, <laughs> you haven't, you talked about a system. <clears throat> um, how could you describe what that system is? And then you talk about an ecosystem. What is that? Um, and so, what, what techniques or what kind of approaches do you use to, to try to understand um, what it is that we're des describing when we say the humanitarian system? Okay, so this is, uh, again, if I'll start with the second question first, maybe. Okay, so this is a really complicated uh, <laughs> question, and um, I would definitely recommend reading the State of the Humanitarian System report, because actually within that, one of the useful things is about, about it is that we have to define the sector and what we mean by the formal humanitarian sector. And it has increasingly fuzzy edges. There's also, in a, one of our other presentations, there's a map <laughs> where we map, you know, and it's an extremely complex map. The reality, yes, yeah, so I can't actually particularly answer it, but very happy to take it offline and give you a much more detailed answer. But it's really complex and constantly challenged, rightly challenged. And each time we go into the next process, which we're just starting now of defining, of delivering the next State of the Humanitarian System report, we are again challenged. It's like uh, on what, where the edges of the formal system sit. And one of the findings is that we need to, as I said, we need to be much more cognizant of the external ecosystem and how we relate to it how sincere we are about relating to it and what we need to understand about our language approaches and connections. And um, yeah, emerging donors. <laughs> yeah, we do talk, um, well, they're an interesting prospect for a variety of reasons. And we're seeing um, different trends in emerging donors, which again, I can pull out more detail if you want. From a learning perspective, I think emerging donors are really interesting because they bring a different learning agenda. And here I'm not only talking about, for example, smaller governmental donors, but also um, the growth in foundations. And foundations um, sit somewhat outside our sector and bring quite different attitudes and expectations about performance approach, learning approaches, and what it is that we're looking for. One of the challenges with the formal system in, in its kind of state of evolution is we seem to have got a bit stuck in our very, in our, we wanted to professionalize over the last 20 or 25 years, and we've almost professionalized in some ways to the point where we can't now do what it is that we want to be able to do, and we seem to have lost some of that flexibility. And there where you have smaller or emerging donors, uh, whether you know, governmental or non-governmental, they bring in a different focus and a different aspect and don't seem to be as constrained by the limitations we've put on ourselves by the more established traditional donors. And from a learning perspective as a learning network, we're really interested um, in what potential that brings in for bringing in new perspectives. Good morning. Hi, my name is Rina from the Estonian Refugee Council. From the, thanks for the report. Uh, from the learning perspective, does ALNAP actually study some long-term protracted uh, crisis like Afghanistan, Myanmar, Somalia, and sort of bring lessons from those cases also to the general reports. And then does it actually make suggestions for the policymakers to change the course of action? Sure. I think there's another question over there as well if we want to take two. Hi, I'm Christy Akba from uh, Mondo. Um, I'm curious about the transfer of risk uh, that you were discussing. Um, I'd really, 
appreciate it if you could explain that a little bit. What kind of risks have been transferred? Is there um, are there any safeguards uh, being put in place? You know, to to protect um, the, the the local uh, the local um, actors uh, and um, just a little bit more clarity on that point because it seems to me kind of like it's just the fact that it's been transferred over, but why and 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 what's being done about it would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Great, maybe I'll talk about the learning cycles of, of approach. Um, so within this uh, report, actually we have longitudinal indicators for the system that we track now, we've tracked now over 15 years. But in terms of country specific um, issues, um, each, in each report we pull out um, particular case studies of countries where we can take a deeper dive. But this is a very macro level report where we sort of cover everything, uh, but it's a struggle to then cover anything in very much depth. Where we do pick up learning um, kind of over extended periods of time, what we found is that um, humanitarians have very short memories. <laughs> Each response, there's a kind of new enthusiasm for everyone bringing their new ideas, when actually you can see that, well, as I mentioned earlier, that real learning and change in the humanitarian sector is slow and incremental. And one of our jobs at ALNAP is to make sure that the learning from the past is feeding back into the responses, you know, current and future responses to enable better learning. For example, when uh, with the Ukraine response, we went back to the Kosovo response, which had been 20 years before, to go back to some of the evaluations there and pull out actually what was the relevant learning from there that could be usefully applied in, in Ukraine. And what we found was that in a 20-year period, some things had changed dramatically. The adoption of mobile phone technologies was dramatically, significantly diff different. But on other aspects of the response, it was exactly the same. Huge fund levels of funding going in, uh, you know, um, a chase for uh, adopting national partners, um, you know, all sorts of very pragmatic programming um, aspects. The challenges were still exactly the same. So that's part of our role. In terms of, we don't personally uh, track uh, learning on individual contexts because there are other mechanisms to do that. But what we do try to do is to harvest that learning um, at, a, at a global level in order to feed it back into these reports. So. I hope that sort of answers. Um, in terms of the transfer of risk, that's a really complicated question, but actually quite well documented. So there's quite a lot of research done on it. And essentially, it's about the way that our business model is set up. So as you saw, we want a more diversified, um, inclusive humanitarian system. But the reality is that the resources are becoming more concentrated, which means that you have more uh, funding going kind of through many intermediaries to get to the point of implementation. But that the funding does not, uh, becomes more projectized the further down that chain you go, which means that there is less flexible financing for uh, financing things like security training or uh, you know, other kind of core costs that would enable national organizations to better um, invest in and protect their staff there's a and um so and there is a struggle with incentive structures within the system to be able to deal with that because um no intermediary <laughs> wants to take on more risk but what so it's there's a natural kind of incentive to pass it down the chain and the reality is that you see national organizations um, taking on much more of the risk without taking on the support structures and financing to be able to actually manage it in the way that they would consider appropriate. So that only hard to answer your question, but I'd be very happy to pick it up afterwards. Thank you very much for, for all the questions and answers. We're a bit tight on time, so I'm sure you are ready to answer privately if you just approach Juliet when you see her chilling here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now let's have a quick break, 10, 15 minutes, and we will start with the first panel.
Okay. All right, let's slowly move back to the seats. You can grab your coffee with you, uh, that's not a problem. Okay, everyone, please, your coffee, please grab your coffee and find the same place you were sitting before or any place you want to sit.
to the ones who are watching us online, there is also opportunity for you to ask questions uh, after panels. You can write them on YouTube, or if uh, someone prefers Facebook, then find the Estonian Refugee Council on Facebook and just give us a message and we will go through them uh, during the panel. But I think everyone has almost been seated. I'm very happy to uh, introduce the first panel of our conference. Flashing Cash is humanitarian cash here to stay moderated by Kitty Polos. And um, I would actually invite Kitty here to the stage as well. She's from Norwegian Refugee Council and she has experience from very different around the world. Uh, mainly, or I can't maybe say mainly focusing on cash because you have so much experience, uh, but uh, briefly before you start the panel and introducing the panelists, uh, please introduce yourself as well. And uh, on behalf of uh, Kitty uh, and the other moderators as well, uh, during the panel uh, she might ask some questions which might not represent her own views, but just to give like different perspectives uh, what we have heard in this world. Kitty, please. Good morning to, oh, this is very loud or not. <laughs> Good morning and thank you for the introduction and for the Estonian Refugee Council to invite me to be the moderator of this first uh, session on cash, humanitarian cash. So why this session? Why is there so much talk in the humanitarian sector about cash? Well, we've all witnessed that over the last couple of decades, cash has significantly increased and has able, enabled us to reach more people in need. Um, so it has proven to be an effective way of delivering aid. It is an enabled choice of recipients and it is cross-sectorial. And because of these benefits, you've, we've noticed, we have witnessed that donors have also given priority of cash-based intervention. And this has further increased the scale of cash in the humanitarian assistance. Um, so this growth has stimulated um, different reforms, but we, the cash has also driven reforms in our sector. If you think about the UN new ways of working, of course, the UN sustainable development goals and the grand bargain. But it's not only limited to cash itself. Cash, because it's, cash is like a spider in a, in a web. It, is, it has linkages and opportunities with different parts of the humanitarian sector. If we think about accountability to affected populations, to localization, a discussion of later today as well. If we think about financial inclusion, which we talk about more and more in our sector, social protection, one of the new thematics, I would say, in our sector, and also, of course, cash in related to the digital transformation that we're going through. So there's a lot that can be reflected on when we talk about cash, and we're going to try and cover a lot of that in the next hour and a half or so. But the purpose of today's discussion is to look at some of the challenges and some of the critics that are uh, set about cash assistance, but also what could be a future direction of cash in the humanitarian sector. And for that, we have three panelists from different parts of the humanitarian sector that bring their own expertise and views and experiences. So I'd like to welcome the panelists on stage, and I will introduce them one by one. <laughs> Thank you. So first, Luisa Seferis. Uh, she already mentioned during her question, she's currently an independent consultant, uh, focusing on cash assistance, market-based approaches, livelihoods, and safety nets. And before becoming an independent consultant, she worked for different INGOs on similar thematics. Very welcome, Luisa. Thank you. <laughs> Then we have Quinton Legallo. He also started working for NGOs before making the move to ECHO. 
Um, he has focused also very much on cash and food security and livelihoods. He started with ECHO in the East African region, and now he's working for the MENA region, still with ECHO, also very welcome. And then Ero, I think you already know what he's doing right now, <laughs> but he actually comes from the IT sector, so he's very passionate about uh, innovation and new ways and more effective ways of, of uh, providing assistance, and he led many humanitarian responses, both in the Middle East and Central and Eastern Europe. So thank you all for being here. Um, before, as I mentioned, raising some of the challenges and critics that are present in our sector on cash and cash-based assistance, I would like to give the word to all of you to say a few things from your perspective on this topic, and we will start on the left. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, can I see a show of hands? How many of you are familiar with cash assistance in humanitarian programming? And we'll use a loose definition of, of familiar. OK, so we've got a good mix of people here. Um, and I think, Ero, your, your introduction was so perfect, talking about the experience receiving things versus receiving cash. And I think those of us who have been involved in the cash revolution in the last 10 years or so, and I'll, I'll use the word revolution loosely as well, um, we know that it's about connecting people with markets, and there's a certain dignity and flexibility that comes with cash that just isn't possible when we're giving people things. Um, and so as a recipient of cash, what we hear time and again, and it, this is something that happens across contexts, which is quite rare to see something that is so universal, is that there's an appreciation of the choice, the flexibility, and the anonymity that cash can bring people in a crisis. You become another consumer, and again, connecting people to those markets. We also talk a lot about um, the multiplier effects or the support to local economy that cash can bring. Um, those of you who have worked in responses and have seen the big trucking in of international assistance know that that can really hurt local markets as well and the recovery in that process. And so this has really been something I think that has uh, galvanized the, the humanitarian sector. I also think because cash is a place where uh, it's not sectorally based, so it's not about whether it's shelter or protection, it brings in all the elements. There's a certain level of flexibility in terms of the system that Juliet was talking about and why cash has been kind of the darling of a lot of policy discussions is because the people who are coming to discuss cash have kind of, they've understood the context, they've done their homework, and they're ready to ask those very difficult questions about connecting people. Um, if we're honest, though, cash has been a little bit kind of controversial in terms of letting go of control. So the idea that you, as a humanitarian, would go in, you identify a very clear need, maybe it's for food or water or shelter, and then you, as the specialist or the expert, would come in and say, this is what people need. With cash, there's an element of understanding how much people would need, but then letting go and saying, it's up to you to decide if this month it's about getting your children in school or um, you know, meeting an urgent health need or meeting your food needs. And we've seen over the last 10 years, um, which was, we used to call them e-transfers, now it's, I guess, digital cash. Um, you know, the, the lingo's, the lingo's uh, evolving. But we've seen this, this loss of control in, in kind of a welcome way to say, well, people know best. At the same time, um, I work at the intersection of kind of participatory programming, accountability, and market-based programming. Cash, there's been so much focus on the cash itself that sometimes we get a little bit too myopic in that, in that view. Um, and recognizing that people are economic actors in their own right, whether they are refugees or just affected by the conflict, and there's a need to kind of zoom out a bit and say, yes, we could design the most perfect cash transfer that's built on all this amazing data and we understand the markets and all that. But there's a bit, again, that, that, that shift in control is to controlling the information and designing the perfect program when we know that often what we need is just good enough. Um, I could go on and on, and I know we're <laughs> going to be discussing some of these other issues, um, but I am, as someone who has been working on cash, uh, let's say before we knew it was cash, I'm very encouraged by the fact that it is continuing to be mainstreamed. And those of you who have been working in the sector know that since 2015, um, we've made huge strides in saying the default should be cash. And then if you cannot provide cash for market or conflict reasons, then we are trying to answer the question, why not cash? Um, and this is a very welcome shift in the humanitarian space in terms of power sharing and, and shifting the, the decision making in terms of how the aid is used to the affected people themselves. 
Thank you for that passionate reflection. I will definitely come back to you on some of the things you mentioned on markets. <laughs> Quinten, would you like to share a few reflections to start? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for uh, organizing this uh, event. It's a, an honor to be here. So um, I, I'm honored to stand uh, before you today as a representative of DG ECO, the European Commission Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection Mechanism, uh, to do, discuss about this issue. Is cash to be here, to stay? So ECO, we have our last policy was released in, uh, on the cash specific in May, March 2023. So yeah, ECO has always been cash first. Um, so yeah, is it is there to stay. The uh, short answer from our position is yes. But yeah, just to uh, go quickly on some um, key element on why it's a paradigm shift, this cash transfer. Um, so in terms of, it has been said a bit in terms of empowerment and dignity. It has completely changed. Now we give the power to the beneficiary to respond to their own needs. They know better. Um, in terms of efficiency, the, the scale, the digitalization, we are able to, uh, to be more cost efficient, so we monitor this at ECO. And yeah, we are clear on the whole cash cost efficiency versus in-kind, other modality, because cash is only a modality. Uh, it's cost efficient. Um, it's cost efficient for some, yeah, some of the main opportunities is that it reduces the procurement and transport cost. It lowers the overhead cost, it reduces risk of inefficiency, use of aids, it enhances transparency. The digitalization is also a very good tool for uh, that, strengthen the accountability and reduce security risk. So it has yeah, some uh, very potential uh, from our side. So speed r and rapid of scale, Ukraine I think is a good example. Rapidly we have been able to go at scale. Um, the flexibility that it gives. And yeah, it has been mentioned also at the beginning, the economic stimulus in local markets. Um, and yeah, it's helped to reduce risk and aid diversion. Once again, digitalization plays a key role here. Some of the elements here is the digital tracing, the real-time monitoring, the biometric registration, and fair verification. It allows us now to be way more cost-efficient and, and effective, I do hope. Um, increase accountability data analysis, data is power as of today. Cash has allowed us to work way more on data issues because, uh, yeah, it's ex especially with the move to a digital uh, transfer or e transfer. So, yes, the, it has improved on that side to engage with the local community. So, coordination and oversight, we are able to somehow with some tools to better coordinate. Um, Documentation and reporting, it's a bit more transparent with the cash assistance we can, with, if we program with quality. Reporting mechanisms. Um, and yeah, it has been mentioned at the beginning in terms of nexus. It's a complex uh, work area. With cash, we have been able to do some kind of linkages a bit more clear now with social protection, with the cash assistance of the national system, and it has helped us to move a bit that uh, file, so it's uh, interesting. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it offers quite a lot of uh, p potential. Now, it's not the silver bullet. It's not the silver bullet. Once again, it's another modality that we have in our toolbox to deliver aid. Uh, so yeah, there are still some challenges in terms of the security, the protection, uh, this remain data protection is a big issue with uh, cash assistance. Coordination accountability, that still uh, remain a challenging area. And reliable payment mechanism in those contexts where we work, sometimes it's difficult to have uh, the appropriate environment for cash assistance. Ukraine was clearly a very good environment for cash assistance. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a bit all I, I wanted to uh, share. And yeah, looking forward uh, to discuss with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. 
a lot to come back to, definitely, when we talk about social protections and, uh, and systems. So come back to that in a little bit. But first to Eero. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, cash is uh, one of my favorite topics <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the humanitarian sphere, uh, in, in addition to the data and digitalization uh, question. So happy to, to chip in here. Um, well, as I started off today, then uh, um, the the understanding of humanitarian assistance definitely has uh, changed over the course of one generation. Uh, when I was a child, then you know this kind of in kind was the default. Uh, giving things was a default, and I think a lot of the societal understanding of uh, humanitarianism and, and humanitarian assistance hasn't, in Estonia at least, hasn't changed. Uh, the, the sector itself, the humanitarian sector, has moved on and has clearly understood that there has been a paradigm shift, as you mentioned, uh, but kind of the societal uh, understanding of humanitarian assistance uh, kind of remains in this old way of uh, understanding uh, packages, like, like the ones we received in the 90s. Um, but uh, the sector itself has moved on from there, at least partially, and we can discuss you know, why the path dependency, I guess, uh, uh, leads us uh, you know, not always responding the, the, uh, the right way. But the, the grant bargain commitments uh, and the, the statistics of uh, uh, assistance actually show that you know, th there is a uh, very general uptake of cash as a uh, preferred modality and for a good reason. Uh, the reason being that cash is the fastest, uh, it is the most cost efficient, uh, you know, approximately 25-30% uh, uh, cheaper than, uh, than in kind as some research uh, shows. Um, it's, the, as Quentin said, uh, accountable and transparent way because you can actually you have a uh, log of uh, what has happened. Uh, it's a, and this is of importance, I think, for me especially. It's a, the most dignified way, as uh, Luisa said. Uh, you can act as a consumer, as a regular consumer. You you go to a shop and you buy what you need rather than uh, something is given to you uh, in a, in a you know, not so dignified way always. Um, and it injects uh, money and, and capital into uh, markets in crisis, because I think that the worst thing humanitarians can do is to set up uh, uh, food uh, assistance uh, kind of warehouse next to a functioning shop because this ruins the market. You over flood it uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, free goods, and then you, you see markets not functioning. It's obvious that they, they will be affected by, by free goods. And uh, adi one additional bonus, which I think you haven't mentioned, is that it has the potential to reach areas which are unreachable uh, otherwise. Uh, so the, the kind of the human turn access uh, as an additional um, thing which can be facilitated by digital uh, transfers. So due to these reasons, I think uh, the, the question uh, is no more, should not be why cash, but rather you know, why not cash? And, uh, and if not now, then when? Because uh, we discussed over the breakfast already that, uh, you know, in, in the context of uh, Gaza, for example, uh, you know, the market has the potential to function properly, but uh, the, the kind of the gates are blocked, and therefore the market can't function properly. Uh, but the market itself is there and could function if it was allowed to function. Uh, at the same time, it's obvious that uh, this is not a silver bullet. It's not like a magical wand that we can uh, use. It's not going to substitute uh, other modalities of assistance. Uh, after, after all, this is what it is. It's a modality, uh, a tool in our toolbox, as you said. But uh, I would emphasize here that it's, uh, it's not a simple screwdriver. It's a kind of a power drill. Cordless <laughs> power drill, which uh, you know, it's it's a more powerful tool than than many others that uh, we have. It can cover a range of needs, uh, 
whether it's unconditional cash transfers or sectoral conditional restricted cash transfers. So it it can allow for a uh, range of needs to be addressed. And uh, it also should be re regarded as a modality so that we can also mix it with other modalities depending on the context. And uh, I mean, I agree, cash is here to stay and, um, uh, and there's nothing <laughs> we should or could do about that because this is the, the backbone of the uh, economy. There are challenges and risks associated, and I think these are some of the uh, limitations, are some of the things we, we are going to, um, uh, to look into during the discussion. But uh, just to, to reflect on what Lusa already said, that uh, it's a matter also of letting go, you know, of trust, that we actually trust uh, the people in need to make uh, right uh, choices, and I think this is the epitome of, uh, of what cash is. It's about trust as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, I think a lot of reasons why cash and why it has grown so much, and also why we have this panel here. But I think you've all mentioned, you know, it's not a holy grail. You know, it's not the solution to some of the challenges that we're facing in the humanitarian sector. It has enabled, it has made a progress and made our sector, I think, stronger, but it's not a holy grail to everything. And there's been so much focus on cash, like every debate, every policy, it's on cash. So do you think that maybe sometimes cash is still being seen sometimes, maybe by policymakers in strategies as this solution to everything and therefore has diverted discussions away or discussions um, from other topics that we should be maybe focusing on more than only cash? It's a good question. I mean, I think we've been saying for a long time, cash magnifies, magnifies and exposes the problems with the humanitarian system because of that real-time kind of reconciliation. So whether you're talking about a distribution or at the policy level, um, the, the gains that have been made with cash are very tangible. Those of you who have followed the, the grand bargain processes know that the cash um, work stream was one of the most successful and they actually closed it for the, for the grand bargain because they kind of reached the goals. Um, and so, yes, there's been a lot of focus on cash to the detriment of other things. At the same time, cash is a vehicle, and I would argue as a Swiss, maybe it's the power drill or a Swiss army knife. Like <laughs> you've got all the different uh, tools at your disposal. It's been a really big vehicle for challenging the humanitarian architecture. I'll go back to your point, Ero, on um, restricting cash. We've actually... In, in, in the iterations of cash, we talk about multi-purpose cash or you know, cash for this, cash for this sector. Ironically, with the shift and links to social protection, which uh, is kind of the next frontier as you're talking about, which is where cash still takes up a lot of space, but we're bringing in some of these other issues around digitization, interoperability, et cetera. There we talk about social assistance because multi-purpose cash is kind of an oxymoron. Of course, cash is multi-purpose. Um, there's still that element of kind of control and restricting people um, in terms of saying, I'm giving you cash for shelter, so go spend it on shelter. Um, so I think that, yes, there's been a, a, an undue focus, but because there's a lot of let's say, frustration in how slowly change has come and how quickly cash has brought about some of those changes, for better or worse. So magnifying and exposing again, and I know we'll get into some of the questions around aid diversion and the digitalization of cash that has kind of pushed humanitarians to think about different ways of engaging with affected communities. Yeah. But then, as you say, there are different modalities or sometimes it's multi-purpose cash, sometimes it's cash for a specific sector. But we also need to think about the limitations because if you only give cash, cash is not what we are here for as a humanitarian sector. It's a means, right? It's not an end in itself. So there are so many interventions where we just give cash. Mm. And then also if you look at the value of cash that we sometimes distribute, for example, for refugees in Moldova, it's 100 euros per household per month. That's not even enough to cover basic food needs. So, you know, the importance, and you all reflected on this, on making sure that cash is integrated in the wider response. And what we see now, this uptake in cash is also seen in like multi or big multi-purpose cash assistance program, which is just cash. 
and recipient only receive cash and nothing else. So this is what some of the critics are saying, like cash has taken over some of the, the broader humanitarian invention, why we are here to receive certain outcomes. Mm. Anybody who wants to? <laughs> uh, well, what you you mentioned um, is is complete. I agree uh, the about the um, you know cash for this and cash for that. I mean, uh, it's at the end of the day uh, we are not really looking. Uh, I mean, we are asking the questions, of course, in post distribution monitoring, etc. Uh, what the cash was. Uh, eventually used for, but uh, as a modality itself, uh, it's, it's free, it's mm -hmm. open to use, and even if we uh, give uh, uh, the, uh, for example, cash for repairing your, your home uh, after being shelled, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and this is how we target, but at the end of the day, the, the household may have the urgent need of medical care and actually will use the money on, on that then uh, we have still assisted. Uh, and, uh, at, but the problem is that this essentially then becomes multipurpose, right? Mm. So even if we target based on this, uh, you know, our targeting criteria and, and what we uh, see the need being uh, in, in, in the certain uh, population, uh, then uh, effectively uh, we can't, we, we give this trust to them to make the, the kind of, not right, but in, according to the priorities, the, the uh, choice. Um, so absolutely, uh, cash is, you know, makes it, uh, opens it up. But at the same time, we also hear and, and learn from the previous crisis that uh, even if we give things, uh, people, mm -hmm. if they don't need it, they either throw it out and it becomes garbage, or they sell it and uh, and still buy things that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, I would then argue, kind of uh, leave out this one complication along the way of getting what you actually need. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to go to the market and sell it uh, to do uh, to do that. And uh, when it comes to the transfer value of you know how much cash are we actually giving? Uh, you mentioned Moldova, 100 per household, uh, which is not sufficient to, to cover the needs in Moldova, uh, obviously. Uh, in Ukraine, by the way, we just recently, from 1st of October, we increased the amount of, of uh, cash assistance, uh, which is uh, uh, good and welcome news. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a difficult balance to strike uh, because uh, we, we know of some organizations who have argued for a lower and lower uh, transfer values uh, tr and arguing then that if we lower the transfer value per person, then we can increase the number of people who um, receive assistance. But uh, I think th there's, there is a balancing point uh, in between. Uh, where we don't really cut short the people's ability to then do, to meet their needs mm. uh, and still assist sufficient number in order for it to be uh, of importance. Mm. And your point about the, the fact that the agencies are focused on cash, I think, if I can be a bit controversial, when, when people, when organizations started to realize the amount of funding flows that could flow through their organizations if they did cash at scale, I'll give you a very practical example. I worked with an INGO in Lebanon 10 years ago, and we were processing 40 million uh, euros uh, a month. Um, and so it's a program of about 200 million euros, and that obviously comes with uh, certain benefits. So there was this race to say, who's going to take cash at scale? Who's going to hold that piece of the pie? And sometimes to the detriment of the complementary assistance that needs to come. So we talk a lot about you know, the modalities, in-kind, vouchers, cash, etc. But there's also the hardware or the infrastructure that humanitarians often need to bring, whether it's shelter um, or water or, or other things, um, you know, structures that are not in place. And then there's the, for lack of a better word, social services or, or, or software when it comes to, for example, accompanying protection cases. And this has been a big controversy uh, in, the, in the sector saying cash for protection. First of all, what does that mean? It's actually for basic needs for, for people who are facing severe protection concerns. But because the focus has been a lot on cash, then sometimes we see that those 
services that need to go around it. So those of you working in social protection, that would be social work. Um, in the humanitarian space, it's protection. But what kind of case management, what kind of accompaniment, what kind of referral to other services need to accompany that cash? Unfortunately, we have seen that siloing, and we keep having to repeat, cash is not a sector. Um, it is, a, again, a modality. It's supposed to be meeting in a number of different objectives, um, but it often needs to be accompanied by other things. Um, and there's an increasing understanding of market-based programming. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, I would encourage you, there's the Markets in Crisis. It's a community of practice. There's a website um, where people are thinking across that divide on economic recovery. So cash being that first step of using markets to enable um, economic recovery, then how can you support or even change market systems to be more inclusive, more functional, etc. And actually, that's where we see a lot of homegrown initiatives. I won't call them local because then we, we label them something else, but Ukrainian initiatives that have been really inspiring to say, listen, we don't care about your labels, development, humanitarian, government, NGO. We're looking at the economic recovery in a particular area. Yeah. And linking that to markets, because you already referred to it, um, in reality, yeah, when there's good cash programming, it stimulates markets. But in reality, humanitarian crises are often in countries, areas where markets are disrupted. Economic, financial crisis at the same time to a humanitarian crisis. So are our programs adaptive to that reality on ground? Because often we design a program, you know, it's very beautiful, but then you come there and, you know, markets are not functioning. There's unregulation, there's no compliance, little oversight. So do we as humanitarians really are able to, to operate in these type of markets which are not, you know, according to the, the ideal situation? Would you like to? <laughs> um, I think this might not necessarily be related to the issue of cash or not cash, because the the assessments that you do, that you uh, do, you should know what are the needs. Is it accessible? Is there a market? So this is more about quality programming. You would go for uh, in kind or uh, another modality called voucher. You, you should do the same thing. So I think it's not necessarily related to yeah to cash specific. Cash has helped because we need to have way more work before in terms of analysis so that once again once everything is set up yeah we just cash out but yeah so there is a lot of time to build from the beginning and this has helped to improve on the quality programming of this so yeah it's a uh, and we have moved uh, quite uh, yeah quite fast on that and yeah we need to focus to come back to your first point Yes, it takes a lot of time because, yeah, we have to build a narrative uh, that we see it uh, all. Uh, it's a big tool, a lot of money. Now we have to agree. And, yeah, building the narrative took time. Uh, and, yeah, the whole debate on uh, multipurpose cash and conditional and conditionality, the sectoral cash, what we do. Yeah, we still have a lot of work to do on this, but, uh, yeah, it, it's moving fast, it's moving fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess what you're saying is, what was said before, is like cash responses magnifies and shows some of the underlying risk and challenges that we have in the sector, but because of the skill and the reach, it kind of brings it at the forefront, which is a good thing as well. So we may be opening with our cash programming these discussions, not only for cash, but mm -hmm. for the sector at large. Um, yeah, going to, to systems, um, because we cash now how we are distributing it, like e-cash, we need reliable systems. We need mechanisms to actually transfer these 40 million, you know, tens of millions to, to the beneficiaries or the recipients. And we are very much reliant on external environment, the digitalization. We are adapters in that sense financial service provider, but also other digital companies that provide these mechanisms, these systems that we're leveraging for our humanitarian sector. But of course, we still have an accountability to manage the risk, and specifically, you know, the protection of data and beneficiaries. 
So do you think we have the resources to make that link and be those adapters and still being able to get to connect and make sure that we keep our accountability and provide the protection and manage the risk related to these digital systems for large car cash programs in our sector? Your IT, Ero. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <really. laughs> well, uh, 10 years before and then 10 years in the human turn. But uh, um, yes, we rely on uh, banking systems or uh, kind of quasi-banking systems. And, and sometimes even like in Somalia, there would be a Havala system, you know, this uh, uh, different uh, methods uh, which people use uh, to to transfer money money between themselves, and we can, in a time of crisis, we uh, can tap into these uh, channels of uh, uh, finance moving in order to assist, uh, and then we rely on the uh, functioning of these systems. Of course, uh, if the banking system fails, which never happened in Ukraine, for example. Uh, then uh, we need to rethink. Uh, you know, then cash is not a feasible modality, or we then need to uh, do it in a in a different way. Mm. Uh, different organisations, you know, do it also differently. Whether it's bank transfers, uh, right to people's uh, bank accounts and bank cards, or it's uh, you know Western Union or you know these other kind of uh, finance service providers who are not specifically banks per se. Uh, but I think from my own experience in, in the Ukrainian case especially, uh, then what we see is that people are pretty ingenious uh, in accessing cash, even in the hardest of uh, uh, situations. And uh, uh, this usually is not the, the blockage uh, in, in this pipeline, is not uh, you know, people are not receiving the aid and then saying, I can't access, because uh, even in, in really difficult uh, to reach areas, people are finding this and kind of uh, making them their own uh, new ways sometimes uh, of, uh, of uh, getting cash. So yes, we re rely on these systems, but at the same time, we rely and trust people to, to find ways in order to, to utilize cash. Unfortunately, I think some of the worst breaches of data protection and data privacy that I've seen in cash programming comes not from the financial service providers or the private sector providing those financial services, but from the humanitarian organizations themselves. And not for any sort of bad intent, but just not knowing how to handle the data or the systems um, in place. Uh, and it's gotten much better over the last 10 years, I have to say, we're not using the Excel systems. But the main issue, and it's not just a cash specific, but again, cash magnifies this issue, is that humanitarians want to have all the information. We think that more is more. And that collecting every minute question about your family and their needs, that that will make a better program. Um, most of that information is never used. And the other big thing, it's cash, but, but you know, uh, more broadly, just any assistance, is that data is the entry to receiving assistance. You have to provide your information in order to receive assistance. And there are very few actors that offer viable alter alternatives. And even when they do, when we talk to people receiving cash, they say, I'm not stupid. Either I give them all my information and I get the assistance, or what am I going to do? Be difficult and not be able to feed my family? So there's a real reckoning around those types of systems. And you mentioned biometrics. They can be really amazing. They can be very useful. They've also been impl you know, uh, implemented in places where people are very reluctant to give their biometrics. Um, and I think that that's a reckoning that we need to have uh, in, in terms of that space. And the other thing that I've, I've seen kind of a, a trend, no matter what the payment system, so whether it's banks or um, you know, money transfer agents like Hawalas or Mobile Money, private companies have had, because it is part of their business model, mm -hmm. they've had to think 
a lot more strategically about data protection and data management and also data disposal. And that is becoming increasingly uh, a focus of organizations and donors like ECHO are funding initiatives. And I think, uh, Julia, you said something really important, but investing in collective initiatives. Because that's the other thing that as an independent, I'm very proud to be an independent and say this very openly, there's still, it's not an arms race, it's a cash race. So all the organizations, um, many organizations are developing proprietary systems. Now sometimes that's absolutely necessary because nothing else exists and you need to be able to provide that assistance right away and you see a clear way forward and that is totally fine. But what we see increasingly is a longer term investment in proprietary systems that belong to an organization and that have kind of a, what do you call it, like, a, like an entry, a barrier to entry. And that's also why we don't see as much localization as we would like in the cash space. Maybe there's some questions from our digital panelists yeah. uh, or we will contribute to your discussion later on, uh, because of course digital and cash is very much uh, linked. Um, maybe going to you, uh, Quinten, about coordination, and our colleague from LNAP also made reference to that, uh, more generally in the sector, but maybe we can talk more about it specifically to cash, because there has been this huge uptick in strategies, donor strategies on uh, cash management or cash-based interventions. Um, and there's so many parties involved, you know, from the highest to, you know, the ground level, so to speak. Do you think that our oversight on cash-based assistance is fit for purpose, or do you see areas where we maybe need to amend or strengthen? Thank you. <laughs> we can always improve. We can always improve. But... Uh, yeah, with cash transfer, so there have been a lot of global agreements at different level, donor level, UN level, NGOs. It has helped to, yeah, to bring us a bit more focused on this, because once again, it's a modality, it's across everything, and yeah, and yeah this issue of cost efficiency in interests us. So, yeah, it's, we created this, so it's a donor coordination forum, and at country level, there are some initiatives like that in Ukraine. It started right from the beginning. We created the informal uh, donor cash forum. So, yeah, we need to be coordinated. It, it's, we have mentioned a bit the issue of yeah, multi-sector and integrated programming. And this is where we have an opportunity, like on the Ukraine one. We did quite a lot of step ahead in terms of having a common system where we all work on, and this is about deduplication of beneficiaries. Strangely, yeah, it's the cash transfer has magnified the need that data can be, data system need to be interoperable. And it should be for all the sectors, but yeah, it came, uh, well, these are complex issues, so it needs a lot of level of coordination. Now there is the new, cash coordination model, and it's rolled out in many con countries. It, cash transfer can look simple, but yeah, we, may, we need to coordinate properly around that tool, because we have the responsibility of do no harm. Mm -hmm. And as uh, this does not depend on uh, the modality, but yeah, the, the, the we cannot do harm. So giving just not the same amount, you can cr yeah, contribute to s s some social tension. And so yeah, we have to coordinate. So I think it's, we have uh, several platforms. We need to ensure that they are effective and we connect the dots between them, not to, to multiply those platforms. Because uh, yeah, everybody is using that modality. Once again, it's just a uh, modality. And uh, yeah, they are, it's, Still complex, the whole issue of inflation, how mm -hmm. to tackle cash transfer and inflation. Mm -hmm. It's important that we coordinate at different levels. And yeah, I think having those structures, so donors, global, regional, or country level, formal or not formal, I think it's very good. It helps the coordination with the actors on the ground. So yeah, it's not about the bottleneck, now we will go to the transition of the new cash coordination model. Um, and uh, yeah, this has been put in place to try to structure the way we work on, because uh, once again, everybody using one way or another cash transfer. Mm. So yeah, I think it has helped. And 
we can always improve, of course. Yeah. yeah. I think this new structure is, is a good development and it has taken some time. As Louisa said, you know, it's not, cash is not a sector. So when cash came into the sector, it took some time to find how can we structure it because it's not according to what we're used to. But I think this new development is going to help um, the entire sector and has found its place now in the coordinating uh, structure. And, and to a certain degree, I, I would even say that uh, it's a bit leading the way uh, because y you mentioned deduplication, uh, you know, deduplication as the, the way of uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we are not uh, doubling or even, I mean, we have seen people who apply in five different organizations and then we have to ensure that they all only get from one in order to for others to receive the same level of support uh, and this is this level of deduplication we do uh, in the cash sector is definitely not something we do to the similar, similar level in other sectors in other aid modalities so I think you know this is a of uh, added benefit of uh, of doing cash that, that uh, and the data which comes with that is that you are actually able to put it in the one system and uh, deduplicate in a in a meaningful uh, way yeah and maybe in the future we'll move away m from the sectorial division in mm. the humanitarian sector right and go more to theme ethics like cash but that's maybe for another debate uh, <laughs> but before going to the audience and have your questions uh, raised to the panel i would like to talk mm. about social protection mm. um, and it's not only to cash but again maybe cash has has magnified it are we as humanitarian uh, actors sometimes have taken too much the role of the government of duty bearers and specifically when it comes to social protection and when we're thinking about cash programming and of course when there's a crisis often governments are not completely able to fulfill you know the social protection mechanism in the country so therefore we sometimes step in to with the idea of temporarily fill the role and to support the government and in regards to social protection but we also see that sometimes, you know, we stay for a very long time with the same type of programming, the same type of assistance, or sometimes we just abruptly stop. It's like, okay, you had six rounds of cash distribution, and the idea is that it leads to something for future, for longer term uh, type of support, but that doesn't always happen. So one hand is, okay, we step in, maybe sometimes we disempower a little bit, and at the same time, you know, our interventions are not linked to social protection or linked to other type of assistance. So this is some of the critics, you know, that you all have read uh, and heard probably. So what do you think of those critics and what can we do maybe to, to address, you know, and better link cash programming to social protection systems? <laughs> no pressure. Um, maybe I, I think it's so funny because social protection has existed m almost as long as humanitarian assistance, probably more. And then we wake up one day and we're like, oh God, there's this whole other parallel world that basically does the same thing, but different reasons. Wow, it's incredible. Um, and so again, this, this labeling of social assistance being one component of a broader social protection system, being that idea that it's the non-contributor where you, you don't have to contribute. And when you have those robust social protection systems like in Estonia and in other countries, you've got also you know, pensions, you've got uh, unemployment benefits that come in and, and provide this kind of package. And so I think the humanitarian space is waking up to it. Um, I do think that there's, there's kind of two broad challenges. One is because humanitarians are scrappy and pr prioritize that speed and scale, there's been a lot of leaning on humanitarian actors in countries where social protection systems are broken or are just starting up. So we see this in Lebanon, we see this in uh, Somalia, where there's a reliance on humanitarian actors to help either the government or the big, like the World Banks, to set up their systems and run with it. The other thing is then we run into the whole other parallel world of development, which has its own agendas. Um, and I think one of the big, uh, let's say, um, uh, positive factors in the Ukraine crisis is one of the few countries that is severely in crisis but has a social protection policy that's rights-based, that doesn't exist in a lot of countries. So that should have been really easy, but there's this idea that 
it, because it exists, we can connect to those systems right away. And then you realize there's a number of technical or even kind of principle or policy-based issues that make it very difficult to connect those systems. Um, and one of them is around how much do you give, right? Because social protection, social assistance components of social protection, they're thinking long-term. And one of the things that um, we work a lot with, the kind of humanitarian donor side, and I, I agree with you, Kitty, this is the, un, the elephant in the room, <laughs> that humanitarians come in and they stay a long time, and the emergency stays a long time. Um, however, governments are often thinking way in the future. And so when they commit to social assistance, they're committing, whether it's for refugees, displaced people, or citizens um, that are in the, you know, the, the place of residence, they have to commit to assisting them for as long as that program then exists. Whereas humanitarians don't have that sense of, uh, of responsibility for better or for worse. And so what we end up seeing is that humanitarians find it difficult to link to social assistance from social protection because they're providing very, very low amounts. So even less than that 100 euros, I don't know what it is in Moldova these days, but I can bet it's not 100 euros. Um, it's, it's then difficult to justify, okay, am I really even making a difference in someone's life for the humanitarian needs if I'm providing this level of assistance? So the, I would say the future, and what I'm excited about is we're talking about layering assistance. So instead of saying we're going to restrict this for cash for shelter or the discussion last year in Ukraine was you know, cash for winterization, um, winter comes every year. I don't know if we're aware of this. It comes every year. So instead of talking about another minimum expenditure basket and a transfer value for winter, let's layer that assistance. So we agree that the social assistance from social protection is the basic, basic, basic. And then as humanitarians, let's coordinate, let's agree on what that top up would look like. And then let's be clear on how long we provide that. And the last point I would just say is that we, you know, we, the coordination often focuses after the programs have gone through and we're looking at deduplication so that we can assist as many people as possible. But actually, if the coordination had been a bit stronger from the beginning, the deduplication would be less important because maybe there would be a geographic um, you know, repartition between different humanitarian organizations. And then maybe it would be easier to link with, for example, local government um, who are providing a lot of those frontline services than if they have to meet with 20 organizations that happen to be dropping in and out of those areas. And what do you think, all of you, about the dependency that we create a dependency both from the government side because we come in with a huge, you know, sometimes bag of money. And at the same time, we create a dependency on cash programming from the on the beneficiary sides. You want to? Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> that was my uh, job, uh, only easy <laughs> questions. Uh, uh, the, coming back to some degree to, to what you said, you know, the, the layering is the the operational side of it, you know, how do we conceptualize this, uh, that our humanitarian cash is kind of topping up the, uh, uh, the social protection system, which is either non-existent uh, or uh, in, in countries at war, in countries of, at crisis, uh, they are just not sufficient in order to, to meet basic needs. Uh, so we top up this, uh, uh, this need in order for people to, to be able to meet their basic needs. Um, and I think hum as humanitarians, we have to also separate ourselves a bit from this uh, social protection uh, which is provided from the government uh, and is universal, is according to the governmental uh, degrees and, and uh, the, the policies set out by the government uh, and also distinguish you know, who is the person who needs humanitarian assistance because this is not the same as, I mean, we are not running poverty uh, reduction programming. Uh, we are running humanitarian programming. So whom we are targeting are people, you know, hit by uh, emergencies, you know, um, in, of shelling, of uh, uh, who have been drawn into war, who have been displaced, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a different way of targeting uh, altogether, so not everybody who is on a social protection system, if it exists, uh, is automatically a humanitarian assistance uh, neater. So it's, uh, in this sense, I think it's important to separate, and you know, you mentioned development, I mean, this, I think, goes to, to, to that separation as well, that, uh, uh, you know, World Bank and that IMF, others coming in, they are there to, to bolster the governmental response, the, the governmental social protection system. But we, as humanitarians, 
uh, have a different kind of targeting model, if you will, uh, our aims and goals and, and uh, targeting are, are different from that. So I, I would say separate, mm. but uh, layer indeed. I mean, this is the kind of the operationally, how do we actually then calculate the, uh, the amount, the transfer value, et cetera, uh, in, in each context. Although I would challenge that there's a lot of overlap and what we see increasingly is a push to deliver that assistant because the cash assistance then lasts longer and there tends to be, for example, the proxy means tests which are kind of vulnerability or poverty based. I totally agree with you that there's a different kind of consideration of caseload, but as time goes on, we start to see them kind of overlapping and there's a push for efficiencies and government-led systems. Um, and so I think your point is a really, really important one. We've got those principles. What happens when in reality they're blurred because mm. that poverty reduction system doesn't even exist in some places and they're turning to humanitarian mechanisms to put it in place. It's a big dilemma. Coming to the nexus uh, discussion as well. Okay, thank you. Let's see if there are any questions or... Yes, I see immediately a hand being raised. Somebody's eager, that's great. And maybe there's also some people online with questions or comments. Hi, I'm Karen from Data Friends Space. Um, gender hasn't, mention, hasn't been mentioned much today at all, so I'll uh, raise this issue. To what extent do gender dynamics uh, within households play a role mm. in the um, risk analysis and also how you design cash programs. Um, Quentin, you mentioned do no harm. How do we make sure that when we do give um, household level ca cash assistance that it doesn't exacerbate um, gender dynamics that we actually uh, want to uh, turn around or improve? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you. Would you like to answer? Yeah, thank you very much. So this enters as part of the whole assessment and designing of the program. No matter what the modality you will use, you have to analyze if your program will do any kind of harm. We have some uh, indicator on the age and the gender disaggregation of the data. So this is part of the assessment. You have to look at that, it's a standard. And then once we implement the action, yeah, we have to keep on following those things. But this, yeah, this is part, I would say more, on, once again, quality programming. No matter what the, yeah, the modality, you have to do this kind of analysis. So we ask it, and yeah, we have a um, mainstreaming uh, protection indicator for all the action, you have to include that. So yes, I would say, this is quality programming, important for cash as for all the other modality we are using to deliver humanitarian aid. Mm. There's a lot of really interesting research that's out there um, on the, how cash can change the household dynamics. Um, and one of the things we've seen is, A, it's very contextual, obviously, um, and that tends to be a humanitarian blindness, not cash-specific, but again magnified, that we really need to understand how households interact, who decides on the spending. And as Quentin mentioned, that a lot of the cash assessments are asking organizations to really think about who does the decision-making and who does the spending. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting debate, and there's a very great report out by Simon Levine looking at female-headed households in Somalia that I would recommend, because essentially it, it debunks this idea we think, oh, women are the most vulnerable. As a woman, sometimes I take offense to that, but that's another issue. Um, and they realized that all, there were a lot of female-headed households because they had misunderstood the question of who is the head of household. Um, and so I do urge people to think a little bit about those dynamics. And what has been really interesting and I think powerful is the organizations that tend to take a slightly um, scaled down and localized approach to, for example, cash for protection caseloads so that they're really able to understand those dynamics um, and be able to either stop or shift assistance if it's putting women at risk. Um, but I think the big lesson is know the context, know the, the cultures of participation and interaction, and then really listen and make sure that we're not treating women or children in a vacuum, this idea that we have to help the most vulnerable. Men are part of their lives, they want men to be part of their lives, and we want to make sure that the cash assistance is enabling families, um, that we don't kind of force uh, you know, certain, certain norms um, that said, there's also really there's a lot of interesting debates on whether cash can have a trans gender transformative element. 
Um, frankly, I think we need to deal with a lot more basics just in terms of do no harm before we go that, that route, but it's a whole other debate. And to add on top of that, and uh, as was mentioned by Luisa uh, previously, then uh, you know, cash is not really you know solving. It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't no. solve all the problems, uh, uh, and it often doesn't also create new problems per se. But uh, you know, we uh, need the other services to be there as well. Uh, and oftentimes, then we need to give cash in order to access these services mm. if they are not for free. Uh, but uh, this is part of the solution as well. You know, even if it, in certain contexts, can exer exacerbate uh, existing uh, kind of cultural norms uh, and, and create uh, problems in that regard, uh, then it can also be uh, on the side of the solution uh, going forward. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I see another question, uh, another hand up. And there one, three, one, two, three. Maybe let's take two and then... Uh Thank you. Um, yeah, you all mentioned that cash is not a silver bullet, um, but it, we, as we see it being used more and more by organizations as a silver bullet, you all mentioned um, uh, the, the, the example of Moldova, for example, with 100 euros or 100 dollars being um, what is the cash assistance given to a household, which is insufficient. Um, I just wanted to uh, come back on the how can we or how can the humanitarian response strike the balance between um, reaching as many people as possible with cash, like uh, literally pumping the number of people reached versus actually properly reaching people who are in need and covering their needs, um, uh, not fully we cannot, but to an extent which their human, uh, human dignity is um, respected or maintained. And how does, uh, uh, what is the role of donors? Um, looking at you, Quentin, uh, if you can give us a bit of, um, how does ECHO um, tackle this issue of um, organizations just bumping their numbers because they are giving cash? Um, and what incentives could be there, if you have any examples from your uh, experience where an organization tried to find that balance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think here we are talking of the issue of ad balancing adequacy and coverage. Mm. So yeah, we have put cash coordination working group in, uh, we are part of the new cash coordination model to coordinate this kind of process. Everybody is, is supposed to come around the table to have that discussion. What is so recently on Ukraine? Yes, there was a revision of the transfer value because, in terms of adequacy, we are not really comfortable with the uh, amount at the beginning, and maybe we think that we need to update this. So I think this, these are those processes that we do uh, 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 at country level. Now, uh, in the context we are in, with the reduced funding. Uh, you and the increasing risk, it's a challenge that we all face. From the partner, there need to be a strategic uh, positioning. We were talking of those contexts where you have protect social protection, cash assistance that is delivered. Where do you go? And, and, and so, yeah, to better identify your uh, niche, but our, our position is you have to target based on need, so understanding the needs of the population, the capacity to, uh, to, 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 to assist them with cash, so understanding the uh, need, giving uh, adequate assistance based on it. Now we have to work on the balancing that uh, in uh, each of the context, because yeah, the situation is, uh, is complex. We don't have the funding to answer to all the humanitarian needs. And having a closer, discussion on this and with systems so that's why it's a, it's a with the cash working group yeah we are able to have a system to discuss this kind of issues fine with the transfer value that's increased but we need to better target we cannot just uh, so it's a complex one it's a complex one but yeah there are tools that are in place and uh, to try to balance this I don't think we include communities enough in these discussions. Um, we were just doing some research on social assistance in Somalia, and there's a lot of feedback from people that they feel like 
the projects are brought, they, they call them pre-cooked meals. So it mm -hmm. comes when the meal's already ready. And you might have a menu, but then if your people are hungry, you're not going to turn down the food, right? And so this idea of adequacy versus coverage, there's some, you know, uh, Echo and others have done some really great thinking around that, and there's some great technical discussions, but we should really be bringing that question back to communities and say there's a finite amount of resources. I, there's, there's, a, there's a reluctance to be transparent on this because of the, the maybe raising expectations or having, you know, a lot of backlash, um, but what we've seen by and far is that people actually prefer to have a reduced adequacy for greater coverage in places where community is a very strong part of their life. Lives. It might be very different in other places, but yeah, I think both the, the fact that you were talking Quentin, about making sure that's part of the coordination, I think is so important, and then bringing in different voices and having a very honest conversation about the limited resources. I don't know why this, is, this has happened in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years where humanitarians almost need to have all the answers, and so uh, it's created this idea that there's a limitless pot, because it might look that way if you're, for example, a local mayor or a, you know, a community leader seeing these communities these organizations come in. Um, I think also the other thing is that we keep see seeking a magi magic silver bullet within the silver bullet, which is there will be a perfect formula for the adequacy versus the coverage. And the same thing for inflation. If we just calculate, we'll know exactly how much. There's not. Uh, and I think we just kind of need to let go a little bit of that and think about, like you were saying, just, just be very honest about the trade-offs um, and, and maybe open that discussion to a few more people before the, the cash actually uh, is in people's hands. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree that uh, the honesty should be there about the trade-off, that uh, you know, we could reduce uh, by half the amount we transferred, then increase uh, double the, mm. the number of people we... Uh, so it's, it's a kind of simple mathematical calculation, right? But uh, this is not the proper way of doing that. I mean, you shouldn't uh, just take, you know, let's give 100 euros, nice, nice round number, easy to report about, et cetera. <laughs> uh, but it, it, this is not the way to, to do that. I mean, there are methods of uh, calculating sound methods, like the minimum expenditure basket, and then see, you know, the... the uh, income level and then you know what's the the gap there uh, and obviously we would like to be more individualized in in the approach because people's households are different families are different they are in different circumstances uh, but we can't really always do that and I think this is a bit of the this uniformness uh, of this assistance is a bit of a, the, also a trade-off that we have uh, uh, been forced into, that we can't really weigh in the uh, personal circumstances, but we are, there's a harmonized amount, and uh, we are giving that uh, in the same logic to everyone, which is accountable, but at the same time not always in accordance to the needs people may actually uh, face. One of the methods to, to track that, of course, is through monitoring, and we can go back and, and see whether people, how did they use it, what kind of needs uh, they were able to address, and, and what was the actual need, and then gradually also factor that in, in, in any changes, because you know, we can't just decide at one point of time that this is the amount, let's give that to everybody, and then forget about it, but we do need to factor in inflation and, and all the monitoring results we get in order to, to make it more adequate uh, over time. And it may have uh, the trade-off of uh, giving to less people, and then we need to just do targeting properly. I think a discussion to be continued. I saw a hand over There's there and a hand over there and a hand over there. Oh. We need to do, so maybe one question, one answer. So, because otherwise we're running way beyond schedule. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, dear all, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olga. I'm from Ukraine. I'm very proud to be here. And I'm actually representing, uh, representing some humanitarian organizations and also working throughout uh, Ukrainian Horizon Europe team who is researching this topic of humanitarian aid towards our Ukrainian refugee women. So, my question is, is it possible to create some general digital mechanism which will ensure the transparency of humanitarian aid flows? And uh, actually, is it actually possible in our modern multilateral world? Thank you. Great question. I think also a question that we can ask this afternoon, but maybe there's one of you who quickly wants to 
provide some reflections, or do we pass it on to the panel this afternoon? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I think it's a big, uh, too big question uh, to a certain degree, uh, because I know that such solutions have been tried out to a certain degree in Ukraine uh, to try to tackle that. But there's always the, the problem of, you know, out of the thousand actors, uh, 50 start <laughs> using that, and then you, you, you get the only part of the picture, and you will never actually get there unless it's driven uh, centrally. And uh, I mean, I would remain a bit pessimistic in that regard. If it's not required by donors, if there's no, you know, overall donor uh, backing to such methods, like OCHA has the financial tracking system service, etc., uh, then it uh, probably will will not be taken on board because organizations are reporting you know in every direction uh, all the time uh, so I would say you know let's use the systems we do have for for tracking these things and then help also local actors you know, reference to the last panel we have today uh, uh, support them in actually using this already existing uh, systems instead of uh, creating new ones. Your IT background comes in very <laughs> handy for <laughs> these difficult questions. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So I'm curious about how this um, cash-based solution could work in a situation like, for instance, Lebanon, as you mentioned, where we have um, the problem, or even in Yemen, where the problem is um, not just the fact that people are low on cash, but we have, for instance, governmental uh, institutions that are dependent on NGOs, such as uh, local municipalities that need, uh, aren't able to pay their wages. They're, they have an infrastructure for providing services for, sanita for sanitation and education, but they're not able to pay the salaries to the people who are providing it or even fund any, you know, uh, garbage pickups or things like this. So how realistic is, I mean, this is obviously more on a, on a, on a governmental scale, mm. but when the problem is that pe people are not getting their salaries from their governments, and the services would otherwise be provided. Is that something that could be looked into? Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start and then you can talk about Yemen. Um, we've looked at this issue in Lebanon. Um, there's actually a really great uh, good practice review on um, cash and challenging environments and, and situations of inflation that was done by this donor cash forum that looks at places where you just simply don't have liquidity and you have dysfunctioning systems. Um, a couple of months ago, I was in the Kurdish regions of Iraq where they have the systems in place. I met with the, the Minister of, Social, of Labor and Social Affairs and she told me, oh, we haven't had any money in our systems for, since 2015. So then when you come in with the cash program, what is that looking like? And, and yes, it's true that the government system has different goals than a humanitarian system, but in a place like Kurdistan, where you're not having those shocks um, uh, as, as frequently, or it's a different kind of, of program, you really do need to work closely with the government. I would take the easy way out and say that it depends on the context. There is a lot of, and this is where I think a lot of us are encouraged by this new cash coordination model, um, and those of you who are not familiar I would encourage you to have a look, but it's really about positioning cash in the humanitarian system as being under the intersector or intercluster as a resource for everybody so that you have that space to coordinate and think collectively about those problems. Is it liquidity? Is it inflation? Is it a, like a systemic issue as it is in Lebanon? So there's, you know, it, it, we've been talking about this in Lebanon for the last 12, 15 years about linking those more development programs that are supposed to be supporting the government flows um, of, in, of, let's say, money and and resources, inshallah. We know that Lebanon is a whole other issue. And then what does it mean now with the, the recent crises? When those issues are tackled collectively, and there again the Donor Cash Forum is doing a lot of work, it just tends to be much more productive and that the risks tend to be uh, a bit more kind of well understood before they before b b before people engage in, but it's a very real question. It doesn't stop you from doing cash, but it's obviously a lot trickier and there's a lot of kind of conflict sensitive um, components to that. One minute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Response. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> so Yemen. Yes. We so as per ECO, the one of the priority we have in the policies, looking at how we can link humanitarian cash to social protection. When you arrive in those contexts, and you, Ukraine was very interesting. Understand where you are working. Ukraine, they have system. Is it the best system? Can yes, no. We can improve it. Yes, no. 
and then we have we try to work and to leverage maybe those systems. So understanding your <laughs> context is interesting. In Yemen, we are trying. There are some avenues, but this is part uh, yeah, of the, the approach. Understand your environment, because maybe something is happening on that side. And we could maybe try to, to have a continuum of support to those beneficiaries. So yes, there are some small opportunities, but it's a complex environment with, a, with a two different governments. So yeah, better understanding your environment when you want to work on linking the two. Yeah. Thank you. The most difficult uh, responsibility of the moderator is timekeeping. <laughs> so one more question and yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Javier. I work for the Center for Humanitarian Data. And uh, DG ECHO has been very kind supporting a lot of guidelines on data responsibility for cash and voucher assistance. From where I'm sitting, which is on XDX, where we receive a lot of data, I know there has been a lot of successful stories where they do protect the data and they share only aggregated data to XDX. But just from where you are sitting, uh, what do you think is stopping the adoption of following the guidelines on data responsibility? Is it skills, knowledge, care, time? What do you think? Because I think <laughs> like we are living on two different sides. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to know what is stopping the adoption. Mm. One minute each. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's gonna be a great question, I think, for the next panel. I think on the ground, on the ground for the cash based support, it's a, a mix of capacity and prioritization. Um, so it, it, the, the, the knowledge level, people, are, people who are interacting with communities or registering people or handling payments, they weren't hired to do that. And so that's always an add-on. Um, I think also just the, the lack of incentivization on that, and it's broader on, around cash, but also a lot of other programs that those who are doing the implementation often don't feel like they were part of the design of the program and therefore are not necessarily empowered to point out when they when they see some of those issues. Um, so it's not a lack of goodwill. I haven't seen very many examples of like malicious intent of collecting data or sharing personal data or taking photos of people when they shouldn't have, but it's more around the, the way in which we're set up to, to deal with those systems and how people are hired to deliver cash. You're more likely to have a background in distribution or in community engagement than you are in data. And then, as we used to say, you know, beep, boop, beep, boop, that's someone else's problem. Um, and that, that gets outsourced, and that's where you get those parallel realities, I think. Quickly, so <laughs> data, data is power, and this <laughs> is the world we are in. So I don't think it's a technical issue. We have, uh, we can, we have the tools. Well, now it's to agree on the sharing. How do we, what kind of uh, information we uh, share? So yeah, it's, and I think there is the humanitarian community and we, we change, we adapt, but it can take time. Data is a complex one. So I think there is maybe a, we have to capacity build uh, with more data protection officers everywhere to understand the data ecosystem in the country where you uh, live. Because yeah, that data is power now. So yeah, the well, uh, capacity building might be uh, an issue there, and it's because it's a complex one. And in the world where we are now, you know it's at all level, data is power. Mm. Humanitarian is not immune to what is on the rest. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's possible. It's, we, we need to find the space to talk about that. So the Donor Coordination for Forum issued a statement on interoperability of data system. So th this to give a position from the humanitarian side, what do we think? But operationalizing is complicated, yes. I think there is a tendency to, to gather more than you need, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to, to ask just in case, maybe yeah. you will need it later and uh, you will never actually get to, to analyzing that. Nope. Um, so, I mean, th this is a question of, of uh, knowledge and skills and kind of, uh, um, and also kind of principles uh, in that regard that you, you actually really think through what you need in order to, to make a decision and, and over time if you see that you don't need this data actually or don't use it, uh, then don't gather it. And another thing I wanted to say about that is the Estonian government uh, 
time ago already uh, uh, put down this principle that uh, uh, in the building up its kind of e-governance uh, systems that uh, uh, from each uh, citizen you should uh, ask for certain information only once. Yeah. And if the government already has this information, then uh, you shouldn't give it to the other government agency for the second time because government already has it. So I think there's kind of room to also um, learn from, yeah. from, from this kind of data sharing in a responsible mm -hmm. manner, of course, and secure manner, of course, uh, but just not to, to create also this fatigue of, uh, of giving out your data to X number of, uh, of actors and not really knowing where it ends up, because we have seen big data breaches happening in the sector as well. And, uh, you know, one side is what do you collect, but also how do you keep it safe? Thank you. But uh, luckily, Javier is also in the second panel. Exactly. So, <laughs> so expect You'll this answer. question coming back at you this afternoon <laughs> from the cash panel. But thank you so much. Um, I think we will continue this discussion today, but not only today. I think in the years to come, because the humanitarian sector is here to stay. Cash is here to stay. I think what I'll take away from this discussion today, and I hope you as well, is that Cash is not only an enabler, it's also a trendsetter. It has brought discussions at the forefront of the humanitarian discussions in regards to coordination, breaking silos, embracing you know, the external environment when it comes to working with the public sector, but also with the private sector, not only on digitalization, but in a really broad sphere. So I think everybody should embrace cash, not only for cash-based assistance, but really as a transformer and a trendsetter in our humanitarian sector but happy to discuss exchange further over it I think there's now a lunch break but I'm sure that this will be announced uh, by the moderator but thank you very much for the panelists thank you. and talk to you soon <laughs>
Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. And uh, we are about to start with the second panel. Also, for your information, if you have not registered yourself out there on the registration papers, please do so the next uh, coffee break we have. Uh, so we can have some data, like in this panel. There are also a lot of uh, empty seats here on the left side. And also, again, the reminder to the ones listening to us uh, via live stream, you can text the questions you might have on YouTube or uh, to ERC's Facebook page, so we can ask them later on, reply to them later on. All right, I think we are almost all well seated. So we can start with our next panel, which you can see here, Make Sense, Not Data, led by Karin Masel from Data Friendly Space. She has also, like all our moderators and panelists, a lot of experience, uh, in her case, more than 15 years in Africa, in Pacific, uh, different other places. And I hope for a very interesting discussion also later on as the AI is uh, coming to our lives, uh, not only in humanitarian aid, but also in other spheres. Karin Mazel, can I invite you to the stage? And uh, please also, if you want to add something to the intro I made to you, feel free before you introduce the other panelists. Thank you. We've moved on to Estonian's favorite topic, um, digitalization. Um, my name is Karen, I'm the executive director of an NGO called Data Friendly Space. Um, we work exactly on this, on making technology and data available to organizations looking to make a social impact, a positive social impact, with humanitarian organizations being um, one of our most frequent uh, partners. So, um, before I introduce the panelists today, I want to give a little bit of a context to what we, are, we, what we are going to discuss today. As said many times over the morning, uh, we are living at a time of unprecedented humanitarian need. In fact, you don't even have to be a humanitarian professional to know this. And we are also living in a, in, in a time where resources are not keeping up. A couple more dynamics is the very quick development of technology artificial intelligence, one of them, but uh, also others. And there's a huge inflow of new types of data and new types of data sets that humanitarians are dealing with. Satellite data, Earth observation data, heaps of secondary data out there and uh, reports and assessments, um, uh, and so on and so on, so also social media. So within this context, then, this field of information management as an expertise and, and a field within the humanitarian sector is actually quite new. And it is considered that, and, and I'm sure the panelists will say more, that 2010 Haiti earthquake response was really considered as kind of the watershed moment for humanitarian information management. Um, lots of raw data, um, lots of new technology, a lot of new techniques on how to co collect data, how to analyze data emerged. And this was uh, actually complemented by a lot of tech-savvy, data-savvy volunteers flying in, trying to help out the humanitarian ecosystem. But at, the, at that time, responders were largely unprepared for all of this know-how, all of this data. 
And the field staff lack the technological tools um, to and, and capacity to really absorb this data. The humanitarian system didn't have many pro processes, protocols, like we like to have in place when it comes to information management. Although um, I believe a few years early in 2008, the Red Cross National Societies did establish guidelines for emergency needs assessments, for instance. And there was really a lack of kind of ecosystem for collaborating on data. So really, it was then that the humanitarian sector saw a real rapid rise in initiatives to help um, collaborate and collect and analyze data jointly. So the Humanitarian Data Exchange was founded in 2014. The Data Entry and Exploration Platform, DEEP, uh, was founded and established a couple of years later, both really key central repositories for data and humanitarian data today. And it's not only about extracting data, it's also analyzing and making sense of that data. So today, the humanitarian needs overview, of course, presents comprehensive joint analysis of humanitarian situations evolving needs. Fast forward to today, November 2023. In the humanitarian community, the role of information management is considered critical for effective humanitarian aid. And we will unpack this here in the next hour and a half. So I'm really glad to uh, welcome our esteemed panelists uh, this morning. Uh, please do come, uh, come on stage. Um, really a great um, mixture of expertises and uh, engagements and experiences. So starting from right next to me, we have Luke Cayley. Luke has been the information management lead at IFRC since 2018. He has overseen the launch of the IFRC Go platform uh, and really a growth in data analytics to support the work of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. A big fan of MAPS, he's still a volunteer for an organization called Map Action. And, um, and Luke holds a master's in remote sensing and spatial analysis. Then we have Zeynep. Uh, Zeynep Babi is the head of uh, the data solutions lead at NRC as of this week. Uh, so we can't pester her too much on, on, on NRC, but she comes with a, over a decade of experience and dedication to humanitarian information management. And Zeynep is also a distinguished tech lead leader focusing on technology's role in addressing humanitarian challenges. And we have Javier Terran, uh, is the par partnerships lead for Center for Humanitarian Data at UNOCHA since 2014. Uh, Javier is a statistician, and he started uh, with the UN in 2001, but has also served as a statistician in the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. So welcome, uh, welcome to all of you. And much like in the previous panel, uh, we'll give you, all of you, an opportunity to kind of reflect a little bit on the last 10 plus years that the information management sector has really professionalized within the humanitarian sector. And yeah, uh, and then we will go into questions. So Javier, can I start with you? Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy and, and glad to, to be with all of you. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit about the, the work of the Center for Humanitarian Data, just in case you don't know what it's all about. So the center was created in 2017 by UNOCHA with the goal of increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. As we have been hearing on these different panels, data is coming more and more every day. So very important to reach that goal is the management of the humanitarian data chain, which is the platform of the humanitarian community, where you can find data sets related to in every humanitarian active crisis, from Afghanistan to Yemen, and also on the platform you can find data about the sudden onset crisis. For instance, you can find data about the Morocco earthquake that just happened a few weeks ago, or the escalation of hostilities in the conflict of um, Gaza and Israel. But in addition to that, the platform also managed data explorers, and we built one very interesting to monitor the crisis between uh, Ukraine and Russia, where we were able to put different data sets for you to have a more complete uh, view of the crisis, so data about uh, IDPs, internal displaced people, refugees, conflict events, the humanitarian funding, so in that way you could have a better perspective of what's going on. But in addition to that, the center is also working a lot on data literacy, as we have heard on, on the sessions, there is also a lack of our community to understand and to deal with data. So we want to increase the, um, 
the confidence of humanitarians to work with data, to work and do analysis. The other very important part is data responsibility. So as we heard, um, we want to increase the trust between partners. We know that failing on, on, on following the guidelines on data responsibility, that has an effect on affected population, but also on the trust among ourselves. And the last area that I just wanted to bring to you, so in case you want to work with us and engage with us, is on data science. So uh, as you know, there is a lot of uh, information that can be used to anticipate the impact of a crisis. So there is a team in the center that has been building models to anticipate the impact of crisis. So there is a lot of information out there. I mean, not as much as I personally wanted, but in some instances, a lot. So we can, uh, the team can develop some, some trigger mechanisms that they can say, okay, there is a, a huge impact of this flood coming, maybe we, uh, we can activate some money, some funding, so the population can be more, re more resilient to that. So, just in a shell, those are the, the very important areas of the center. Great, thank you, Javier, and lots to unpack later absolutely. in our discussion. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Lou, can I go to you next? Of course. Um, and yeah, thanks, uh, the Echo, um, Javier's, um, thanks for the welcome. Uh, it's great to be back here for my second time in Estonia. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was talking to somebody at the lunch break, um, Greta, about the, what the information management actually is. Um, and it's in between a little bit the roles of IT, potentially, and MEAL um, mm. for the Estonian Refugee Council, for example, um, where actually, you know, we're about uh, taking the data but making sense of it and ensuring that it's used for decision making. So it's um, all about that whole process of collection, um, of managing the data in a, in a way that can be accessible, and then helping uh, decision makers to, to ba basically make decisions that are based on that evidence. And so um, my team um, does that um, for uh, the IFRC, which is the <coughs> excuse me, um, the uh, Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Um, we basically um, are the secretariat, which represents um, those 191 uh, different uh, Red Cross and Red Crosses around around the world. And we support um, strategic and operational coordination um, when there's a big emergency. Um, the the National Society, the Red Cross, um, will ask for our assistance. And so my team helps to. Um, provide that assistance, whether that's people going um, and supporting the, the Red Cross to respond to the emergency, or mobilizing a team which um, uh, is around the world. We have a network of over 200 people from all around the world, world who can provide support for individual um, data and uh, information management uh, tasks. We also um, focus on systems, so you mentioned the Go platform, which is um, basically our way of um, channeling the information into a, a, a kind of central system where everyone can see how that works. Um, it, uh, it's developed over the last five years to be not just around um, uh, you know, data and information management, but you can see the whole range of, inf of, of processes that a, 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 a national society will go through, from planning, to preparing uh, for emergencies, um, right through to responding and uh, requesting uh, for funding through that platform, um, through to yeah, understanding and learning um, on the basis of, uh, of what's happened in that uh, emergency. So you can have um, you know, that, that full um, cycle is available through, through a single, thing, single platform. Um, and yeah, the last part, um, as I mentioned, uh, we focus a lot, we basically think we're in the decisions business, basically. Um, so we're, we're aiming to make our decision makers, who, who often will use all kinds of different um, uh, experiences and, and techniques to come to a decision, what we want to do is move away a little bit from the variability, the unwanted variability in decision making, be more transparent, um, have better decision making systems, mm -hmm. and provide the evidence that they need. Um, so that's a, a key part of, uh, of what we do. And just, if you'll allow me, one yeah. uh, reflection on the, um, uh, yeah, ten, the, the, the years since Haiti. Um, as you say, um, that's a real uh, like change in the way that the humanitarian system understood information management and its potential. Um, and actually, you know, this is my first job um, at, with information management in it. Um, uh, and when I first arrived at the IFRC, um, within a month, I received a, an, uh, a policy on information management, which was issued by the Library and Archives uh, Department. So I wondered what <laughs> job I'd actually taken. Um, and actually, you know, the, the, the reality is information management was li is little understood um, in 
um, many organizations, but it's essentially to be alongside the operations manager, um, making sense out of uh, the situation, bringing order to chaos, all of those kinds of, uh, of aspects. And yeah, in Haiti, that was actually, I did my uh, thesis on, on uh, the use of geospatial uh, uh, imagery and analysis um, for Haiti, and it did mark a, a big shift. Um, we've made a lot of progress since, uh, and actually, you know, it's a bit like the, the boiling frog. You don't, mm. don't always realize how much change um, we've managed, but there's, there's a lot more that we um, must do, um, and I'm sure we can get into those details yeah. today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Luke, yeah, for reminding us what the title of today's panel is, that Thanks, make sense, not necessarily just data, and that's really what the information management um, area of ex expertise tries to add, uh, add to the humanitarian sector and decision making. Zina, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, it has been mentioned by a couple of us this morning that Tallinn is not the center of the humanitarian um, assistance world. But for when it comes to digitalization and data, I think it might as well be. Um, I'm a big fan of the successes that the Estonian government has made in e-governance, and I think the humanitarian system can learn a lot from that. We were talking about learning over lunch. Um, I think this is a good place to learn, and I'm glad to be here. I'm also glad um, that this panel is sandwiched by cash and localization, <laughs> and I, I would love to have that conversation with cash and, and localization uh, colleagues that, that are present here, maybe uh, at the end of this day or over, over drinks. But I think these um, two topics, are, or these three topics, are very much linked, and digitalization is not in itself like how it was uh, talked about cash this morning. It is not um, a thing in itself. It's a tool. Um, that um, humanitarians have embraced, and um, it is about time. <laughs> we are still, uh, we've come a long way, um, as you mentioned, Haiti, we've come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, it, it is no longer a question if data is important or if data is necessary to run a response effectively, um, but now it's really about how to do it, how to do it effectively, how to do it in a responsible way. We talk about data responsibility a lot the last two days. Um, how to do it also in a way that is inclusive um, and um, that takes into account all the challenges that are um, not limited to, um, to digitalization, but really that we see across all um, aspects of our work as humanitarians. Um, yeah, I, I am today representing the Norwegian Refugee Council, but as <laughs> Karen just mentioned, I just started this week. Um, NRC is very uh, keen on um, and building capacity uh, globally to support our ongoing operations in the field. Um, it is, um, my team is pretty uh, fresh and uh, we are uh, slowly moving from supporting head office to really supporting the, the activities in the field and also working on partnerships with you guys and uh, with any one of you who's interested. Um, so yeah, but before that I worked with multiple organizations working on these topics that I'm happy to discuss with you today. Great. Thank you so much. So let's get going. With I have a number of questions uh, on topics that you guys have all um, already mentioned. I want to go back to the complicated question Luke asked from Juliet during the, the opening panel on this question about ecosystems. And Luke's question was on humanitarian ecosystems. I'm going to bring it back to you on what does this idea of data ecosystem mean for you? We talk quite a lot about the sector, about data sharing, the importance of data collaboration. Um, but this idea of data ecosystem and ecosystems that in general, as Juliet also said, they're kind of fuzzy, right? We, we kind of throw these words around, all of us think about it differently. And I, wanna, and I really want to take advantage of the fact that you guys are all working on various layers of so-called the systems. So Zinab, I wanted to start from you and really focus, zoom in on this organizational level, uh, humanitarian organization level data ecosystem hmm. that you believe should be in place to say we are doing data well. Well, ecosystem is a big word. <laughs> I think I could talk more of uh, lack of ecosystem <laughs> as such. Um, I think, uh, like all of us uh, have, maybe not all of us, some of us in some organizations ca came from the IT departments of organizations or have to work together with IT departments that are 
um, have been historically dealing with data, uh, but uh, business data as such. Um, and then it is still a struggle now, 10 years in, to figure out how to uh, use those um, tools or also skill sets that are already existing within the organization to support programs. Um, I think we're not there. I am not. Sh I don't think NRC is there yet. We are uh, planning to go there, mm -hmm. um, and then there are organizations that don't, um, where it's it's just uh, practically Im impossible because the ICT capacities are are only uh, able to cover the needs, uh, the business needs of the organization. So it is a bit of, um, I think, from an organizational perspective, um, an organization development question that I cannot answer as a, an IT professional. But I think um, in, you've mentioned systems, you've mentioned systems yeah, yeah. In, in terms of <coughs> humanitarian initiatives. There are some systems that I think are worth supporting and are worth adopting across uh, all organizations. And um, we talked about this also a lot. How can we not reinvent the wheel, use what's there, work on partnerships and I leave it. I, I'm, I'm sure Javier, you've got a lot of experience with how uh, HDX has been adopted um, or how Go has been adopted by different national societies. Um, so, yeah, I think Great. it's a big discussion. Yeah, but thank absolutely. you for Thanks, Ginez. Let's okay. move on to, let's, let's take the network approach next. Obviously, Luke, you have worked with Start Network, mm -hmm. now with a, with a network of actors within the IFC movement. What does data ecosystem mean to you? within that well, network. <coughs> this is partly why I was asking Juliet for, for <laughs> uh, earlier today for a, a good answer. Um, but yeah, um, for me, ecosystem, um, it's, uh, it, it reminds me of actually a, a book that I'm reading um, by somebody from the LNAP um, uh, group who now works with the British Red Cross, um, Ben Ramalingan, um, who talks about complex systems. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around it at the moment. But he, he, he mentions an interview he had with uh, uh, somebody who is trying to uh, uh, learn from biological systems, the so-called mm -hmm. biomimicry, to see whether um, uh, human systems can learn from nature, essentially. Um, and when yeah, they asked uh, this uh, expert in the field, what does the aid system look like? Um, he said, uh, slime mold. Um, which isn't a great um, uh, 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 like description uh, in one way, but if you think of how slime mold um, works, it's uh, you know it's it's diverse. It it's, it emerges where there is food available. Um, it has a way of uh, communicating um, and has redundancy. And so you know, in a way, you could see us as all uh, in in that frame frame of mind. Anyway. Um, to us, ecosystem um, and e syst like systems analysis um, is becoming more useful and, and more uh, used by um, our team to basically um, get away from the idea that we have linear uh, like uh, answers to linear problems, and 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 so. Um, when you're thinking about uh, a cash, uh, cash seems to be um, a, a magic bullet in some ways, but then you know, all the dynamics that happen as a result of introducing um, additional uh, money to a, a particular household um, to then understand all the impacts on the markets, the, the social dynamics, um, you really need to have this better understanding and not just a simplified view of the world. Um, so it, it, it behoves us actually to start thinking in this way, even if you know, honestly speaking, it's it's very difficult to um, to uh, wrap your head around all of the impacts that you're going to have in any humanitarian in intervention. Um, often, those unintended impacts are so important that we yeah. need to be looking at those things. Um, for us, um, you know, when we think about the the Go platform, it's a very it's a very linear process. And so we take it as the disaster management cycle. As I mentioned, you know, you can plan with the, the platform so you can understand, you know, where, where the capacities are. You can um, respond based on uh, in, uh, impact forecasts. So you're getting a kind of uh, linear way of looking at a humanitarian response. Um, but actually, um, you know, the way that uh, we can use the, the data that's uh, a part of that ecosystem is how we understand basically where there are different approaches um, that the national societies, this wonderful but beguiling uh, network of 191 different organizations, um, what they're doing and what we can learn from those 
um, is the value of the Secretariat, essentially, is to, to try to identify some of those adaptive um, approaches to uh, the crises that we all uh, increasingly are facing. You know, so it's not just in those traditional humanitarian contexts, but you know, increasingly in Europe and you know, are, are places that are, are not used to mm. um, responding as such. Mm. But finding what works um, in one context and then scaling that um, and in, you know, making sure that it's available um, for the n other uh, Red Cross and Red Crossants um, across the world. Mm. So that's, that's how I starting to understand what we mean by uh, ecosystem in this context. Great, thanks Luke. And now lifting the ecosystem idea to this yeah. global <coughs> humanitarian partnerships and sure. partnerships ecosystem. Javier, how do you see data ecosystems? Yeah, maybe, maybe I take the, the audience to 10 years back, maybe even before, like in the, the beginning of the year 2000, and, and that was actually the, the reason why we came up with the idea of XCX. Before in the past, when humanitarians were looking for simple data sets like the boundaries of a country, the population figures, the location of health facilities, education facilities, they, they will need to send an email to the people in the, in, the, in the country, and you will need even to know somebody. You know, like, hey, Luke, do you have the boundaries for Somalia? Okay, here they are, and it was an exchange of emails. Then Luke, because in our sector, the, the turnover rate is very high, next, next, next time was a crisis, you will email to Luke, and Luke is gone. He's now in Iraq. Like, hey, Luke, do you have the boundaries? Oh, no. So it was a lot of like, a missing opportunity. So we came up with that idea of creating a single platform where humanitarians could come and find those baseline data sets that you need for a humanitarian response, data about the people affected, and, but also data sets about the response. So that was kind of the inception idea of XEX. And in 2014, we started convincing a handful of organizations to share the data on the platform. So we started with a few hundred data sets and three, four organizations that they believe in the, in the idea, and they start sharing data on, on the platform. Mm -hmm. Now, after 10 years, because next year we're turning 10 years, we have a little more than 21,000 data sets and contributed by more than 300 organizations. And I, we really see, and maybe I, I debate with what you said, I think, uh, there is an ecosystem there, and I think XDX is an anchor of the data ecosystem. And we see more and more uh, people trying to join this community. Yes, there is also a lot of proliferation of new data platforms. So everybody now is developing their own, their own portal where you can go and access the data. But also there is an opportunity, and I think the opportunity for XDX for the years to come is to create no, an API of APIs. I don't know if I'm using too much acronyms, but it's just to connect computers one to another, but also to be able to increase the interoperability of data. You know, so that I think there is an opportunity there, and for that we are working on a on a new project that will come uh, soon to the to the light. It's called Happy, H A P I. It's going to be happy, but it stands by the humanitarian API. So we want to create uh, a way where users could connect to that happy machine and being able to do better, better analysis, better um, develop what you said, Luke, uh, do analysis based on evidence and be more consistent with the, with the work that we do. So that is coming, but I, I see the ecosystem there, of course, with some gaps, you know, if you come to XEX, in case you haven't been there, uh, there's a lot of very important data, but also there are some data gaps and that those data gaps that we haven't been able to identify which organization could provide that data, but also data that is difficult to access. You know, we are not in the sector where data is so just hanging there. We have accessibility constraints, <coughs> budget constraints, private issues constraints, a lot of, of those, those aspects. But, uh, but I think XCX is the humanitarian data exchange platform is, is strong on that and building on that trust among partners, mm -hmm. but also building this data ecosystem, that, with caveats, of course, yeah. but uh, we are there. Great, so now we've answered that question um, and demystified what this data ecosystem could mean. How does development data fit with the humanitarian data and the ecosystem as baseline? Uh, there is this, often we consider this whole other word out, world out there, these development people. Um, how, in your uh, experiences, how well and how, where is the interaction point between development data and humanitarian data? Who wants to go first? 
Uh, yeah, I can. Um, I mean, the, the kind of uh, the, the situation of the Red Cross Red Crescent is we're before we're there before, during, and after. Mm. Um, the, m most of the organisations have been around for over 100 years, um, and so you know they're they're there when the, the grey there's grey skies and uh, when there's blue, and so you know we work um, to kind of. Uh, develop the, the, their capacities and develop their uh, accessibility to the data that they can mm -hmm. use for better evidence-based programming, um, even before an emergency, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and yeah, when we're talking about um, development data, we're talking about the, the contextual information of that country. Um, and there are you know, core sources, which um, you, know, you often uh, want to find them on uh, H HDX. And you know, as long as that uh, organization or government um, fulfills their uh, responsibilities, um, then you, that's, that's how we look at what we call secondary data. Mm -hmm. um, so not the information that we're uh, collecting ourselves, but um, the information that is out there to help us to just be, you know, better understand the context and better target limited resources, basically. Um, and so, yeah, it's, there's, mm -hmm. there's no, in our, in our sense, there isn't really a division mm -hmm. between the two. Um, of course, there's different uh, types of information that are collected in an emergency um, and different and different tolerance for the quality of that as well, because um, mm -hmm. we've mentioned this idea of good enough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's fair when um, time is of the essence. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of information um, that uh, we pull in quite quickly now. So it's not as um, Javier was mentioning, um, the same as it used to be where it was um, beer or Wi-Fi, which would <laughs> attract enough people to, to be able to get that USB stick of data. Exactly. Um, but now we have here, yeah, um, we'll talk about APIs again and again. So probably, you know, it basically the, the pipes between different systems. And if there is an organization that doesn't have an API that's sharing their data, then um, the they, they should be, they're not part of the ecosystem and they're not part, or at least they're not a visible part of the mm. ecosystem mm. because they're not sharing the information that they're collecting, um, which ultimately is probably um, you know, information not about themselves as an organization, but about people and, so, and, pe and the situation at large. So, mm. so that's um, fundamentally one of the kind of um, sine qua non, the, the, the minimum um, uh, responsibility is to, to share the data that we have. Great. Yeah, if I may add to that, I, I think the development data goes in this realm of data preparedness that we all talk about, but um, no one's doing it properly because it suffers from the same issues as like preparedness action in general. Um, that there is no funding for preparedness, so you have to somehow do it uh, data preparedness after disaster. And I think in the case of um, disasters that are exacerbated by climate change, we know that a disaster will happen again. So um, this data that we've gathered while we are there, we should somehow also keep it in a way that it could be useful in the next disaster. But it, there is a lack of, um, of uh, data preparedness also requires that someone is on the ground <coughs> to be able to talk to government agencies or academ academia in the country or um, that would have that type of data that we don't necessarily uh, find easily as humanitarians. Um, I know that there are also uh, some databases by, from the World Bank or um, other organizations globally that, that also keep a lot of data, don't necessarily share it. Um, so I, I think it is these efforts of data preparedness that need to be put in place, but it's just not happening because of lack of funding again. Mm. If I can add to, to that point, um, on XDX, I mean, we define humanitarian data in the context of XDX as data that is used for the context of the, of the crisis. So in that, in that aspect, we have a lot of data, especially from the World Bank on development, and we use it to also provide the humanitarians the baseline of, of the information. Mm -hmm. Also, we define humanitarian data, data about the, the humanitarian needs, people affected, people rich, a uh, number of IDPs, refugees, and so on, and, and, and data about the response. So when we started XDX, we learned a lot from the World Bank. I mean, they were the first one to have a, this open data platform. And we, if you come to the platform, I think there are like approximately 4,000 data sets about development from the, from the World Bank. And we, uh, we see that humanitarians are using that data also in their analysis. When it was the COVID-19, um, pandemic, we also developed a data explorer where you could find data from different um, areas related to the COVID pandemic. And 
we were also adding some reports that how the pandemic will be affecting development, but also how will be the humanitarian response. So I think, I mean, we live together it's like a marriage. It's like you have to live with that. And, um, and what we're trying to do is just to make it more accessible. I mean, as you said, sometimes it's not easy to, to have access to those data sets, but at least on, 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 on the platform, we managed to have a few, few organizations mm -hmm. and on the area of development that are sharing those data sets on the platform. Great. I want to uh, ask a little bit about what Zinab also mentioned is the importance of actors on the ground um, in terms of validating, verifying data. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about needs assessment. So this is a quote from the Grand Bargain Signatories that says, Grand Bargain Signatories require needs assessments that are impartial, unbiased, context sensitive, timely, up to date. That is a lot of boxes to tick in a humanitarian sector that is, in terms of actors, incredibly diverse. We are working and relying a lot on data from government, government agencies that perhaps don't always share the same types of values as us, same with the private sector. So with this mixture of actors with various, um, let's say, values, uh, mm -hmm. viewpoints, how do we make sure that our needs assessments, in fact, are impartial, unbiased, context-specific? Um, what is the process there? Red Cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy, happy to take that one. <clears throat> um, I mean, needs, needs assessments are, let's, let's be frank, not um, done as often or as well as um, we'd like in almost every context. Mm. Um, that's the sad fact of it. It's, um, you know, a, is it a problem of demand? Is it a problem of supply? I'm not sure, but, um, you know, we, we make um, decisions on allocation of funding um, mm. with l less evidence than I would like. Um, and the decision-making system itself that we can discuss in another, an, uh, um, another time, but also, yeah, um, that, Essentially, needs assessments are there for us to better understand um, who is, needs what kinds of assistance um, at, that, at that particular moment. And um, yeah, we um, do have um, all of those processes in place and you know, it's common to all of our organizations. One of the um, things that I think is both a frustration currently and an opportunity um, is for us to mutualize our intelligence, essentially. Um, so um, you'll know about um, a, pl a platform called Deep, um, which um, yeah, I think you introduced in the, in the opening remarks, um, which helps us to use um, secondary data, so the information from other um, uh, uh, organizations, processed through a kind of analytical form framework, so that we have all this access to the same um, uh, information, so that we can use it for our own analysis, um, but that we're able to identify based on uh, something of interest, a geography or uh, a particular target, a uh, particular part of the humanitarian profile, we can find that information more easily so that we can under understand it better. So that's, that's a great tool, but in order to get there, we need more needs assessments. And actually, um, we, we all more or less use the same kinds of approaches. Um, I think, um, yeah, needs assessments often are um, uh, with the government, if there's uh, a, a disaster law, and the Red Cross is often written into that um, disaster law to be the, the organization which um, collects that information. And so there's a, often a standard um, uh, inf uh, questionnaire. Unfortunately, I mean, I, you know, a recent example in Mozambique was, um, you know, quite typical of uh, the fact that there, was, there is a standard somewhere but was it the V2 or V2 final? Um, that was the, or was it the V2-3 final? Or, you know, and um, as you've then digitized using, um, we use Kobo, which is one of the mm. you know, uh, big advances. Um, everyone uses mm. you know, mobile technology. I mean, going back to Alnap as well, um, uh, that's one of the great advances of uh, the last 10 years or so. Um, we're doing, you know, people, all, most organizations will now collect data in a structured way, which makes a, a, a big difference for, for analysis. It's not just, you know, 
driving around and, and gaining impressions from uh, focus group discussions and so on, which is valuable in itself, but is not very useful beyond that, uh, that individual analyst's um, uh, experience. And so, yeah, we, we do collect information in a more structured way um, using these uh, like standard forms, um, but I, I, f I think that we could do better um, to share the kinds of information that we're collecting. Um, but ultimately, um, so, so yeah, just to f finish that point, um, there are things like uh, survey design tools, um, mm -hmm. which we've developed in collaboration actually with uh, WFP in that, in that case. We could have done it ourselves, and actually the, did the but we instead we made the conscious choice to work with another organization to make sure that we're, we're working in, in a common way. And I think we honestly should be um, doing that more often and maybe incentivized to do so by donors or you know, whoever has, has power. And um, yeah, I'd probably finish by, uh, uh, I suppose, talking about um, what was mentioned in the last um, uh, panel about uh, data being power. Um, and uh, yeah, um, at, you know, um, obviously, this Spider-Man um, sticker is, is not just there because my daughter put it there, but um, <laughs> because um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, and the, and the the, the mm -hmm. that's what um, you know yeah. it reminds me reminds us all of, and the, the fact that actually you know data is we we see the collection of data by organisations as you know, something that gives us power, gives us intelligence that the other organization doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And actually, we need to be better about sharing um, that mm -hmm. information earlier um, and with um, more uh, humility, basically. Yeah. yeah. And can yeah, I, Zina, if I can yeah. just jump on what Luke mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned Deep. Uh, and <laughs> the reason um, why Deep was um, created also is um, basically to, to solve this problem of, of collaboration around needs assessment. Um, I think it it is very important to do assessments jointly, uh, not only for not uh, bothering the same household but with different organizations coming in at different days, but also to to have um, a more continuity of of understanding the needs and and a better uh, systematic approach to doing it. And I think Deep solves that problem with providing. Um, that's another ecosystem, yeah. <laughs> it's a system. Um, yeah, also having analytical frameworks that are agreed on before, that um, practitioners have sat around tables and discussed at length, sometimes at too much length. Um, mm. But uh, I, I think this this is a really good example of standardization and collaboration. Um, so mm. that's, I wanted to point that out again. And unless Javier very, can very briefly, yeah. yeah. If I may, I just want to maybe tackle that question from the data ethics perspective. Mm -hmm. And I see now with this in, um, joint analysis, I think there's more transparency of how we're collecting the data. And from the SDX perspective, now we are getting more humanitarian needs overview estimations broken down by gender, by levels of, mm -hmm. of people with disabilities, by uh, age groups, and that keeps like a, a better sense of w the people affected that we want to want to serve. But also, um, there is a lot of uh, information that organizations are, are, are sharing, whether the survey was a little bit uh, um, stopped because in certain areas there was uh, conflict and, and so on. So, you know, like uh, people are more uh, conscious about the ethics, data ethics elements when it comes to analysis. So I'm very happy to see that more often. Great, thank you. And we'll talk a little bit about data yep. responsibility also later. So we have slowly moved towards this topic of technology. And I wanted to put it off because oft, uh, in the beginning, because often we jump into this idea of technology, but really technology in the context of humanitarian data is an enabler. Mm -hmm. It's a tool, sure. you know, as you also said. Mm -hmm. So can you, and, and I mean artificial intelligence, obviously everybody wants to know how organizations are already tapping into it. Mm -hmm. But before we go into concrete use cases, when it comes to information management and data, when is technology a enabler and when does it distract us? Do you guys come across uh, moments in, in, in your work when you're like, oh, here we are again with a software or a tool. Can't we just grab this Excel or a paper and pen and, and just uh, try and interpret the data that we have? When, when, is a when is technology a distraction versus when is it an enabler? If I may, I mean, it's always a distraction. You know, we, yeah. as, as Juliet was saying, we love Chinese stuff, you know, like, oh, <laughs> this is fantastic, let's use it. But, you know, I, I see that it's harder 
not to use it, but to understand the implications, especially mm -hmm. on data responsibility. Like we are like, okay, let's use it, but then we bump into, oh, but what about what's gonna be? How we gonna share this data? We are gonna disclose the identity of the beneficiaries and, and this kind of stuff. So I think it's always distraction, but I see as well that is really also enabling a better response. So just speaking on from the XDX perspective. Mm -hmm. Just recently, with the Sudan onset crisis in Morocco, the earthquake, the floods in Libya, we got data from Google research. So they called me, they say, hey, we have amazing data set that you can use for the response that we use, that we develop using AI. So they took some satellite imageries from the area and they de developed these buildings footprints, you know, that we couldn't, we couldn't do. It is very difficult to do. The images are huge, uh, gigabyte hundreds of gigabytes, but they have the know-how, they have the data scientists. So they were able to develop this footprint that they can be used for humanitarian response, for the population planning, for vaccination, for many things, and they shared it on XCX. The issue was at some point is that that data set was super useful, but also we realized that the skills were not so much present on the community. They say like, oh, they call me, oh, now the users. Oh, that data set seems to be fantastic, but how should I use it? Mm. I'm like, well, <laughs> that is uh, something that you should know. So, um, <laughs> so Google then gave us some, some information how to use it, but I see like a, it's attractive, like the, uh, something shiny, people want to use it, but one is there, then the skills are not, not, not so present. But uh, I saw one case I want to share. Zina, is, is technology yeah. the shiny thing <laughs> that we don't? <laughs> well, th these are really good examples you're mentioning, Javier. Like the, the issue why it becomes a distraction is not because it is in itself a distraction for humanitarians, but because um, there is a lack of skill set. There is a big gap of skills mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the data scientists that you, in your team and, and the person on the ground distributing aid. Mm -hmm. So how do we bridge this gap of capacity and uh, what we call data literacy? And there is a lot of work, mm -hmm. really great uh, work done by uh, the Federation on this regard. But I think really this is um, the biggest challenge is how to adopt technology within organizations that it just becomes uh, second set, uh, like, uh, yeah, second nature. That mm -hmm. you don't have to discuss why we are at, we are using this tool or that tool. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just part of the business uh, as usual. Um, but you also mentioned Google, and you mentioned uh, so I, I don't know if it's time to talk about this no yet. <laughs> but uh, I think no, it's please. great. This is actually also a really good example of why human sharing shouldn't be the ones doing that kind of work that Google can do better. Uh, so we should really leverage partnerships with private sector, with big tech. But at the same time, <laughs> we, need, we need to be very careful um, how we involve these organizations in our work because um, it does um, put a huge risk on, on our um, uh, humanitarian principles. And these are things that we, I think we often um, uh, neglect because we go after shiny things <laughs> and then uh, discover later that, oh, that was actually not a great idea. Because there are people in, in this, uh, ac actually like uh, big tech also went through um, different phases of adaptation and, and uh, challenges also in regards to uh, data responsibility. Um, diversity wasn't really on their radar until recently. So these are things that we need to take into account when we use their tools. And these are things that we need to take into account even more when we are talking about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, the, the need for um, validation on the ground and, and the fact that data is biased um, mm -hmm. by nature. So. Luke, if you can also answer the question and mm -hmm. yeah, talk a little bit about how you guys at IFRC are using artificial intelligence like natural lang language processing techniques. And okay. Oh, so <coughs> we're getting on to yes. the, um, the big shiny uh, <laughs> elephant in the room, um, <laughs> chat GPT and um, that use um, of, of it for, for all kinds of like, generative um, uh, production of, of documents and, and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, just before I get there, um, for us, the use of, um, you know, data and technology is, it, it essentially, as, as I mentioned before, it's this, the title of, of, of the talk today is, is, is about how we inform decision makers, essentially. And so, um, you know, the recent um, uh, kinds of situations that we've seen in the Middle East and so on, 
there's there's often not a lot of data actually. Um, mm -hmm. It's really you're about it, it's more about trying to make sense, trying to um, look at different scenarios, different um, op response options, um, thinking about the the outliers um, and considering what we would do in in those in those contexts. And that's that's what our team you know uh, is responsible to do to then have the decision maker you know basically have have the have the full range of uh, of the potential. Um, uh, routes that a, 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 a humanitarian assistance might be provided, let's say. Um, but we did actually try to use ChatGPT um, to help with those scenarios. So we, you know, asked it essentially to produce something which would, um, you know, lighten or make make our uh, life a bit uh, easier or quicker. Um, but actually, it wasn't very good. Um, mm. And still, um, yeah, I think there is a risk that we use um, those tools um, to jump ahead um, of the actual cognitive process that we all need to go through. Because actually the, the scenario, the final document is often not as important as the, as the process of discussion to get mm -hmm. there. Um, but we are, yeah, seeing um, some applications of um, natural language processing and large language models, which are, I don't know how familiar the audience are with these um, new, th new th technologies, which are you know, somewhat old, but um, in a sense, they're, they're the same kinds of things that I, we studied, um, you know, uh, 10 years or, or so ago, um, but um, trained on much larger data sets. So large language models are trained essentially on everything that has been digitized on the internet. And so that's the reason why we can get such good returns um, uh, from our prompts these days, um, even if that's kind of only half understood even by those who are de uh, actually developing the, um, the, the models. They understand the, the, the equation, but not necessarily exactly how, how um, we're getting such good um, responses, which means that we do, we do introduce different types of risks. This idea of hallucination where um, chat GPT or um, large language models will produce um, what sounds accurate, but is accurately wrong. Um, and it's just invented mm. potentially um, figures and, and uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a fact which, which isn't, isn't actually a fact. Um, so we have to be very careful of those things. However, we are using um, um, large language models um, where we have collected um, this uh, over far 500 um, different operations, thousands of individual um, nuggets, snippets of, of learning, um, which um, we have a whole framework to, to tag what that learning, what it refers to essentially, whether it's a geography or a population or, or a type of um, response modality. Um, and, and then we have all this data, we have a dashboard not many people actually use the dashboard, and so um, we're using large language models to um, classify uh, uh, even more information to then synthesize it, so a, a short summary, um, because you know, we realize that uh, people don't really read very much, um, and so because we're used to scrolling these days, um, it needs to be very, very short and very uh, to the point in order to make any kind of impact in terms of um, improving practice. Um, and that's just in terms of improving like um, the, the, the practice that's already known rather than thinking a bit more broadly. Um, but yeah, mm. that's how we're using it. Yeah, Zineb, did you want to add anything to the AI discussion? Or um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you have to stop me at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, just to to um, to con uh, compliment on what you said, uh, Luke, on large language models, these are really one of the the best um, examples of what why it's uh, why AI is useful. Well, it's not useful for everything <laughs> we do, and um, it's. Uh, like with any other technology, technology is not always the solution to, to all problems. There are many problems that are very, very low tech, and we just go on, in with our big, on our high horses. But I think uh, the, basically data in the humanitarian system has been always scarce, and a lot of it is because we had for a long time everything on Word or um, Excel was already like a big uh, revolution um, and a lot of text-based data. So it is just uh, natural to think that now we need to use advances in technology to process that data and, and make sense out of it. And I think if we just use that, we already solved a lot of problems and saved uh, a lot of our colleagues a lot of time uh, processing high, uh, big files and, and um, PDF reports and, and these sort of things. 
Um, and we shouldn't go much further than that. I mean, there is also a lot of uh, really use, u useful use case for it in translation to like really bridge the gap between uh, practitioners uh, from headquarters or local levels, whatever you want to call it these days. So I, I think for these two use cases are for me are really great for, for um, uh, AI or uh, machine learning algorithms. And then there is the fact that we have, um, if we want to use satellite imagery, these are huge amounts of data and um, where uh, computer vision can be very useful and, and fast ways of processing images mm -hmm. is really useful. Uh, apart from that, I don't see much. I mean, we are doing a lot of uh, predictive analytics yeah. in, some, in, some, uh, in some areas, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we should not um, think that now is the time to, to go on predicting everything. Um, so I think um, you have probably some more to add to that. <laughs> but, yeah, have you, but I want to tie this <laughs> in. You can add, absolutely, but also to ensure we give time to our audience. Uh, absolutely. And, and would love to, you can absolutely tie in this idea of, of AI and, and how and what, what are the suitable use cases. But I also want to, to you, Javier, pose this question of data responsibility. And with, with the increased need for data sharing that we've talked about, all these da different data inflows, technologies such as artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. um, where do we stand with this idea of data ownership, uh, data responsibility in the humanitarian sector? You, from the principal's uh, perspective, and, and, and Luke and Zineb, you from the, from the application perspective, um, where are we today with humanitarian data ownership and responsibility? Sure. I mean, the center has been working a lot on developing these guidelines on data responsibility, like uh, really working in the Ukraine crisis, now in the, in the OPT crisis as well, these guidelines, like uh, even information sharing protocols, data and information sensitivity classification, and uh, data impact assessment and, and so on. And we see more and more adoption. It's still not as, as the level that we wanted to, to enable data sharing, but we see the community more aware of that. You know, at the beginning, like maybe a few years ago, we used to get a lot of sensitive data sets being stuffed to be shared on XDX. Now we see less and less. I mean, on, on XDX, every new data set that comes to the platform goes to a system of, of quality where we ensure that the data is not sensitive, the data comes with uh, enough uh, metadata that, it, that touches on who is the owner of this information, on the which, uh, Law, we can um, share this information. What is the source of the information? What is the time reference to the data it refers? And we see more and more um, accountability. Mm. Ownership, I would say, like, you know, m many of these surveys, I, I always insist, belongs to the people affected. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say, it's, I would say it's public domain, but we do, we do need to make sure that the, that the anonymous, anonymization is in place in case it's a sensitive data set. And people should know this classification that, that we go. And of course, that classification depends on, on the context. So for instance, on XDX, we have a lot of data sets related to health facilities. So it may not be sensitive in the case of Colombia, so you can go to XCX and find all the health facilities in Colombia, but it's not gonna be the same in Ukraine, for example. Those, that data set of the location of education and health facilities in Ukraine is sensitive enough, so you won't find it on, on the platform. So we see more, more uh, trusted data sharing and, and more, uh, kind of like a passing the ownership to the, to the community is what I see more often. Thanks, Javier. Luke, do you want to add? Something? Yeah, just really quickly, because I do want to yeah. Yeah, keep, the, keep the time for the questions. Just on uh, pick up, picking up this point about accountability. So um, we have this approach in the Red Cross Crescent called the Community Engagement and Accountability, which talks a little bit to the AAP, the account mm -hmm. accountability to affected populations. Mm -hmm. And uh, often the Red Cross, because it's, Present in that you know the, the, the volunteers are from the communities that are affected. They're often the trusted 
actor. And so often I'm in that position to, to be collecting uh, feedback around the humanitarian response on behalf of the whole system, basically. Um, and that's more and more the case with um, uh, the uh, pandemic. There was a, a kind of a partnership between UNICEF and IFRC to create a collective service, which is a, which is a great a kind of uh, initiative to essentially, rather than every organization asking again um, some feedback on their, their intervention to have some form of collective ownership um, amongst the humanitarian sector at least um, to uh, not just collect that information but use it and follow through. Now the use and the follow through is still I think lacking if I'm, if I'm being completely honest in, um, in many cases um, uh, but it, it very much helps for us to hear that uh, community perspective in terms of what their preferences are. Do they prefer cash or do they actually prefer well, some other um, uh, form of assistance, um, mm. and so you know that's that's increasingly an important um, you know, data um, that we sh should be using for uh, uh, designing our programs. So, mm -hmm. uh, Great. Nick, do you want to add? Uh, just to quickly add on that, um, I think data responsibility is very important. To have policies is important, but I, I really believe that it's time to move from just having poli uh, policies and uh, standards to how can we operationalize this uh, in a technology level. I think in the lack of a suitable technology to protect data, we are just uh, producing more and more documents and guidelines that no one's going to use because they're just not operational. So mm -hmm. I think here again, it would be uh, great to learn from how the Estonian government does it with e-governance. So you mentioned something like... Once only. Uh, huh? <laughs> Once only Once principle. only, exactly. <laughs> that, that is a great principle. Yeah. Why should um, a person who's already suffering from displacement or uh, they've just lost the members of their family mm -hmm. have to talk to many of us mm -hmm. and tell uh, the, the story again and again? And there was also something that was mentioned this morning that we, uh, we over um, uh, collect information just in case. These are things that we should uh, really also hold uh, organizations uh, accountable to the fact that they are over, mm -hmm. um, over uh, mm -hmm. collecting. There's also the issue, um, and I think especially in cash, that uh, we often use um, third party uh, companies on the ground because of safety reasons or mm -hmm. to reduce the risk, we just hire a company that would uh, collect the data. And I've seen some really horrible stuff that mm -hmm. is done by these companies. So mm -hmm. it's really in lack of uh, systems um, that are enabled by technology, uh, we're just uh, doing harm mm -hmm. <laughs> with collecting data. And yeah. this, I mean, this is, I think, um, partly why we all wanted to come to Estonia is <laughs> to learn a little bit more about, the, is it E-Road? X-Road. X X oh, that's a shame. <laughs> um, we could rebrand it because we don't want to be associated necessarily yeah. with X. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so n um, for, for us to learn, because but, you know, should there not be some mm. form of X-Road for the humanitarian mm. system? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you know, something that the Estonian uh, uh, tech uh, community um, could help us to, to think about anyway. Great. And I have one more question before I open it up for, sorry, I couldn't help it because I think you did po uh, raise an important point, Zinep, which is one of the, I guess one of the key criticisms of the humanitarian data approach. Are we extractive? Are we over, con like, Populations are struggling with what they call these days assessment fatigue. Mm -hmm. Do we continue to extract information, extract information? You mentioned, Xavier, local communities are the owners of the data, yet we, we, we keep trying to pull more and ask for more and ask for more. Are we extractive? I guess it also goes into the localization mm -hmm. uh, agenda afterwards, right? Are we extracting or are we empowering somehow local actors, but also locally led action, local communities? Yeah. through data collection, and can, can that even be done? Can data collection be an empowering experience for local actors and, and local communities? I think, we are, I mean, we are trying, I think we are failing, because I, I've seen many surveys with a lot of information being collected, and only the, the statistic that is derived is just a summation, mm -hmm. a number. So I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunities there, but, uh, but also it's true that our sector is lacking a bit of interoperability. You know, everybody defines their own variables, everybody defines their own context. So lacking this interoperability among organizations, sometimes that makes us mm. 
not to us, but to some organizations, to recollect data and create this survey fatigue. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you said, I mean, it's incredible. And I was just talking to our colleagues in, in, in uh, West Bank that uh, they are supporting the, the escalation of, of hostilities that they say, we can, we can go and ask them what are your needs when they have the house destroyed and, yeah. and they lost family members and so on. So, but also the lack of uh, in, insensitive uh, environments like, like that one, is, is, is the data sharing doesn't flow as easy as we wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think they still we're making that mistake of uh, asking the same question over and over, over and over. But uh, I hope with the technology, with the, um, as, as you were saying in the previous question, a lot, the, a lot of private organizations are using satellite imagery to also derive data from secondary sources. So avoiding this going to ask to a family what happened. So Meta is sharing data on XDX, and they have been sharing also a lot of information based on, it's not about your Facebook accounts, no, no, mm -hmm. no way. It's, it's about satellite imagery that they process mm -hmm. and they, they share it. Also, World Pop is doing a lot of AI mm -hmm. to extract information from, from the space, no, I mean, from satellites, so they can derive this information. As I said before, so Google, Google research as well. So that, I think technology could help us to avoid this duplication. Mm -hmm. And then if you add interoperability, and data sharing, that is always my, my flag. It's please share your data on the platform. I think we will save time, cost, benefit, impact, and, and so on. Luke. Uh, extraction um, and uh, data being not just power, but value. Um, and you know, you're making me think of uh, Marxist critique rather <laughs> than uh, humanitarian panel. So um, I'll probably reserve that for um, later but um, and, and try to think of something a bit more uh, positive in terms of you know th there are some um, like instances of uh, particularly commonly owned data sets mm -hmm. which are quite empowering so OpenStreetMap yes. as you say I am a big fan of uh, yeah, totally. mapping things in general and OpenStreetMap mm -hmm. is one of the great yeah. examples of um, uh, of a collective approach to solving a, uh, a problem um, which um, through engaging with people um, through uh, you know basically putting their community or their service or the lack of it um, onto a map mm. can be very empowering um, and there's great examples in uh, the Kibera um, uh, slum in, in, in uh, Na uh, Nairobi and <clears throat> and in many other places that I could um, uh, describe where and you know, the Red Cross uses that whole process um, as uh, part of the vulnerability and capacity mapping with mm -hmm. communities, um, where they can once they see the you know the the the, the, the capacities that they do have, then it, it and the the um, uh, different different uh, inequalities maybe um, within the community, um, then it is quite a uh, a powerful uh, process for for people to okay. go through. So, okay. yeah, there are there are positives. What do you think? Um, are we extracting? <laughs> I, I think we should be. Uh, I, I mean, I want to share one uh, story uh, from um, a visit to a Venezuelan refugee camp um, or displacement uh, camp in um, Colombia. Um, the organization I was working for was developing a really super sophisticated uh, mapping uh, solutions using drones, using satellite imagery for uh, mapping these uh, different, uh, um, I, I mean, they're not camps, uh, refugee camps, but they are developing very quickly and they are often in areas that are hard to reach. And the mapping exercise is supposed to support the, the communities themselves, uh, but sometimes the uh, the, the objectives get lost uh, in the way, and we are making nice tools, uh, great visualizations or maps or solutions that are only serving at some high level that isn't really practical on the ground. But just to go back to that story, um, when we reach there, um, we, of course, like most communities, they're led by women, and, um, and then was this woman who was showing us around, and then she took us to a tent uh, that is kind of their office, and showed us this super sophisticated map she's made herself, um, ma mapping all the different uh, like water um, uh, stagnation areas, or uh, also like risky zones where people could get help, and she drew this all by hand, and it had like they were really great. Uh, information products, 
that uh, she made herself, she made use, useful for the community, but we are not making use of that. We're not, uh, I mean, it's probably not super useful to us, but I think it mm -hmm. should be. Uh, instead of us coming up with great solutions, sometimes we really should just uh, talk to the communities and see what they have. And I think um, the example of the Red Cross working through volunteers is really a great example of how this can be done or how this could be uh, really scaled up. Um, but yeah, we have to go back to the volunteerism uh, uh, mindset again, <laughs> which yeah. the, the aid system is coming further and yeah. further from. Um, yeah, so I, I think it is about really, um, yeah, kind of also thinking about decolonizing aid. Uh, it's not just us coming with the solutions, it's just us uh, sitting in, in, in Europe and, um, and thinking this is the way it should be done. Sometimes people on the ground have already surpassed us by their solutions. So data is not just power, but also empowering. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, move. Hi, Konstantin uh, from NORCAP. Uh, I've got a question about uh, partnership with big tech. Uh, if you can give some more reflections about what kind of compromises we're expected to uh, go through to access this kind of, this kind of uh, support. Yes. Okay, thank you. So who wants to take this? Uh, we taking three before? Let's take two, three at a time. All right. So first question on uh, private partnerships, uh, private sector engagement in data, and especially big tech. Uh, we'll take another question from there. Thank you. Christina, I'm from eGovernance Academy. We are an Estonian foundation that supports different governments around the world um, on increasing their prosperity and openness through digital transformation. And uh, my question to you is about what, um, what is your experience or opinion about the role of different governments when you are actually working on the data in, in respective countries? Because not a single time did I hear um, a comment about cooperating um, with, um, with the government uh, in question in the recipient countries. And uh, they are usually the lawmakers or the gatekeepers or the openers when it comes to collecting data and using data about the population. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Ero, I think you were third. And then we'll take, we'll answer these and then we'll take the next. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for the panel. Really exciting. Um, but one of the things you, we, you discussed, and I completely agree, is the uh, kind of the, the over extraction of data and uh, as we mentioned in the cash panel as well we ju sometimes just tend to to gather data uh, just for the sake of maybe we will <laughs> make use of it later on um, could you also maybe then extend this into the deletion of data and uh, and when is uh, humanitarian data then also deleted so mm -hmm. that we not only gather, 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 but from the other end, we, we start also, uh, you know, not just archiving and actually keeping it, but then actually beneficial data being um, deleted. deleted as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We'll take three at a time. So who wants to tackle the issue of, an, or not only issue, opportunity of big tech in humanitarian data? Have you? Maybe I can go ahead. give uh, the, first, the first pass. So uh, we see private organizations collecting and disseminating more information than, than before. So as I was mentioning before, uh, some private uh, organizations are sharing data on the platform. And, and one of the, oh, in, within the Center for Humanitarian Data I was mentioning before, we have a, a data science team. So we're trying to, th that team is trying to develop uh, using advanced statistics, advanced um, analysis to anticipate the impact of a crisis. So they develop models based on uh, climate data to be able to say in case there is a flood in, in this part of the world, we can anticipate what will be the impact on vulnerable communities. The, the, the problem is that a lot of this climate data is coming from uh, big companies that they are not sharing necessarily. So there's a lot of uh, information about forecasts, and, and that is very, it's for sale. You don't, you, mm -hmm. they don't share it publicly on, X, on XCX, and we have a lot of gaps on that. So even on XCX, we have one category that we have been 
uh, doing a lot of research to try to bring more climate data to the platform. So what kind of in what kind of hazards have been in the last years, and what has been the impact on, on communities. This data is not, not, not coming that, that, that often. So we're trying to, uh, to partner with these organizations, and Meta is sharing some, some climate data sets. Uh, uh, the team is also working with NASA, NOAA, and other, and other partners. But sometimes this data is, is so popular for insurance, so that's why they don't put it publicly on the platform. So I think that, that opportunity is growing, but since it may be also sensitive, is that it's been somehow locked on their uh, password or on their protection. Mm -hmm. So I see future on, on private um, um, partnerships. Um, Microsoft, they just reach out. They may have some needs assessments that they want to share on the platform. So we need to see before we put them on a public uh, domain, just making sure it's anonymized, it doesn't have any, any situation that could put uh, somebody on, on that. So I see more and more uh, companies, but uh, the, 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 the issue of sensitivity is, is very much present, so we want to just make sure we don't, we don't damage anybody. If I can, Luke, if I can add ahead. to that, yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, just like Javier and his team, we work um, a lot with um, Google, Microsoft, and Meta, actually. Um, and um, uh, often, of course, you've got to you rec recognize that they're private companies, and you know you have to meet them. Uh, and they're big organizations, so you meet a lot of different people in different product teams and so on um, to actually derive the um, the value out of out of that relationship. Um, but we're we're really looking at um, trying to use the data, the massive data that they have um, about uh, behaviors, about um, movements, about all of these aspects um, to help us to basically understand and model what, what might happen in the event of emergencies. And, and just to um, expand a little uh, on um, a project that we're um, uh, working on, which is a global crisis data bank. Mm -hmm. So we, basically we have a, uh, you know, you'd think by this point that we would have a globally recognized um, data set which um, covers all emergencies. We really don't. We have some uh, attempts at that, things like MDAT. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, national disaster loss um, accounting systems as well. But there's nothing that pulls all of that together. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, somebody from the Red Cross called Raoul Montandon tried to do this. So we've called this project Montandon in honor of um, his failed attempt. Um, hopefully we won't fail and, and honestly the only way we will be able to do this is um, to work with companies mm -hmm. which have the capacity but also the access to data mm -hmm. um, about where, where, what people do, what people um, want, what people are, are worried about. Um, they are, they, and they, they, they do have that. Um, they're reluctant to share it basically because of the risk that um, they expose how much they know about us. Yeah. I think that's the main, mm -hmm. that's the main risk as far as um, their concerns, reputational. So we understand that, but then um, you know, if we can uh, work with them, and we are, um, to, uh, to make them understand that it's in the, their interests and our interests um, for us to be you know, providing this support, um, that we can also do it using their, their platforms, um, I think that, that's, that's the way to... Um, because you know, when we talk about the humanitarian system and what's outside, that, they're a massive player in the ecosystem and will only grow because mm -hmm. um, delivery, even delivery of, uh, of assistance of, of um, goods, um, Amazon are interested in, okay. in, doing, in doing that. Uh, you know, and you know, they could dwarf WFP tomorrow if, the, if that's <laughs> what they decided to do. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. we need to uh, acknowledge that that's mm -hmm. um, something that we would need to engage with uh, using our values and experience mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to make sure that it um, yeah, works for, for uh, yeah. humanity, basically. Yeah. I, I want to just make sure we get as many questions as we can, but I'll take Eros' question maybe to you, Zineb, about this idea of deleting data uh, that we don't need. Um, Ero asked, you know, we talk a lot about collecting of data. Uh, what do we do with it if we no longer need it? Yeah. It's a very good question. Um, I, I think there are guidelines again, <laughs> uh, but how, how much they are applied is, uh, I, I don't think so much. Um, and this is where I think we need to build the, the deletion into the data uh, um, acquisition, uh, mm. kind of. So it, it isn't, um, it's also very difficult to delete data properly, <laughs> it's, as you, you know. Um, so 
if we even just stick to anonymizing the data, that, that would be great. But I think um, in the case of, of HDX, um, you're pushing a lot for uh, organizations to, to make data uh, anonymized or at least pseudonymized. Or, um, so deletion, I, I haven't seen much of it in, in my career. I don't know about you. If you do, do you ever delete data from HDX? Uh, no, 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 no. But we make sure. <laughs> but we make sure that doesn't reach XDX in the first place. So if the data is sensitive. We have a mechanism to just stop data before it's being published. But also, we we run an algorithm. It's called SDC Micro, which is mm -hmm. just a, it's just a, it's just a function that um, calculates the likelihood of mm -hmm. a person to be re-identified. Of course, we remove the the key variables like a name, last name. Uh, ethnicity and everything, but do you know that in some areas, if you know that that the, it was the the Boulangeri, the what they call the, the the guy from the bread store, and um, and he's from certain uh, demographic group, the provinces sometimes are so small that you know, oh, you are referring to this person, so you know, so this algorithm is called SDC Micro, developed by the World Bank, gives you the the probability of a person to be re-identified. So we run that, and if the threshold is greater than 3%, we don't put that data. So we avoid putting it on the first place. And, and just going back to the, to the um, documentation that you're saying and the guidelines, we do have a guideline for uh, how to manage data incidents, how, what you have to do, how you have to delete it in case it went through a public domain, what means to create a data incident, how can you prevent it, and who has to be notified if that happened. Like, you have to really go back to the person and say, oh, uh, no, we are sorry, but uh, this, this situation happened. And, and it's a lot of uh, nice templates that the center has been working on, as I said before, thanks to the DG Echo that they, they supported that. And for every every area, like for cash and voucher, for, uh, for different areas and the, in the humanitarian response. So really inviting you to take a look at those, because they're quite, quite practical. Thank you very much. And we'll take do this one question, one answer system as well. But we have one more question at the back about um, the processes that are ongoing now in the investments into digitalization government, digitalizing government systems, right? There's quite a lot of investment, quite a, a lot of momentum there. Does the humanitarian community tap into this uh, digital capability of governments? Who wants to be the one that goes for this question? <laughs> I, 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 mean, uh, I mean, I could quickly, uh, your question was really that we didn't mention governments in any of uh, our talks, yeah. and that's because we are not really talking much with government actors, unless the project is really uh, involving um, government actors, which sometimes it happens, but it, it isn't uh, by default... Um, I, I think our interlocutors on the ground are often uh, humanitarian organizations, uh, mainly, or NGOs, and uh, more and more governments, when they do have the, some data capacity, we start to have some interlocutors, like for example, in Iraq, and um, uh, with, uh, um, with some uh, work also in Jordan, we had uh, talks with governments, but it's true that mm. we could still do more there. Mm. Yeah, we do talk with governments, especially because in our search for providing baseline information, we talk to the Ministry of Education to have a, the lease of the location of education institutions. Also, we talk to the Ministry of Health to get the, the location of hospitals and clinic and emergency rooms. Uh, and, and, but we do have that, that interaction. Also, NSOs, National Statistical Offices, are often part of the XDX lineup of organizations. Uh, no, as many, as, as much as we wanted, because mm. uh, I, I don't know, like a data sharing not really like a mm. embedded on, in their soul. Mm. So it's, it's <laughs> difficult to, to convince them. But when we have been successful, those two ministries, education and health, has been very much forward sharing their information. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think the question is also about um, like the, uh, the reluctance of government to share information. And often in some countries, the, um, it's the business model yep. um, mm -hmm. uh, that they sh share that data only for, as a, uh, at cost. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult then if you come, a, uh, basically, uh, uh, you disrupt that dis business model for them. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take three more questions. There is... Uh, uh, Great, there is also one question online, so after this okay. question, I would take. 
concrete. So one question, one answer. Uh, hello. Hello. My name is Roland Efremov. I'm from the Estonian Rescue Board. I don't have so much of a question, but rather than an share an experience. Uh, you talked about the earthquakes of Haiti and Morocco. I would like to share uh, an experience related to the earthquake in Turkey. There that needs to be a question there. That let's make that a rule. There needs to be a question there, because there's a quite uh, a few people that want to ask something. Uh, so the main thing regarded in Turkey was that there was also an information platform that we used, that all the uh, responders used that were there. But uh, the main conclusion of it was that it was basically the, uh, how to say, the information necessary got lost very quickly because you have a lot of people that put constantly the inputs in. So safety related question, safety related information got lost, uh, the information regarding contacts got lost and so on and so forth. And so also this um, world realized that this platform in this disaster was basically ineffective in some high related areas and there they concluded basically that there has to has has to be like um, dividing of information like what is urgent and what is needed basically and also at the moment they're doing like discussions of how to make the platform better it's not like a question there but just as an experience as you speak about the data collecting but here is an experience that basically showed the other side of it that, in a way, they are not effective all the time. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that comment. We'll take a couple more. Um, one more from the audience and then one online. Let's do the online first yeah, because I'm here already. Yes, we have a question by Eero Osario <laughs> and the question goes, how to encourage the collaboration and sharing of learning and development materials and initiatives between humanitarian organizations. There's lots of duplication at the moment. Thank you very much. Big, big question. Um, we can have an entire conference on this, but we will we'll try to take this. And one more question. Choose anybody. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't want to make the decision. I mean, sure. We Why also then? have half an hour break after that, so if we go over okay. a few minutes, it's sure. fine. Happy with us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I will try to be quick. Um, so how we all, the organization who are making like this data collection to know how to help people, how we can overcome the bias of a future uh, respondents can have because like sometimes we are really very extractive. We are trying to dip the information which they don't want to share but we need to know it, to know how to help them. So how we can overcome this general bias like to help yeah. people understand why we're digging so deep. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in case there is a reaction to the first comment, uh, if anyone wants to react. And then the second question is around overall, how do we do reduce duplication? How do we share not only data, but how we do things within organizations? Um, and then a question about data bias and how can we, how can we prevent this uh, from, from, who wants to take which one? I can take the, oh, sorry. No. How it's the no, it's great. No, no. I, I think I would uh, take the, the the question about the sharing of yeah. uh, expertise, I guess, I, I, mm -hmm. as much as I understood, or sharing of, um, yeah, uh, sharing in general mm. is a, t a tricky uh, one. Um, I think that the issue that we see with information management or call it data or digitalization, that it's still pretty much siloed within the organizations themselves and then within the, the system. Of course, there are some collaborations and that's great. Um, there are some partnerships, but uh, oftentimes, at least from my experience, it has been because there were individuals interested in, in working together rather than institutionalized partnership around data and digitalization. Um, there is also, um, unfortunately, a lot of competition there or uh, somehow, uh, Organizations are being territorial about data, uh, as you may um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. expect them to be, uh, since data is power. Uh, so this is, these are the, the, the challenges I see that are really um, uh, are big blockage, blockage to sharing and to learning from each other, um, to working towards unified systems, again systems. 
Um, so it is it is a challenge, and um, yeah, ha happy to hear your <laughs> yeah. comments on it. I don't know if you want me to to add on sure, that one or that. to. Um, I want to take also the one on the on the bias. So on the on the knowledge sharing, I think um, the the Center for Humanitarian Data is also working a lot on on developing models to anticipate crisis, and they're trying to also uh, share those models with different organizations. Like, say, oh, I developed this model. What have you shared? What is the methodology that you you use? What are the caveats and so on? And I see a lot of uh, sharing on that, and especially on modeling. You know, like, as, as we know, and going back to 1976, when George Box said that all models are wrong, but some are useful, um, you know, nobody will be so precise. So as long as you share what's the accuracy of your model, what inputs you use to build that model, I think we will be growing as a, as a, as a community. And I was in a, no, in a, in a, yeah, I was in a panel when I was attending, and they were presenting their models. Like, oh, I, I, I can predict with this, um, uh, as, as fast as today's, the impact of a flood or the impact of a hurricane. And I asked a question, like, okay, what, what is the accuracy of that model? Like, mm. yeah, it's nice that you can develop it. And it's going back to this shiny attraction, like, oh, that model, and sounds so so sexy to, to say that. And, and I was only one organization, and it was actually um, uh, from, from Luke's team, that the, 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 the data scientists say, yeah, this model has an accuracy of 70%, which is like a very honest and transparent, you know? So as long as we have this transparency, uh, I think that the knowledge will be better transmitted. And just going on the bias question, uh, my, my background is in statistics, so since I was a child, no, since I started <laughs> working on this, metadata has been always present on, 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 on me. And when we develop XDX, we decide that every data set that comes to the platform has to have the minimum elements of metadata. You know, for people to understand and to reuse the data so they know what is the source of this information, what's the methodology that they use. Maybe they couldn't access certain areas, so they should have, they, they need to put that on the caveats and comments, what is the date of the, to which the data refers and so on. And we do have a lot of, not training, because it's just a, it's a piece of cake, it's just a matter of make people conscious that when they share data, they have to provide these elements of metadata for us to be able to use it for analysis, for the community to be able to, to use it for analysis. And many people, sometimes I knock doors, because part of my job is to knock doors and say, hey, you want to share data with, with XCX? And they're like, oh, yeah, but I didn't know I could do that. So say, yeah, 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 welcome to the world of data sharing. But sometimes they don't, they don't have that embedded. You know, like they say, oh, I will collect it, that, and I will just use it for my uh, uh, program, and. And, and you skip it, you know. Still, there are so many data sets on the, on the hard drive of many computers that we just, just die to have them on the platform. So just metadata, I would say, is very important for data sharing. Luke, you wanted to touch upon the bias. Thank you, Javier. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, just quickly on the learning, because um, I mean that question was asked by somebody in my team. Uh, um, so <laughs> I, I should probably uh, yeah, just, just one one uh, just to build on the transparency aspect. And thanks for mentioning Paula's uh, work. But mm -hmm. um, uh, the, some of the most powerful initiatives that I've been involved in have um, been the ones which are interagency. So uh, Inform is a great example of mm. um, uh, organizations coming together around a common need for some kind of um, you know, uh, analysis of structural risk, um, using a, developing a common framework, and then mm. developing a common product that pretty much everybody uses now. Mm. Uh, that it's, and that was from a donors, um, organizations, and uh, an academic. And um, Deep is a similar um, uh, ex experience. Uh, Kobo, um, whilst you know the development is a few a fewer um, organisations, it's kind of a, those those common goods, those common public goods, are the things that we really should be pushing towards. I mean, it's really interesting just having the conversation after. Um, uh, the cash uh, mm -hmm. panel um, to reflect on um, whether there should be actually a, a push towards a common cash system, mm -hmm. not owned by one mm -hmm. organisation, um, perhaps you know even inspired a little bit by the, the Estonian uh, gov <laughs> governance. Just to mention that again, um, uh, but yeah, the, it's, it's clear because lots of different organisations are building their own ca uh, cash system. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there are, there are open source, uh, we use Espo CRM, and so building upon what already exists um, together, I think, uh, would be a, a, a powerful thing that we should, we should be looking at. But on bias, yeah, I'm interested um, in uh, the way that that affects decision making um, predomin uh, predominantly. Um, and, you know, it, basically you, you see that in the variable um, decisions that are made by doctors, for example. If, if, if before lunch um, you have a, uh, uh, a, you see a doctor and he's hungry um, on, and she, she then gives you uh, a different uh, diagnosis as she would um, after lunch. Um, and if, you know, there, there are so many, I mean, <laughs> you know, dozens of different I impacts on the way that humans um, you know, process information and give, mm -hmm. uh, and give judgment, um, even if it's their profession. And so we, we can't really um, uh, change that. We just need to be very aware of it mm -hmm. um, and build systems which, um, as much as possible, um, create collective um, uh, intelligence, correct collective um, decision making, rather than allowing individuals um, mm -hmm. who um, yeah, would maybe give a completely different um, answer um, uh, the next day uh, to be the ones who are, uh, are solely in charge of um, like really uh, important decisions like where, where and who um, gets humanitarian aid, mm -hmm. for example. Thanks, thanks very much. I know we're six minutes over, but I thought if there's one more really burning question that somebody definitely wants to ask. Everyone is eager for coffee. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm not even going to spend time on trying to conclude on this or summarize this topic, aside from the fact that I do like what you look said in the end, that we should thrive to have these more, when it comes to technology and data, these digital public goods for the humanitarian sector that um, kind of eliminates these boundaries of who, which organization has more resources, who has more know-how, and really create these, these sharing and collaborative networks and, and platforms to, to not only share and analyze data, but also discuss uh, the, the challenges uh, that we face as humanitarians with information man management and data. So thank you, everyone, for your engaging questions, and thank you to you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We will start with the last panel at 2.30. So you have 20, 25 minutes.
Hello, hello. It's time to start with our last panel of today. So please grab your coffee or the water, anything you feel like, and uh, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> Please make your way to your seat. And you, have, you will have plenty of time to talk to each other after the panel as well, I promise. All right, last but not least uh, of our today's panels, uh, we will focus on localization. And this is led by Helen Kaljolate from Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has been active more or less 20 years, maybe even more, uh, in the sector, uh, also including uh, being part of Estonian's UN Secu Security Council and uh, protecting the rights of women, peace and security, representing both Estonia and uh, Europe uh, in different occasions. And after the panel, we will watch the video, uh, so don't run away straight away. Uh, but now, Helen, I would like to invite you here, together with the panelists. Enjoy. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is the panel where is focused on localization, but it's also the panel where your chair feels the hardest. I assure you this is just an illusion, it will get better. We try to fight this, this, uh, this perception. So thank you for coming and continuing our discussions. Uh, my name is uh, Helen, uh, and our focus is on localization, which was referred to a number of times over today. Uh, I know localization is a bit of a buzzword. Um, the question has been raised also today already whether it's actually happening. So there were tough, uh, tough questions about it already before we get to our discussion. So I think what is good also about our panel is that we have here people who represent different perspectives. We have uh, somebody who's from among civil society and, and also colleagues who are from among donors, donors from the ground, uh, donors in capitals. And aside or compared to the other two panels, we also have a concrete context. We want to look at localization in the context of Ukraine. I think that's something that is useful, but also, also poses the question how much you can generalize. So in terms of how we do or how well we, we uh, do localization, also depends on how to define it. Uh, Grant Bargain has, has defined it as uh, making or, or define it as a goal of making principled humanitarian action as local as possible and as international as necessary. So that is one definition. And I think the goal here has been to, to strengthen how much we invest uh, and respect the role of local actors who are always the first responders. Um, and then as we have also seen, bear the, the most costs. So the question is rather now perhaps why to do localization, but how to do it. And if we are focused on localization, how does it interact with the rest of the humanitarian system? And what are its intended or unintended co uh, consequences? Like for example, as we brought out, the impact on, on the issue of coordination. So without any further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. 
Um, we have here Roxolana Nostarenko. Uh, Nostar Roxolana works at, at the NGO Center of United Action. Mm -hmm. You're a regional analyst, and the center cooperates with Ukrainian territorial communities to develop local public policies in the areas of healthcare, educational, culture, waste management, and others. And the NGO also promotes citizen engagement and local decision making. It conducts surveys, interviews with community stakeholders, and trainings, and does trainings for local governments. She has also co-authored a research on civil society grassroots movements in Ukraine uh, that emerged after Russia's full-scale invasion. So I think that's something that clearly links to what we're going to discuss today. Uh, then we have here Oleg Mashuk. Uh, who joined the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation after the outbreak of the humanitarian crisis uh, in Ukraine in 2022. He coordinates the Swiss humanitarian aid protection and health portfolios, and you focus on the most vulnerable populations in the east and southern regions of Ukraine. Uh, well, and before his current role, uh, Oleg worked on capacity national organizations, you can mention here OSC, NATO, and EBRD. And last but not least, I have Pete Kerler. He's, uh, he's a diplomat, he's a public servant, um, currently also uh, head of division of multilateral policy on humanitarian assistance at the German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, so you, you shape the Germ Germany's approach on global humanitarian matters. And before that, uh, I know you have worked on ex export controls, as well as human rights, and also worked uh, with multilateral affairs, including in New York. So these are our speakers. You see here is a slightly different field here than in the previous panels, but I think also when colleagues mentioned or raised questions about government, I think now we also have a chance to bring in the government a little bit. So we agreed that we have some questions which are posed to specific panelists and some which are joint. So I would start with the first question to Roxelana. And the question is, when we have now discussion about localization, whether it's happening or not. So when you talk about Ukraine, is localization of humanitarian action real in Ukraine? Uh, and how has it changed um, over the last one and a half years? So actually, um, localization is about Ukraine. So after the, our organization, after two, uh, 24th of uh, 2022, 20, uh, were was one of the first responders uh, to the crisis that emerged. So we have our own story about it, and I will uh, let shortly um, talk, talk about it and what we did. Um, actually, on the second day of the full-scale war, uh, our um, organization, people from our organization, when they evacuated to the safest places from Kyiv, they started to think what we can do about uh, everything that happened and the initiative came to like it was very quick to help uh, communities because we are as you said uh, we were working with communities territorial, territorial communities before the full-scale war so we have connections with them so what we can do better uh, just to connect them and ask what they need and they needed just simply mattresses and lining for people that came from parts of Ukraine that were under shelling, occupied, et cetera, and just simply things. And we asked our donors, and one donor said, okay, well, <laughs> we will um, redirect these uh, funds for uh, us that we can help the communities. So it worked like that. Uh, and then we like purchasing, purchased all these things and just gave it to communities. And uh, it was a successful initiative because it involved 500 volunteers all over Ukraine. And it, it's also like, it's not like volunteer on, you do it all the day. It, volunteers did it in many initiatives. So it could be one person did something like smallest, but it helped a lot. And then um, we understand that uh, we did it through the four months. And then we understand that many other initiatives did the same or maybe much better. So we decided to return to our activities, just an analytics and analysis of uh, policies and helping the communities in other way. And 
uh, here and now <laughs> doing um, research, and we did it actually. After our experience, we did a research uh, that uh, showed, like we had, an, um, we had a question, why and what helped Ukraine to uh, quick, uh, quickly respond on it, uh, made a quick response on crisis? And then we understand that it's all about the civil society and the network between people. So we decided to research it and findings uh, of, we find out that uh, about 130 initiatives, it's actually the smallest part, it's only initiatives that we reached out. Uh, and they, uh, then we decided to think about what the most effective formats of the initiatives was uh, were, and then uh, whom they helped, uh, why they helped, and what resources they had. So we made a research on it, and maybe later in this discussion I will bring some uh, interesting moments, if you ask, I can answer. Uh, so, yeah, and we as organization return to what we did the best, research, and helping with uh, the policies uh, for um, communities. So, thank you. Thank you, Roxana. And I think before we actually go to the questions, perhaps a good like a intro from both Pete and Oleg on, on what how you see the topic would be useful. Perhaps I start from Oleg and then move over to Pete. Yeah, thank you. So um, I work for for Swiss Development Cooperation Office in Kiev, and uh, I consider uh, myself uh, lucky for work uh, for a, uh, for a donor, which is uh, actually has this possibility to work directly work and directly fund national NGOs, and um, this allows us to meet the partners uh, on the ground to see their challenges um, and also to try to uh, accommodate some of the needs um, they have. Um, and um, I think that um, we, um, uh, localization for us uh, started a long time ago in 2000, uh, I think from 2015, even maybe earlier, because our development colleagues and the embassy have always been working with the national civil society organizations. So when the um, uh, humanitarian aid uh, portfolio um, um, unfolded uh, at the embassy and we were speaking about localization and we want to support national initiatives, uh, our colleagues were saying, guys, but um, you are speaking about this like it's something new and you, it's something that uh, we should do now, but this is already there. You just need to take the opportunity and, and, and go ahead with supporting these NGOs. So when we started actually uh, um, going to the field and meeting these national organizations that, that we support, um, we really saw um, a big um, potential, um, but also um, a big gap uh, in how this, um, the whole coordination of humanitarian system in Ukraine is organized. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's not a uh, surprise. Ukraine is a big country, and the front line today is uh, about 1,200 kilometers. And all along this front line, uh, you have this uh, small civil society organizations who try to deliver humanitarian aid to the best extent possible. Um, and also you have many inter international actors there. So it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, but I think that uh, good things um, are happening now, uh, both in coordination and uh, uh, humanitarian aid delivery. So I'll be happy to talk a bit more about it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I'm happy to join actually this, this round because we are coming a bit from a different perspective. And sometimes I envy the Swiss colleagues because they have a completely different structure. And I feel sometimes that for you, it's much easier to do localization because you have teams in place that are really much bigger in terms of, of humanitarian assistance. But maybe let me start just by mentioning how much convinced we are that localization is the way to go and that Ukraine is exactly the example where it proved why it is so important. Because I think first to see so many highly motivated uh, local organizations doing a work that could not have been done, especially since the war broke, broke out by the international system as it, as it was before. So in, in theory, but hopefully also in practice, we are convinced that localization is the way to go. But I want to be honest with you, uh, for us as um, the second biggest donor, it's difficult. It's, it's not always easy. Juliet mentioned this morning how important it is actually to make the system more efficient. 
in terms of a growing funding gap. That's also our approach, and I think localization is the way to go because otherwise you cannot make use of the full resources that you have, and, and second, you will not make progress on accountability for affected uh, populations, really making sure that you deliver the aid that is needed, that is needed on the ground. So that's absolutely essential for us. But what is our approach? Our approach is because we can't fund uh, local organizations directly in large numbers because we have administrative hurdles first, because we have to do um, due diligence checks with all the organizations we would be working on, so we couldn't do this at a large scale. And the second thing is, because I want to be honest, is also a capacity issue for us. So what are we doing in order to, to overcome these challenges? First, we are very much committed to the grand bargain goal of delivering 25% at least at, at the minimum of um, aid, uh, as, uh, of aid funding as direct as possible, meaning with uh, maximum one intermediary. And we are currently standing at 18%. We are not there yet, but we are trying to get there. So uh, the grand bargain, which we are, uh, where we are part of the steering group of the so-called facilitation group, uh, last year came up with a working group that provided recommendations finally on how intermediaries actually could do localization much better. So how to make sure that local organizations get their share of the overhead costs, how to make sure that local organizations are being part of the design of the humanitarian response right from the beginning. So we were really involved in the discussions, make sure, making sure that there would be a substantial outcome. And now, internally, we are trying to implement that. So we provided guidelines to all our missions abroad in order to make sure that in the field, they push the organizations, uh, the intermediaries, in order to make sure that overhead costs are really passed on and that local organizations are being seen eye to eye and that they are part of the design of the response right from the beginning. The second element which we are working with uh, very strongly is the country-based pooled funds because we think the country-based pooled funds are a clear instrument for doing localization. They are a very good tool and we're doing so very concretely with the Ukrainian uh, Humanitarian Fund uh, for which we have been the, the biggest donor since, since 2019 and the societies, as was mentioned before in the previous panels. For us, this has like a built-in component of, of localization already. So we had a standing cooperation with the German Red Cross, which in turn was working very closely with the Ukrainian Red Cross over time. So basically, that's the three components that we try to overcome the obstacles that we have. Thank you. I think you now kicked off and exactly seen what we have here. Like this, our different perspectives, different viewpoints. Uh, so I'm kicking it right back to Pitt because we take advantage of Germany being here as one of the largest humanitarian donors. You've talked about the importance of localization for you. Um, what is like before we delve into Ukraine in particular? Um, localization is a buzzword in every humanitarian discussion that we have. It comes up, and people say we should do it. What is your opinion to the extent you can express it here, whether it's actually happening? Are we progressing with its implementation? Um, how are our objectives vis-a-vis -vis our, our real results hmm. from a donor hmm. perspective? I guess in a nutshell, we are not there yet. Uh, I, I mentioned the numbers in the beginning. We didn't, we were not able to, to meet the grand bargain threshold of 25% at least, and that's only as direct as possible. This is not really with, with working with local actors directly. But I think when I'm in the grand bargain discussions, actually where localization is one of the two priority issues, there's not only big expectations, but there's also a huge understanding that things need to change. But I want to be honest with you. I mean, the humanitarian system, you probably all know, and, and Juliet knows best, probably is a big tanker. It's not so really easy to, to really steer its course <laughs> and, to get, and to get change overnight. And we should also not be afraid of being managing expectations, because I think expectations are huge in terms of localizations. And again, we need to be honest. I think. The established system, if I may call it that way, the UN system has its advantages. It can scale up very quickly, for example, has highly professionalized staff that can deliver all kinds of services across the whole 
the whole spectrum. What we really need is, is the right mix. We really need the right mix, as I said in, in the beginning, in order to become more efficient and to be more focused on, on the targeted needs of the people on the ground, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's still a way to go. We have to manage expectations, but step by step we have to do so. Later on, maybe I can say a little bit more of what we try to do nationally in order to, to implement it. And I think until then we have the slides, which was rather descriptive on, on, on the actual numbers as well. Um, I think going now into the context of Ukraine and localization there, uh, from I think this is a question for both Oleg and Pete. Um, have donors really taken the opportunity to you make use of the particular Ukrainian context that we have? We have a resilient, very motivated civil society, as also Roxana pointed out. Uh, we have a functioning government structures. We have digital capacity. Have we taken this opportunity to use localization to, to implement it? So I would, uh, uh, in short, describe it as work in progress. Um, um, I think that um, uh, we can look, there was a, a localization baseline done by, by a, a national Ukrainian NGO, which is called NGORC, which looked at a little bit uh, about, uh, uh, which did interviews with the NGOs about the main challenges that they face in Ukraine. And uh, the two um, main challenges for them are funding and uh, policy making. So since the funding is the main challenge for the NGO and it's very far from, from being a good result, uh, I would say, then I would say that donors uh, are not there yet. And this is uh, actually related to what uh, Pete mentioned about the policies of, of donors which uh, do not allow uh, really work with the national actors. So there are different mechanisms as pool funds, for example, which uh, uh, is a great uh, start. Uh, I think the um, uh, UHF uh, allocation for national organizations, the uh, last one was about 50% of funds went to the national ones, which is great. But if, if you look into the details, the requirements for these small NGOs to benefit from this fund are, are so complex uh, that the small organizations, they simply have no time uh, even, not, not even to speak about the knowledge of how to properly submit the documents, write a project proposal, which is also a big gap. But uh, just because these people uh, are under, these organizations are understaffed and um, they are working 24 hours per seven, they don't even have time for, for these uh, things to be written. So uh, my message is that um, procedures should be simplified uh, when, when it is possible. For example, in the case of the SDC, uh, we have um, um, a, um, a flexible um, policy in this regard. Uh, for well-established NGOs, we required a um, whole package of documents, um, uh, a, a very um, uh, good due diligence, etc. Uh, but for the small organizations, we are um, uh, more flexible and uh, our demands are less strict, let's say. Of course, we still do due diligence. We uh, are trying to make sure that uh, aid is, uh, humanitarian aid is principled. Uh, but um, the procedure is simplified, which allows, allows us to work with these NGOs. And also another instrument that we use is um, uh, some sub-granting mechanism. So we um, give a, grant, a big grant to a big national NGO, which then uh, distributes this to small national NGOs. And this is actually a very effective mechanism because we uh, saw that with 5,000 or 30,000 of Swiss francs, these NGOs um, can do a lot, really a lot. Um, uh, another gap, a big gap was capacity building. So what we did, we, we gave these grants, but also we uh, accompanied these NGOs with capacity building to explain them what we mean by humanitarian aid, because this is a separate question, right? Uh, in Ukraine, uh, we can also discuss how it is uh, perceived, what humanitarian aid is perceived. Uh, so uh, we uh, provide capacity building with um, uh, what is principled humanitarian aid, but uh, also how to build internal policies of the organizations. And this support that we give allows them to apply for additional funding from other partners, uh, but also uh, having the backup of Switzerland also gives them um, um, like uh, a better, better picture in front of the other donors, and other donors would be more eager to fund these organizations. 
Um, so I think there is um, a lot of things that donors can do. Um, try to a little bit play with, with these internal regulations, which are, uh, of course, very difficult. But um, I think that things could, could be done uh, better. And um, but, um, but, but now I think that also the organizations also noticed themselves that they are underfunded. And also because they are very fragmented and they don't have a single uh, voice um, uh, in Ukraine, etc. So I think that now the organizations themselves started to um, build alliances to be more vocal and to also to be able to access uh, these uh, big donors in Ukraine. I think it's good to see a viewpoint of one donor and also somebody who takes active or proactive steps. But of course, it's got difficult to evaluate the lay of the land in total, but it's a good perspective. Pete, on, on the German side? Yeah, first, let me underline that we are completely convinced that what are the advantages are of local actors, and Ukraine is a very good example in point, as I mentioned in the beginning. The local organizations, first, they are highly motivated, they know that they speak the language, they know what, what people need, they share the values of, of, of people on the ground, and very often they even have better access because they are very often very close to the front lines or even in the occupied in the occupied territories. Of the same at the same time we also recognize that there are huge challenges. For example, many of the organizations are pretty new. Volunteer networks have not been able to really establish more like a solid structure as such, not being able to hire people on a long term and they also have to fight bureaucracy as in any country. They have to make sure that they are registered, they have to do the taxation, the reporting, all these kinds of things. So what we realized also is that one trigger point where we can really do something in addition to the measures that I mentioned at the beginning, like for example the Ukrainian Humanitarian Fund or the Red Cross Red Crescent movement with its local, with its local presence, we need to make sure that part of the overhead costs is going to the local organizations. And this is actually why I mentioned in the beginning, we have these guidelines and we are pushing our partners really hard in order to pass on part of the overheads. Because overheads would allow to hire staff more permanently, to do capacity building, to do training and institutionalize mm -hmm. this more. Actually, that's what we are what we are trying to do. But as I said in the beginning, it's 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 not easy. But sometimes, just in order to give you an example, there are some successes. For example, in Ukraine, we are working with 16 larger international organizations, which in turn work with 73 local organizations. So by doing this, we are able to spread out even more and have a cascading effect in in a way. Thank you. So now it's a reality check. How do we see things from the civil society huh. side? <laughs> That's interesting because uh, I have what to say on every point and agree with many of them uh, about localization. So when I was thinking about what, uh, what the main like, factors that connected to localization in Ukraine, it's the territory, as you said the dense network of activists, and the absence of bureaucratic procedures uh, on the in, into, um, informal um, level. So every of these factors has its pros and cons. So the first is like territory, it's more territory, you need more local actors. And it's actually very natural, uh, to, like they appear naturally. So because there is a lot of people that connected to the issues. Uh, one, of, one of them are IDPs. We had a conversation with uh, people that created their initiatives after they became an IDPs. So mm -hmm. they understand that they need to do something. So they came to uh, other part of Ukraine and started to gather other people together. So it's, it was firstly very informal. So uh, the dance network is also... Uh, we need to point that Ukraine had the network of activists before 2022. So it, the, when the Russia state uh, started the war in 2014, so many people became an IDPs and also uh, started to gather in activists, um, just activist circles, and also uh, the revolution of dignity. And it's everything that is well, like steps until we understand that this network is really working uh, when 
the full-scale war began. And the absence of bureaucratic procedures is actually, it creates uh, flexibility, adaptability to different uh, issues. So for example, uh, people ask you as an activist, you're an activist and people ask you to bring something like some goods. You need, for example, mattresses, but then you understand you need something else. And you just call, simply call these activists and everything just uh, changes immediately and people just connected one to other. And it became um, a style of living for many volunteers. But of course, all these factors has had some negativity that connected to internal, external factors. And uh, for example, territory, it's occupation, the occupation, shelling, so it's always changing landscape. And you understand that volunteers just, uh, they are uh, seeking for new ways of evacuation for people, for example, to, or delivering the humanitarian aid for the uh, for, like uh, the settlements near the front line. So it's everything is changing, but the people are very adaptable to this. So it's um, yeah, it, it's a reality for Ukraine to just territory is also is always shelling, so under shelling. So. Uh, about the network, uh, our research uh, found that half of initiatives uh, that we uh, interviewed addressed problems in two or more spheres. So they worked not only with humanitarian aid to just IDPs or people under the like, in the settlements that were under the shelling. They also uh, helped the military, just simply soldiers, because they, it, it was like, for example, my friend and I helped them, uh, help my friends, or it's my colleagues that were mobilized to the army. So it was very uh, close to each other, and it's, be it's also became a problem because when you are working with uh, only humanitarian aid, it's one point of view, but when you are working also like for military, uh, many donors will say to you that it's not our, like our policies are not about this. So we, I can't give you uh, the funds, I can't fund these activities because one another. So. Uh, but uh, many of initiatives uh, understand this and they try to focus only on one uh, activity like humanitarian aid or just simply military aid. So it's differentiation became real. So it's much more easier now to work with some NGOs or initiatives that then became an NGO. So many of them, uh, we uh, found out that out of uh, 131 initiative, the m more than half of the transformed initiatives uh, just to, uh, became an NGOs or just uh, became more local or decided they only have like one target audience, not like uh, after the full scale war began and everyone helps helped everyone. <laughs> uh, so it became much more easier for NGOs if they, if initiative became an NGO, it, um, it's much more easier them to have uh, funding from donors and also just live in a legal uh, area, so they are legal. It's not just a simply network of friends, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's about the main points that you said. So the uh, civil society of Ukraine understand what they need to do to, uh, to have help from other uh, countries, from other people, because we understand that it a little bit, it's, it a little bit cha chaotic was firstly, like um, <laughs> everyone doing something and it was very uh, just quicker, uh, quick actions to solve the problem here and now. But then people of course like institution institutionalized <laughs> their activities and became more aware that they're living not only in uh, inside of Ukraine but they're connected to other countries that can help us. So we need to provide them information that they need to provide us assistance. I think what you have also shown is the pro like the dynamics. We have yeah. really <coughs> like seen a change, both in the society, civil society, whether it's good for or bad. I think there's been a strong push in terms of motivation that we have seen. 
But like already pointed out uh, the challenges regarding capacity. So what is your view? Is is what is the what are the challenges for the civil society, Roxana, in terms of capacity? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? So the capacity is growing because you understand that it, we have much more. Um, we did so many things, just an aid and analytics on what we did, and civil society understand that they they grow uh, in a process of this uh, everything that connected with humanitarian crisis, and capacity is growing, and uh, actually many uh, of initiatives communicate with the local governments and the capacity of local governments are also growing up. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting how they connect it uh, to each other, because I can, I can talk about initiatives without the mention of local governments, because they did a lot. Mm -hmm. Like the local businesses, local governments, and the civil society, it was like activists, volunteers, or just NGOs. It was like a big uh, network, and they did everything just to help the people, uh, the communities, and they are growing, the, the capacity of them are just growing, and I think it will, it will continue to be like that. Thank you. I think uh, when we go into the specific context of, of Ukraine and a very intense conflict that still continues, um, I think the issue of transfer risk, which also came up earlier today, uh, is very relevant. Uh, localization involves a potential for transfer, a larger transfer risk to, to local actors, uh, which is an immediate concern in this context. Um, how can the donors manage it the best way, and, and how do you see their duty of care in this context? Like. Uh, so I will. Um, I think that yes, um, one of the important points or of why localization needs to happen and is happening in Ukraine is a question of access because international organizations have um, also security regulations and rules which do not allow them to access um, very uh, territories which are very close to the front line. Uh, but national uh, organizations and volunteer groups have been doing it already uh, since uh, the 24th of February of 2022. Uh, so I think that um, here, um, uh, this is why uh, localization is important, because this is the only way uh, to access the people who live there, who are still there, and who need uh, our, this humanitarian assistance. Um, so in our case, for example, we uh, developed um, a fair, fair partnership policy. Uh, which we um, provide uh, to our international partners and organizations. Um, uh, it's this very similar, I think, to, to what you said, uh, Pete, uh, Pete, when uh, you ask your partners to take into account certain things, like overhead, etc. We also do that with this, uh, with this policy. Uh, and we ask our partners, uh, when they work with uh, national NGOs, uh, to make sure that uh, the people who are there are protected. Uh, first of all, they are protected with helmets and, um, and uh, protective vests. Um, they also uh, get uh, the psychological support. By the way, this is something that um, didn't come up uh, at the beginning uh, of the conflict. Uh, this is something that we learned a bit later, that people who work 24-7 uh, in this difficult context also need psychosocial support, right? They are providing this, but they themselves uh, also need it. So we ask our partners uh, to, to protect, uh, protect this, uh, this NGOs. And uh, also very important <coughs> initiative that we have and we consider very relevant is uh, insurance. Uh, Ukraine, for those who know Ukraine, uh, you, you may know that uh, insurance uh, is not uh, common in Ukraine. People are not insured, uh, just like if I may so, say so. Um, so um, when we first met the, with the volunteers and we were speaking about that, and, uh, my Swiss colleagues just asked, are you guys insured because you are going into these dangerous locations? And they said, no, we are not insured. It, it was like normal reaction. Um, and there was, 
very surprising for uh, the Swiss colleagues uh, because it's almost, uh, you know, <laughs> they are breaking the law if they're not in insured. <laughs> so in this case, we decided, uh, so this is how we decided actually that we can try to, to do something with this. And we uh, now, um, with a local partner in Kharkiv Oblast, which is called uh, Relief Coordination <coughs> Center, we provide uh, 2,000 of uh, life and accident insurance for the volunteer groups who, who, works, uh, who work there. Um, and I think it's a good initiative, and it was taken up uh, forward by other uh, national NGOs uh, which do policy making, and now they are advocating for the tax uh, exemption for this in, uh, on the insurance policies for the volunteers. Uh, this is a pilot project, and we would like uh, probably to replicate it in other oblasts as well. And the next, next task for us will be to think how to make it sustainable uh, if the conflict uh, will last longer. And probably uh, we need to think about uh, some more sustain sustainable solutions. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of piqued by the specific uh, reference that also Roxalana made about um, uh, the, the organizations learning what is humanitarian and what is not. And, and I know that in our previous discussion, although Oleg also mentioned, so perhaps I follow on with on Oleg's uh, point here, it, as humanitarian action is underpinned by rec internationally recognized humanitarian principles. Um, and then we have the, one, the, the four main ones. We have good humanitarian donorship ones. Uh, to what extent does localization provide an opportunity to build support to these uh, principles and to what extent it can pose a risk uh, to the dilution? I think Roxana has made uh, an example that there's been a learning process and, and, and a bit of a clarifying in a system, but I, I wonder what you think on this. So, um, yes, I think that in our case, um, um, uh, Ukrainian case, as you mentioned, uh, is, is very special because even uh, Ukrainian legislation says that um, um, uh, humanitarian aid is basically everything which is provided for free. Uh, so um, uh, people bring uh, cars for militaries as humanitarian aid for militaries, and this is um, how it all started. And it, uh, yes, it, it sounds uh, uh, also like funny, but uh, it was very important, I think, at the at the beginning uh, of the full-scale invasion for, um, for the local volunteers uh, to have this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, but now, but, um, um, and this is um, what also prevented them at some point to get this funding from the, uh, from the donors to, to make sure the humanitarian aid is, deli in, is delivered in, the, in a principled way. Um, so I think that, uh, as I already mentioned, um, capacity building uh, here is um, a key, but also due diligence process. So we um, um, work with partners um, who uh, provide due diligence uh, for these organizations, um, but we also provide training of, uh, on humanitarian aid. And I think that um, it's important to mention that um, there is always a risk here because uh, these um, national NGOs, uh, uh, as Roxolana mentioned, they are uh, trying to, to help everyone because everyone needs, needs help, right, in Ukraine. So um, I think that Switzerland takes um, some risk here as well um, uh, in Ukraine because um, uh, we also understand that um, our main goal is to reach the populations, uh, the civilian populations with, uh, which live in, in the frontline areas. And this is uh, something important uh, for us. So we are taking um, uh, this risk, but we are trying to do as much as possible to prevent um, any deviations. Yeah, Roxana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, there is a lot of to say about the uh, NGOs, uh, Ukrainian civil society, and um, <coughs> about humanitarian actions. Mm. As I said, uh, the m many things could be done not only through NGOs, but through local authorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, why it so? Uh, why I think it's good, as the previous panelists said that about the asking for information, for like you you need to ask information uh, for in communities where you work in. So. The main um, their data collector in these uh, communities are the local authorities. So it would be very easy to work with them because they know everyone 
almost like like everything that connected with services, civil services, are connected to the local authorities, like IDP certificates, for example, uh, everything that connected with their like location, accommodation for IDPs, for example, uh, everything that connected with humanitarian aid uh, also came, like they are processing aid if something, for example, are not only from government, but from, for, for example, from local businesses, or not local businesses, mm -hmm. like the national businesses I came from, uh, are um, processing uh, in the local authorities. So they could be a very good medium, uh, because as uh, Oleg said, they're, like, the NGOs, local NGOs are small. They are, maybe they are capable to help the like, certain amount of people, but they need to be helped by the other local actors, and this is local governments. So it would be very helpful to work not only with NGOs, but make an uh, alliance between the local actors, actors and local, uh, local NGOs and local authorities. So they could work together and they will help a lot because these people are working with the citizens on the ground and they know everything about their needs and you don't need to like to you, you just need to ask someone from the for example department that connected to uh like social issues everything like that so you can connect this person and then ask what your community need is your community are like for example we had a community a territorial, territorial community in our research that were, uh, when IDPs came there, the, uh, the actual uh, amount of people just tripled, like, because there is a small community of 5,000 people, and then they 15,000 people, and then a lot of IDPs. So they know what they, this IDPs uh, really need, and you just ask them, or just phone them, or something like that, and it's about the, what donors could do, and we will talk about maybe it later, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what donors could do to work with the local actors uh, much more productively. Mm -hmm. I think you have also pointed out very specific one, this enabling condition, which is in Ukraine, is, is this cooperation with government and local government at different levels and how it has enabled uh, to both collect, uh, analyze information, also provide assistance. So. I think later we come to the uh, to the point of, of to what extent this travels, but I think here it's a strength that should be should be used. Um, going back to the general question that was posed when we phrased the objective of our our panel was, localization is one of our objectives. Uh, it's a good thing. It's aimed for greater efficiency, for greater reach. Uh, one of the unintended co consequences can be there's you broaden the bottom up approach, but you also increase the risk or the potential uh, for fragmentation uh, and, and less coordination. Uh, to what extent you have felt this challenge in, in working in Ukraine and how have the UN, of course, and the other actors been able to address it, to respond to it in a situation where you should take use of, uh, make use of the fact that you have so many local actors, but at the same time maintain an, a good overall picture? So I would ask that question to, from everyone, but I don't know. I start from Pete and, mm. and then move on uh, to others. Hmm. Mm. I mean, it would be interesting to hear the analysis of, of colleagues from, from on the ground, actually, on how they see coordination. I just imagine that coordination must be a real challenge, to be honest, because you need to coordinate at the national level. You need to co coordinate at the local level. Ideally, you also coordinate on thematic issues. So this must be a huge task. And I think, I think Roxolana described it very in a very interesting way, on a very nice way, how the, the humanitarian response evolved also. And of course, at the beginning, everyone just started working, and then you realize probably there's a need for coordination because there's so much local and international response. But also the scale of the humanitarian situation is so big in Ukraine because, if I'm not mistaken, it's around 17 million people that need humanitarian assistance in, in, in Ukraine. So this is really a huge humanitarian situation. So there must be huge challenges for, for, for coordination, I imagine. We are n 
for us, as, as a big donor, of course, we want to have a coordinated system because a coordinated system with a proper needs assessment and with a cluster uh, coordinated responses and efficient system, we very much support OCHA's role in, in, in doing so, in really coordinating the, the system. I'm not really sure if OCHA is able to do so all the time and, and to be up to the challenges, but I also say these are unprecedented challenges. We work with them and support their pilot projects in order to get really better on coordination in order to make sure that they also come closer to the needs of the affected populations. There, you might have heard about this flagship projects which uh, are going on in four uh, pilot countries where they really try to go at the sub-national level, at the local level in order to do area-based coordination in order to make sure that the needs of the people are really being addressed. And then of course it would be interesting to do so on a larger scale and to apply the findings and the learnings also to other to other contexts. But I can also imagine, that's the OCHA side, that's the coordination side, but I also imagine that for civil society, of course, it might be helpful to get organized, and you're doing this, this is what you referred to, to provide platforms which makes it easier to articulate yourself and to also interact with the, with the system. Thank you. Dr. Lara. Yeah, <laughs> about what uh, the other side, the donors, the people who can help, uh, can do. Mm, I was thinking about it as researcher, first of all, um, because when we, uh, yeah, we are not given the humanitarian aid now for the people, uh, but we can help <coughs> with understanding the uh, these complex processes that happen to, like, they are evolving all the time, and uh, the first is, uh, about what should donors do is to make a ground, on the ground analysis, what the people really need. So it should be done before the situation happened because I know the, uh, from like the friend of mine in this field that it was for, for example a situation with Kahovka Dam that were blew up, blew up and then they, uh, this, uh, Aid that help to they need to be received much more earlier than they they just came with the water pumps for just to help the water to be like transferred, <laughs> but then they realized that the water just went down and it was like a few weeks after the real need. So the uh, for quicker response it should be less bureaucracy, but how it to do, it's maybe the, the people, like the, the, the representatives of the donors should um, like to understand how they um, need to uh, make less uh, obstacles for the NGOs to um, engage in uh, cooperation. And then uh, also, um, about, but not to, <laughs> to forget, because I wrote it down. <laughs> uh, and also, prim, um, uh, I said about the analysis, about the bureaucratic procedures, and also about the uh, making a contact base of local NGOs. Mm -hmm. So the donors should make, uh, for example, like in uh, the base of these uh, local actors, and they need to check their organizational capacity and maybe make a less harsh, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> uh, the points of, for like to be um, requirements. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you so much. Yes, requirements for <laughs> a requirement, a requirements for the NGOs, uh, because not everyone. Uh, not every NGO have it on the local level because you understand it's it could be NGO uh, that consists of four people or like mm -hmm. ten people. It's a small uh, amount, but it's actually they are very effective. They could be very effective these four people because they're like working as you said like 24 hours a day and they are really aimed on. Uh, making like the things uh, changed by themselves. So uh, also uh, 
RSF, yes, and ask for fina financial evidence because there could be different frauds, of course, because we are living in a crisis situation and there could be people that are want to, they, they want to um, be part of this funding sharing process and they understand that it could be people that are not very uh, good, <laughs> as I said, yeah. Uh, so donors should just uh, be a fact checker themselves, so they need to do a very big work, but a lot of uh, NGOs, established NGOs, could help them to do this. So the fact checking, because they have the contacts of different NGOs on the ground, so uh, it, it could always be a very like pr process of communication between different people. And in Ukraine, it happened very quick, because many people know each other because of the crisis that happened. Many people just moved from one city to another, just have a, became acquaintances from the activist community, I mean. Uh, and it's really helpful because you can ask for information uh, on your, like, uh, just call it or type it to someone and ask something. It's very, um, in Ukraine, it, it works very well. <laughs> I think you have put like a very local perspective next to, to very large donors and, and let's say try to make the two pictures kind of uh, work together, but I think it's not a very unique situation. Um, on the fragmentation and coordination challenges, or like. Yes, um, I think that uh, the last statistics uh, I saw on the number of Ukrainian charitable organizations, this is the official uh, legal definition of, uh, of uh, humanitarian organizations in Ukraine, uh, was uh, 28,000. Uh, so when you also add the number of uh, international actors, uh, that I think that vast majority of them are present now in Ukraine, that makes the coordination really difficult, of course, but also um, there is a opportunity there because there are national NGOs who also coordinate themselves, etc. Um, uh, so I think that when the conflict uh, started in the 2022 and the international organizations and OCHA started to unfold uh, their, uh, um, um, their activities, uh, the UN came with its standard cluster system mm -hmm. um, and it start to, started to apply it in Ukraine. But also, it, it had, they needed huge capacities to make sure that it works. And uh, these national NGOs, in parallel, they didn't know that it existed. Uh, so they invented their own thing. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, ask colleagues uh, to show an example of a coordination initiative on the screen, um, if possible. So um, this will be an example uh, of a regional coordination in initiative in Kharkiv region, um, implemented by uh, a local NGO, which is called Relief Coordination Center. Um, exactly, this is why they did it, because uh, aid was delivered by every small uh, com uh, volunteer organizations and families, etc., a bit everywhere, and they just wanted to know what is going where, uh, because uh, there were cases where people were receiving food uh, supplies three times. So if you oh. can zo zoom out just a little bit to see the map of Ukraine, just to locate a little bit. Uh, yeah, so you can see Ukraine, and th then in the east you, you can see these uh, dots, and if you could zoom in, please, uh, now. Uh, Yes, on these dots, and this is what this organization did. They actually did a coordination system. If you click on any of those, um, you will see they track um, how they track the information. So they have the name of the community, the number of people who live there, um, the total coverage of humanitarian needs, um, at, uh, some different type of data, and also the data who delivered aid, when it was delivered, um, and the contact, uh, they also, I know that they have contact numbers of the community leaders who live there, so if uh, anyone wants to reach, uh, reach out, they could also contact this uh, organization and, and continue. So this initiative um, uh, was very effective for the local coordination, uh, actually, at the, at the regional level. Uh, and then uh, OCHA um, also discovered that this organization existed, and this organization also discovered that OCHA exists uh, <laughs> in Ukraine. Um, and now they came to, together. Um, and this is a good, uh, actually, example. Um, so now things work together, and I think the OCHA made a great effort to accommodate this also coordination system. Um, 
but also there are still some challenges in coordination, of course, uh, because of, the, of the, how to engage local authorities, uh, this UN cluster-based cluster system. Um, but the big, biggest challenges are for national NGOs to plug in to this system, I think. First of all, because of the language issue. Very simply, people don't speak English. Um, and um, here, OCHA also made a great progress because now the, all the cluster meetings are translated into Ukrainian for the organizations to be able to participate. But then the second coordination challenge comes when you, even if you understand the words, you cannot really um, you know, understand how things work. And this is a great challenge, coordination challenge that we hear uh, uh, from the national partners. So I think that the, the, there should be more work done in terms of how to make sure that the messages pass through and the organization can really uh, understand how things uh, work. Uh, I remember just an example that there was um, one organization saying that uh, um, there was a coordination meeting uh, and everyone talked about the localization and nothing happened. Um, and <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, there is this challenge on, on how to make sure that things are following up uh, and, and coordinated. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's wonderful to see that there's actually a living parallel to the cluster system which has existed in the near, near past and now it works with, with OCHA. It's too bad we don't have a UN colleague here. It would be interesting to hear that perspective and, and compare it and see what also perhaps UN could learn um, from this. Uh, which kind of leads me to, to the next uh, overall or joint question is, um, Ukraine is a specific case. There is a strong national like, NGO network. There was a strong also or initiative that developed into actual civil societies. Um, and there's been a, it's a practice which is a good practice. So the question is, how can, to what extent those lessons learned and good practices that we have seen over the last one and, and 18 months, uh, how can they be, how, to what extent it can provide lessons more on localization more generally? Is it such a specific context that nothing can be learned or is there something that we can, we can take from this and, and expand it on, on, the, on broader localization throughout, throughout the world for different crises? Mm. It's actually a good question because uh, the example of Ukraine is maybe, as you said, exceptional because it's a large territory. A lot of people just became an IDPs. Uh, we are facing, it's a crisis that are always with us because we are like, the cities are shelled uh, always and uh, you could be a target not only in like the front line, but in Kyiv, other cities on the west part, and south, of course. And um, what I want to say that uh, maybe uh, the main lessons from Ukrainian case uh, for other countries that are facing humanitarian problems uh, and they need aid, uh, the key is uh, the making a network of people that are connected not only formally but informally. You just need to make uh, these connects with people and you need to connect different stakeholders together, like the business, the uh, NGOs, uh, the local government, as I said. So. Uh, if country have this, there is much more, like, there is less, um, uh, less, uh, I want to say, the problem will become uh, much more easier to mm -hmm. solve if the many actors are connected. Because you, uh, you can have some resources uh, because you know someone that have this. So it became, like in Ukraine, it happened, as I said, rapidly. Uh, everyone uh, just started to uh, make a post in social media, if you have this or if you have that. And then it became institutionalized, institutionalized uh, and uh, these connections should be uh, the main key for everything because it's, it's about 
resources and it's about the uh, the time of action. It became much more quicker. So it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peter or Lenk, who wants to go first? Yeah, maybe just very quickly. I can imagine that w Ukraine provides the right examples in order to give a real impulse to localization and to really make sure that it's being put to on, a, on a new level, and but to also be prepared for future crisis in order to have instruments on how to work with large groups of civil society actors. I think that could be one of the lessons learned. But on the other hand, I think, also I'm definitely not an expert on Ukraine, I, I think that the example of Ukraine is quite specific because you have a working administration, you have lots of volunteer organizations with a high capacity that have been working also before, at least since 2014, also in the occupied territories. So it's a little bit a mix of, of the two different things. So there are definitely lessons, le lessons learned for the, for the system as such, but also, of course, about the challenges on how to coordinate such large numbers of volunteer organizations and civil society organizations. But at the same time, I think the example is quite specific and cannot be really like duplicated in other in other contexts like one to one so it has to be a, a bit context specific i imagine but it's of course a convincing example why we need to get better on on localization and have the right instruments on coordinating with with local societies i like i would just add that uh, this um, uh, human capital here is it the key um, especially in ukrainian case uh, because the capacities are already there and they deliver, deliver humanitarian aid, these uh, skills that these organizations um, have and, all, and also are gaining with the support of international uh, partners, uh, they are transferable and uh, for the recovery context, for example, uh, then this, the same people will also be rebuilding uh, Ukraine and also will, will be making some other, also other projects. So investing in local uh, human capital here, uh, and it probably in other contexts as well, will also lead uh, to, to more sustainable uh, solutions for the future. I really want to add <laughs> about, uh, I came to my mind when you said about the, uh, before 2022, what happened in Ukraine, there was a decentralization reform and mm -hmm. it really, uh, like change the landscape of everything that connected to funds because uh, the local authorities became uh, the one who um, decide what to do with, for example, educational system like the schools. <coughs> uh, they uh, became much more responsible for, uh, for everything that happened on their like, territory uh, and for people and for funding the services for these people. So it was really that point that changed the uh, this localization became real because people need to be uh, to work on the problems on the issues that face the community not only like for example the region oblast mm -hmm. but the community is the smallest part like the smallest one and this uh, just make uh, this base for this all, all these networks that I said before. I think yeah, we, you, the common element in your responses has been the human element as well, um, the the richness and 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 the kind of the basic network that provided. Um, and I wanted to also pick up one point uh, from Alec that was, we can't don't have the time to to go into this further, but we see parallel now humanitarian aid and reconstruction, and I think the connecting element will be the local organisations and communities here because they won't leave; they are there. So as we go on progress to, to the stage of reconstruction, then that remains equally important. So I think the networks that have been built in the humanitarian field will also carry on further there. But I think that's a discussion already for another SDEV organized conference. Um, I would, uh, with that, I would open the floor for questions uh, to our panelists. And I think I would also encourage you to take, make use of the fact that we have different uh, perspectives here. We have colleagues from, from government, colleagues from civil society. Um, and I think uh, challenge them if you still feel it after, after, the end of the, after the end of the long day. That's the thing at the second part of any conference, the, question, the number of questions <laughs> goes down. So I see one over there. Okay. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting uh, perspectives. My, my question is um, a little bit about the pooled funding um, as uh, potential uh, means to allow for localization, basically. So you, you mentioned it, but, um, and uh, yeah, it was brought up a, a couple of times. Just first, a reflection on uh, well, I used to work with the uh, Start Network, and Start Fund has um, a, a, a pooled funding mechanism where whereby NGOs can become part of the decision-making process, essentially. So the funding is given by the donor, but the, um, the, the decision is made by the NGOs themselves. And I see a, you know, a great value in that because it, it also uh, gives agency. It's not just uh, a means of finding the funding, but it's, a, it's, it's like built-in coordination because the NGOs are then finding out about it each other, their strengths and their weaknesses, um, and that's a, that's a kind of uh, benefit. But I, but the, my question is about um, where you see uh, uh, pooled funding uh, going in the future, is perhaps expanding a little bit on this idea of the flagship initiative, which I believe um, uh, could uh, change the way in which uh, funding at the moment is, is channeled. And you know, we saw in Juliet's um, uh, slides just the, the lack of uh, funding going to local NGOs. Um, perhaps um, you know, there are different levels of Pooled funds, of course, UN, uh, NGOs, and um, uh, the uh, Red Cross has its own draft. But yeah, how do you see the future, and how, how do you see um, your Switzerland and Germany's um, contribution to that? Thank you. I see that question heading towards Pitt, but uh, there was another one that would take, and then we go to, to responses. OK, there's two more. Yes, so there is another one here. Uh, Natalia acted. Uh, so, speaking of the coordination system, it's uh, uh, gaps and exclusion, actually, uh, for the local partners. Namely, uh, I would mention the cash working group, and there is a total exclusion for the local partners linked to this um, limitation for in-person participation in the cash working group meetings only. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there is an idea, an initiative to create the platform for local actors to be able to coordinate. So just curious to hear what you think, whether it would be something uh, reasonable, effective, and feasible to create it uh, yeah, for local partners in Ukraine to coordinate for cash, but not limited to cash response only. Thank you. I'll take a third one from over there. Is there a fourth question, or then we'll do it in the next round? Yes. Can you take oh, it? Thank you so much, dear experts, uh, dear Ukrainian colleagues, and also Mr. Pete. So I have two questions, but they are very interconnected. So the first is for my Ukrainian colleagues. How would you estimate which key criteria should show uh, non-governmental organizations, as well as civic society organizations, to our future donors to persuade them in our transparency, just to make our donors be sure in our clarity means. Because like, for example, every non governmental organization or civil society organization can uh, have its own rules, you know, how to show in their transparency and so on. And also like very connected question to Mr. Pete. So how would you estimate what we are to show which criteria persuading you, I mean Germany and uh, other countries of the European Union, that we are clear, that we are not corrupted, and we are the guys who are to trust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we go to questions we have. One on pooled funding, which I start from Pete. Um, perhaps you can also take the, the question on transparency, and I think Oleg can chip in here. And, and on the issue of uh, creation of a local uh, partners coordination platform, perhaps Roxalana and I can pitch in. Pit. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the question on, on pooled funds, because Germany is a big fan of the pooled funds. <laughs> we think when we always say that uh, the pooled funds, in our view, are like the drivers of innovation, because you can really cause like systemic, or you can trigger and push systemic change, like for example, make sure that there is enough money for gender-based violence or for gender at all in, in humanitarian assistance. You can do that for anticipatory action, which is very important for us, actually, for Germany. And we are working very closely with the START network, financing activities and projects on anticipatory action, which is also very important in terms of becoming more efficient for the system to make each dollar last longer, because actually it allows 
it allows us to act before a crisis hits. That's, that's something that's very important. And of course, localization, we were talking about this. So those are uh, things where pooled funds can really work as drivers of change, of, of innovation, and make sure that they use their, their power of pooled funds not only in order to spend the money in a flexible way, which is quality funding, which is very good, and which we always try to support, but also in order to, 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 to push this systemic change. So, so big fans actually on, 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 on the pooled funds. Um, at the same time, we as a donor, we are always being asked and controlled by parliament. So we need to also have the information and the reporting in order to make sure that when a crisis hits, we'll be immediately able to say where our money is going and how much money we have spent on that crisis. So there's a certain contradiction uh, which where the grand bargain is working on also, which is more or less on the way reporting can be done. And I think our partners can also help us in order to provide us the numbers and the, the, the individual examples also in terms of our of our public relations work that we are doing in order to make sure how we are people helping on the ground, which is not so easy if you are providing big chunks of your money through the pooled funds. But uh, at the same time for us, you might have seen that Germany started as a very small donor like 10 years ago. And we multiplied uh, the, the, the money that we were able provide to, to provide thanks to the very clear decision making by, by parliament we are very we are able to to scale up our support for the humanitarian system also thanks to the to pooled funds because that's the way where you can spend the money in a way that is quality funding but also make sure that you address the systemic issues and uh, also local local preferences for example local decisions when you talk about the country based pooled funds where always Germany tries to be in the boards and make sure that they really implement the things that I have just mentioned as being drivers of change. Um, Oleg, do you want to add something on this, on, on the pool funds, or, or rather on the transparency question? Yeah, on the, tech, on, uh, on the criteria, I think mm -hmm. that uh, I can add a few words that... Uh, um, I think that uh, for um, uh, small local organizations, it's uh, important, uh, first of all, to register themselves as an organization. This is the first step, uh, because there are also many volunteers group, volunteer groups who would also like to be supported, and it's also being done, but it will be easier, of course. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a must to be registered to get the funding for, from a donor. Um, and then I think that um, uh, have a... A proper accounting system, um, not a system, but accountant who uh, will be able to present uh, just uh, the budget in a proper way will be um, also uh, something of, of very important. Uh, and I think that the smaller, uh, small organizations may try with a small grant, first of all, uh, to receive uh, from a donor for a, for a small project. Uh, and then once it is completed, then probably apply for, for some, some more important grants. Uh, and once this stage uh, is completed, I think that um, audit is important. Donors like audits, uh, and they always ask for, ask for audits. And we see this as a challenge for the local organizations, because um, they don't do audits, so they don't have uh, money, they don't have time. Um, so now uh, there are also projects um, uh, also that funded, are funded by us, which will do audit for the organization, just for them to have it and to be able to present uh, to the donor because this is, this is a requirement. Um, I think it's an important step. And um, I think very important thing is uh, just to have a very clear idea of what uh, you want to do, um, not spreading uh, uh, too much uh, your activities, but focusing on, on uh, one specific sector. Uh, usually when you talk to donor and present an idea, if it is clear and it, you, you know what you do, I think that donors will be, uh, will be happy to support this, uh, this idea. Yes, and then of course, uh, there are different, different capacity building initiatives in Ukraine. I think you could easily find something to, uh, to know how to write a concept note, a project proposal, and I think this is um, also something that would, would be beneficial. Thank you. Roxana. Uh, the coordination platform, yeah. or platform for NGOs. Uh, first of all, it should not be forced, because in Ukraine, something that is forced is not <laughs> working good. 
and um, how it should be better created. Because I knew that we have some coalitions of the NGOs, but it not work good in Ukraine because many of NGOs are very competitive, especially that uh, who have some story and some like more than 10 years of uh, activity, etc. And uh, so, what criteria for this uh, coordination cooperation platform should be? Maybe it should be, uh, first of all, um, something like a gathering of sorts in some fields. So maybe some meetings and, but it, it actually uh, required time and not every NGO have this time for it, like additional talks. And we understand that the action is much more better than <laughs> just uh, yeah, uh, talking about problems because we need to solve them like rapidly. So it may be should be um, initiated by the NGOs that want to be the connectors between them because we need someone who be the responsible one for collecting all these sorts, and then uh, it should be. Mm, Actually, I don't know because it's it's very like futuristic <laughs> question, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe then it happened uh, like naturally because some of them just fall off and some uh, decided to decide to stay, and then uh, the NGOs uh, just became a coalition. So it's very complex process. It's not like one answer on how to do it better. It's like the combination of many things, like for example, the actually time. Do these organizations have time for just coming together with others and talk, talk, and talk, or just they are much better as an individual, like individualistic, this organization only uh, that connected to one community, for example, or just target audience that are much more smaller than all for example, pool of IDPs of Ukraine, etc. So they are very competitive. <laughs> I think, yeah, you pointed out two pointed things that actually localization might do is also increase competition between the yeah. NGOs that, they, they are, that are functioning locally. But I think the, the points that you have also made, there are certain restraints as to coordination or participation in the coordination uh, whether it's like physical presence because the, the area of activity is somewhere else. So I think these are these are good points, and it would be lovely to to also have a con continuation of discussion with with the multilateral, multilateral organizations on the spot to see how what works best. Because I think what Ukraine has also shown is that we shouldn't be stuck to old models. So if there's a challenge to the old model, whether it's a cluster or a coordination platform, then I think we can challenge mm -hmm. it and also start challenge it elsewhere. I think that's kind of a, I, I'm not agreeing here, as you see, with Pete's very uh, strict uh, conclusion that we can't export the, the, the lessons learned. Do I see further questions? We have five more minutes. Yes, Mari. I think that. Thank you. My question is maybe mostly to Roxolana, but uh, Ukraine is a huge country, and as you were researching this local response, uh, were there also differences between the regions, or was it more or less the same pattern everywhere? Mm -hmm. um, in our research, we uh, covered mostly the uh, part of parts of Ukraine that are uh, safe for our journalists, so we didn't uh, research on Kharkiv region, for example, as Oleg showed us, and we didn't research this part that connected like, to the uh, like active uh, battles, activities, and everything. So uh, we researched mostly the western and the um, northern part of Ukraine, and also the occupied ter territories after the, the Kyiv region, Sumer region, Chernihiv regions near there. So uh, I can say about the all of Ukraine, because of course we didn't have information, uh, but there is no such 
drastic differences, uh, maybe more evacuation uh, uh, initiatives were like uh, near, in the nearest to the this uh, western and eastern, uh, yeah, not western, eastern and southern part of Ukraine that were occupied and decupied. So actually there is no such difference between what people did because as I said, many IDPs came from this, the, the part of Ukraine, like the northern part, for example, to the western, and they did what they decided for mu much more, like the, it was um, a general thing to do. Uh, for example, the accommodation for IDPs, uh, the humanitarian aid for them, uh, the uh, evacuation process, everything that connected those. Uh, many people from Western Ukraine came to the Eastern just to evacuate because they, uh, other people, because they have the uh, transportation for these uh, purposes. So there is so much uh, different types of initiatives. I just covered a little, the most, like, the most common, because in every community there were a headquarter uh, for the humanitarian aid, volunteer aid. So, so almost in every community. I traveled to our, one of our um, partner community on the western part on the western part of Ukraine. And they have on their, like we have this uh, Soviet uh, uh, houses of culture in many, this is the smallest villages. And there's a lot of space for these headquarters, and they did their, uh, uh, just for ID, many things for IDPs, and also the military aid, and uh, the food for soldiers, but it's another part of, uh, we didn't cover it. Uh, and uh, what I want to say, there is some kind of this uh, rapid res response in many parts of Ukraine simultaneously, so there is not, not such difference all over Ukraine. Thank you. Oh, we say one last question there. Um. Hi. Am I allowed rather a comment and encouragement? Is that okay? Or you would like a question? <laughs> but Karin was very strict about this. <laughs> but okay. it's the last one. I think it's it, the last it, it one. It strikes a good tone in it. I hope it does, yeah. because this has been a super valuable discussion. And it's something that in EGA, in eGovernance Academy, we have been trying out with a project in the last two years that we just finished. Um, I'll say it very briefly, what it was about, and then the key lessons that perhaps could help Pete to overcome some of his suspicions. And, and definitely encourage what um, Roxolana has been saying and, and also what Oleg was saying at the beginning. Um, the focus there wasn't humanitarian aid, though. It was digital vulnerability. But it doesn't really matter. The point was, we applied to the funder who trusted us with money. And then we had a local partner in Georgia and local partner in Ukraine who we worked to have a research in both countries to see what mainly causes digital vulnerability and how to deal with it. And then we chose several organizations, civil society organizations, and government people, and local government people, to work together through a capacity building program to design their responses, how they would like to deal with it in their local small communities, and chose three uh, proposals, one in uh, Georgia and two in Ukraine because of the war. Um, we, we put more, uh, more attention to Ukraine. And we finished this with amazing results because the donor trusted us, we trusted the partners, and all together we trusted the local organizations who for 10,000 or 5,000 or 20,000 euros achieved results which us or Federal Foreign Office Germany or uh, Swiss Embassy would never achieve because probably half of that 10,000 would go to our own overheads. But there it went there. But the key lesson there was we were the ones who reported all the financials. We didn't, we, we didn't ask local partners and local organizations, the small organizations who were working in the local field, um, any sort of financial proof of how they spent the money. We said, we are not asking you to prove what you did with what you, what you spent the money, but what you achieved with it. So we changed the, turned the tables and said, give us your value proposition. What it is that you can achieve with 10,000 euros in Kriv Rig, for example, or in Hocha community, or in other places. And that's what they did. So that was one thing. 
we should stop tracking every single cent that local organizations are using and put the trust in middle organizations like EGA or somebody else. We know how to do this, but we have to trust people. And this, so the two other lessons is all these small local or, um, projects that we funded um, were um, left amazing legacies because this is what we asked from the very beginning. It shouldn't be a one-off thing, but show how you can continue working on those topics in the future, which all of them are doing, although our funding ended. They have turned them into services where they can actually make money, which is ideal for a civil society organization, or pick it into a bigger scale project, or work together with local governments, getting money from local governments to do those things. So that's the ideal yeah. thing. And the third component, which is super important, where cooperation comes into place. Us, the partners, and the local organizations built a very strong digital dual based uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning network. So we could constantly see what was being achieved, not who bought a cup of coffee or who you know, spent the money on gasoline. Let's stop that and let's look at the value that local organizations can bring and fund that value. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a good tone and adds another important word to the discussion of localizations, which is trust. Um, and I think that needs to mean be coupled with innovative mechanisms and flexibility, but I think the trust on the side of donors trying to build it, and, but also find a way to, to kind of build it and, and keep it is important. With that, I would like to thank the panelists, two of them who have come a long way to join us uh, from here. I know it's, it's not a painful, uh, painless trip, but I'm glad you are with us and you could share your experiences. Thank you, Pete, as well, for coming, and thank you for hearing us out. And I will give it over back to the Refugee Council and, and to the organizers. Thank you, Helen, and uh, all the panelists. Uh, as you probably remember, we started off uh, our first panel, uh, which was cash. And now we will watch a three minute uh, video. It was made very freshly, uh, almost a week ago. And um, this is what you're gonna see is why we are doing our work. And uh, this is why MPC is also important because people use it uh, where they actually need it the most at a certain time. So let's watch the movie and then I will give the floor to Eero for concluding remarks. Я Ганна Гаврилівна. Живемо тут у Чернігові, мужу больниці, щось так на душі тривожно, і діти вистріли, діти вистріли. Вискакую на вулицю, тут мене сусід, поліція, говорю, вже забирають його по тривоги. Саша, що случилось? П'ять часів утра, а він говорить, війна, тетя Галя, війна. Я Дудко Наталія Григорівна. Це перш, перший учасник, з якого почалися бойові дії. Дуже важко було, тому що от туди стріляли по нас. Почав літати літак російський, який кидав бомби. Літак літав завжди в 4 години. Все було так миттєво, що ми навіть не зрозуміли, що на нас кинули бомби. Ті двері, які були в підвал, вони їх ударною хвилею її, їх вивернули. Нас вирізували МЧСники. Мій муж, він нікуди не ходив, у підвал нікуди. Він ходив кругом дому. Він як прощався з домом, бо своїми руками зроблено. Ми сидимо, тому що так глупне і тишина. Ми вже без хати, без машини, ми вже горимо. Грубочка в нас там була. І він пішов у нас, ото, там, куди ми заходили, де ми стали жити, після того, як нас розбили, ото, железна будка, то у нас там дрова лежали. Він пішов у ту будку і став брати дрова. Став брати дрова, 
И потом, что я, говорит, вот так вот, бух, и дом зашатался так. И стекла все посыпались. Выходит сюда, а тут перед двором уже бух, и такого рота нема, и той стороны нема, и все пилая, и все горит. Операция срочная надо была. Две недели нам давали только. Он ногами очень плохо ходил, на ноги упал, да. И у него здоровье, ну, сразу вот, ну, как, как бы так... Вот на здоровье. И тут еще вот эта операция. В мае месяце нас выписали после операции. Вот как раз в эту минуту мне нужна помощь, и мне через три дня, вот понимаете, как на блюдечке, то говорят, принесли. Спасибо большое. Ну, мы эти деньги сразу, у нас, ну как, у нас жизнь была на первом случае мужа. Я сама тоже после инсульта, тоже на таблетках. Что остается, вы же бачите, мы все же улаживаем вот эту плиточку, давай сделаем. Велике вам спасибо за допомогу, спасибо за то, что вы надали эту допомогу. Эта допомога была э, мне очень доречна. Я за брала кредит, и я заплатила вашими грошима этот кредит, чтобы установить векна. Stuff as well. Uh, the ones who would like to take part of the tour later on at the exhibition in here, we will go to the tickets, which is just uh, through the door on the left side. Uh, we will do so in 10 minutes. And to the ones who still didn't register yourself uh, on the papers just out of the door, then please do when you are leaving. And uh, from my side, thank you very much. And Eero. Uh, well, thank you for staying, first of all. Um, I have been given the hardest task of uh, kind of summing up uh, this uh, this day. Um, so we, we started off with Juliet being uh, kind enough to give a broad picture of, uh, of the, the problems we are uh, facing in the sector. And, uh, uh, and we left with some hope, I guess, uh, that things are still improving. Uh, somebody asked a question, and I'm <laughs> uh, grateful for that, uh, that uh, it's not doom and gloom only. Um, we, we moved on to the cash panel and uh, also discussed cash as a, as a tool and modality rather than an end in itself. But, uh, a great tool, so not uh, a power tool uh, we can use uh, in, in different contexts. But of course, keeping in mind the assessment, of course, always of markets and, and financial service providers, etc. Um, and also realize that the, the risks are rather similar to any kind of modality that we are uh, providing. So cash is not in any way uh, more risky than, than other uh, tools in our disposal. We then discussed uh, data and, uh, and information. Uh, also realized, similarly to cash, that data is a tool rather than an uh, end in itself. Uh, and, uh, and we should try to make sense of it rather than uh, make more of it just for the sake of making more of it. Um, and uh, I think one of the takeaways definitely was the need for common products and data sharing rather than everybody sitting in their corner and, and making new ones and, and really not showing anyone else. Uh, so thank you for, for emphasis, uh, putting emphasis on that. And now, I mean, I guess everybody's memories are still with localization panel anyway. Um, we see slow progress uh, and need for capacity building, but also I think uh, a heavy uh, emphasis on the need on principled action and really understanding what humanitarian assistance is and the humanitarian principles uh, are and coordination and standardization and really following how humanitarian assistance in an international scope should be done. Um, I'm actually happy to say that there are some initiatives in Ukraine to, to move towards uh, kind of a common and joint due diligence, which would then be mutually um, recognized between organizations. So definitely some progress in that direction, but the global picture is rather doom and gloom <laughs> still. Um, one common thread, I think, which uh, came through and, and was echoed in the, in the last comment as well, is that of trust. And uh, I think cash assistance is 
uh, an example of that, that we actually give tr this trust on the use of assistance to the people we are assisting rather than making the choices ourselves. And localization is the other example of this trust that we, uh, as you said, uh, should trust the local organizations to, to do this. But of course, it has this small asterisk uh, uh, that it should be then principled and coordinated and standardized. Uh, but uh, trust we must. Um, I think uh, to take together the, the today, uh, I think one of the takeaways in, in addition to the trust and, and others from the panels is that actually Estonia has a lot to offer uh, when it comes to its uh, history and, and background uh, in receiving humanitarian assistance and now providing humanitarian, uh, humanitarian assistance, um, kind of reshaping the discussion sometimes uh, around these topics, but also in the sense of uh, digitalization and, and data management and information management. Um, so I think the quite a number of things we can pick up going for, uh, forward uh, and, and really seeing how Estonia could uh, or what could be Estonia's uh, value added uh, to this sector uh, going forward. So I thank all the panelists, uh, all the moderators or keynote speaker uh, and all of you who uh, took part and stayed until the end and uh, also the, the people watching uh, online and uh, the videos will be of the panels will also be made available to to uh, rewatch later so i think uh, this uh, remains a resource resource we will not delete after <laughs> some time so thank you again uh, and uh, good luck and let's make human assistance better thanks <laughs>